Yeah. We're breaking this paper. Yeah. See this video of a horse drinking water? It was made with AI. So is this video of a UFO landing on Mars. This turtle swimming through the ocean? Also made with AI. See these four dancing funky things? You probably guessed it. Made with AI. As were all of these videos that you're seeing on the screen right now. All made with AI. This wolf howling at the moon? Made with AI. This monkey eating a pineapple? Made with AI. And this waterfall landscape image right here was also made with AI. Now all of these tools aren't publicly available to everybody yet, but in this video, I'm gonna talk to you about what's coming and what you can do right now with AI video. So let's dig in. Hey, what's up, Matt Wolf here. We've heard a lot lately about AI art and AI art is just exploding. But what about AI video? How close are we to being able to do text to video where you type in a text prompt and it generates a really cool video? Well. As it turns out, we're really, really close. And there's some tools that are in the works that are really close to what you get from like a stable diffusion or a mid journey with video. And then there's tools that you can use right now that just make kind of cool videos. And, and in this video, I wanna talk about what the current landscape of text to video is. So to start, I wanna show you what's in the works first and where things are kind of headed. So first off, Meta, the company behind Facebook, they have AI of their own and they have a product called make a video that they've been working on. Now, this one is one that's not publicly available. You can't go and use it right now and generate your own videos, but it's getting close and they've shown some demos of what it's capable of. So let's take a quick peek here. You can see an example over here on the right that says a dog wearing a superhero outfit with red cape flying through the sky. And you can see the video that it generated off of this text prompt over here. And they do give a whole bunch of examples. You've got a teddy bear painting a portrait, a robot dancing in Times Square. These are the prompts that you would give Meta, and this is the output that it would currently generate right now. You've got a cat watching a TV with a remote in hand, and it, you know, you've got the cat here, but it kind of looks like a humanish hand going on. So there's obviously quite a bit of work to go on some of this stuff, but you can get an idea of where it's headed. A fluffy baby sloth with an orange knitted hat trying to figure out a laptop, close up, highly detailed studio lighting, screen reflecting in its eyes. You got realistic, an artist's brush painting on canvas close up clownfish swimming through the coral i mean that one's pretty impressive looking a young couple walking in heavy rain it almost looks like they're kind of conjoined twins or something like that but you know it's it's pretty impressive honestly where things are headed it's i'm not going to claim that this is amazing video footage but i do want to show you like what is there right now and where it's going a horse drinking water that looks like a horse drinking water to me got a hyper realistic spaceship landing on Mars. An oil painting of a couple in formal evening wear going home, get caught in a heavy downpour with umbrellas. I mean, look at that. That's some really cool stylistic art. There's a table by a window with sunlight streaming through, illuminating a pile of books. An emoji of a baby panda wearing a red hat, blue gloves, green shirt, and blue pants. It can also do image to video. So you've got this image over here of a ship on the seas, and then over on the right, you can see how it animated that video. I mean, it's definitely a little bit blurry and kind of hard to make out what's going on. There's somebody doing yoga, and you can see in the video version, they're stretching out on their pose. 
And here's a sea turtle. This is an image of a sea turtle just kind of static. And look, you can see it's moving its fin around and swimming through the water over here. You can take a pair of images and it'll blend them into a video. So here you've got, you know, two images of asteroids and it's blending them together in this footage over here. You've got this art right here. I'm not quite sure what art this actually is. Some sort of like abstract art. But if you blend these two together, you get this video that's over here. You've got two images of a couple walking, holding hands with a child. And you can see how it animates animated these two images together. You can use an existing video. You've got your astronaut floating around in space. This is the input video. And then here's four variations of astronauts floating around in space with different perspectives on the Earth and different poses of the astronaut. Here's a funny furry creature thing dancing around. And here's four variations that it created of a similar furry, fuzzy, pink and blue creature thing. Here you've got a picture of three bunnies eating grass. Over here, it generated four different variations of bunnies eating grass. Again, this one isn't one that's publicly available for people to use. You can sign up to get early access when it's available. If you remember early on with a lot of the text to image technology that was out there, it was pretty rough to start. And once it got publicly available and more people started using it, it got better and better and better and better. So this is the very, very early version of some of the text to video stuff. Now, not to be outdone by Meta, Google is also doing AI text to video stuff as well. Also not publicly available, but here's some example images. Up here on the left, you can see the prompt was an umbrella on top of a spoon, and that's the result. You've got a cat eating food out of a bowl in the style of Van Gogh, and look at that result. I mean, in my opinion, this is even better than what Meta has been working on. Up here, melting ice cream dripping down the cone. Thousands of fast brush strokes slowly forming the text Imogen video on a light beige canvas. Oil painting style, smooth animation. And look at that, it's even generating text into the video. Most text to image generators can't even do that right now. Hand lifts a cup. Once again, you got some funky hands, but we're used to that by now in text to image. Another one with a bunch of autumn leaves falling on a calm lake to form the text Imogen video smooth. Look at that, it's forming the words. A video of the earth rotating in space. A swarm of bees flying around their hive. Drone fly through of a fast food restaurant on a dystopian alien planet. A teddy bear running in New York City. Drone fly through of a tropical jungle covered in snow. I mean, look at that. That looks really good. I, I could see using that as B-roll in a video at some point. So this one's called Imogen Video. And uh, this one is being put out by Google. And once again, this one is also one that is not publicly available. You can't quite get your hands on it yet, but this one looks like it's even taking what Meta's put together and it's going even a step further and looks even better. Now, if you wanna learn more about how these tools work, you could go over to makeavideo.studio to learn about Meta's version. There's research papers that you could read to learn more about it. And for the Imogen one, you can go to imogen.research.google slash video, and they have an explanation of how it works right here as they walk you through the generation process. So as much as you want to learn about what's going on right now in generative video space, there's plenty to study. Saying all that, I did mention that there are some tools that you can use right now. Now, they're not true text to video like what you're seeing here it's more like you would take a text to an image and then take that image and figure out some way to animate it that's kind of what the existing technology that's available right now is and let's explore some of that real quick so just for quick reference i'm going to go to futuretools.io i'm going to click on generative video and there's a couple that i want to take a look at i want to look at genmo and i'll show you what that does i want to look at kyber and i'll show you what that does and i want to take a look at Leia picks here. Now, there are also a bunch of generative video tools that will take your text and turn it into a talking head. I actually did a previous video about that in the video that I did where I made my sort of fake Joe Rogan talking. So check that video out if you haven't already. I use this tool D-ID to make that. And that's a really cool generative video technology as well that makes essentially talking heads. But that's not what I want to show you in this one. I want to show you some of the other cool tech that's out there. Let's start by taking a look at Leapix Converter, and I'll show you what this does. I'm going to go ahead and log in here, and this one is free to use right now. And this one allows you to upload an image, and then it will turn it into kind of a 3D animated image. So let's go ahead and pick an image here. I'll go ahead and grab this cool wolf wearing sunglasses here, and we'll upload it and look what it did. You can see it's got this, it kind of 3D-ified it. 
it's making a little animation where it's spinning around and you can do some different animation lengths. I can make it six seconds, which will make it look like it's moving a lot slower. Or I can make it one second where it just looks like it's going hyper fast and he's moving around a lot. I kind of like to go somewhere in the middle. And then for animation style, you can choose how it's sort of rotating the camera around him. So if I go horizontal, it just looks like he's looking back and forth and you can see how it kind of animates the head there. You've got wide circles. You've got just a standard circle, a tall circle and then vertical. And you can kind of see how that changes the style of animation. You can change the amount of motion to less. So it's just kind of very subtle animation, almost looks like it's breathing. You've got regular, you've got more, and then you can change the focus point. So I can make the focus point close. Then you can see it really sort of makes the background shift a lot. And then if I move it to center, it's kind of more of a centered thing where the front and background are moving fairly equally. And if I go far, then you can see the background doesn't move as much, but the face itself looks like it's moving quite a bit more. And then when you're ready to grab this little video here, you come over to share, and this gives you a link where you can share it, or you can save it as a GIF, an MP4, or one of these other file types here, and then click save. And then it's gonna download this version of the video for me. And there you go, you can see it just downloaded here. Let's open it up in the folder. And we've got our animated wolf video here that I can use however I want. Now this isn't technically generative video, this is taking an image and kind of converting it into a 3D sort of cool video. But as far as I can tell, this is a free to use platform for now. All right, so that was the first one I want to show you. Now, the other two that I'm going to show you are actually more where you would type in a piece of text and it will generate a video from that text. So let's take a peek. The first one I want to look at is called Genmo, which is a text to video platform where you literally type in what you want and it will generate a video based on what you want. And here's some examples of what it's generated. As you can see, it's not really like an animation. It's more a series of images that are all kind of blending together is more of what this style is doing. Go ahead and create something real quick. You can actually see one that I generated once already, a wolf howling at the moon on a snowy mountain. So what it essentially seems to be doing is taking my prompt here, a wolf howling at the moon on a snowy mountain, and then it's using one of the generative art platforms, you know, Dolly or a Stable Diffusion, I'm not actually sure which one this uses, and it generates a whole bunch of images based on that prompt, and then it animates a lot of those images together. That's what it appears to be doing. So let's go ahead and create a new one here, a monkey wearing a top hat, eating a pineapple, on the beach. And let's go ahead and generate and see what it comes up with. So it started by generating an image. This is our sort of first frame of the image here. And because I had this auto style selected, you can see it added additional styling to it. Let's go ahead and click on this here. A monkey wearing a top hat, eating a pineapple on the beach. And then it added warm shades, concept art, Kodak Ultramax 800, architectural HD, insanely detailed center composition in pastel, solid color, and thick uneven outline. So it added all of that extra stuff on its own because I had auto style selected. And so this is basically the first frame of the image. Let's go ahead and click customize. I could tweak the prompt a little bit if I want to. I can add some negative prompt here, change the length, the exploration, dial up the mayhem. Let's go ahead and dial up the mayhem. That sounds fun to me. Dynamism, how fast content changes over time. Let's go ahead and crank that up a little bit. Let's leave the smoothness to 100, leave a seamless loop, and let's go ahead and up the length a little bit and see what that does. And let's go ahead and leave the prompt the same and see what it generates for us. And here's what it came up with. You can see it's generated a whole bunch of different images and it's sort of morphing between all of the various images. But again, it's not that true generative video that you're gonna get with the make a video or the image in from Meta and from Google. But it is taking a text and turning it into a cool kind of creative video. Now, if I click on this here, it brings me to this page where I can see the prompt, the seed, and all of the details. And then if I wanna download it, just click download, comes to this page and I can save as and just save this video. Now, one area where this type of tool works really, really well is like landscape type videos. So let's go like a green forest with a 
cliffside, flowing waterfall coming down the cliff into a stream that cuts a path through the forest. Let's go ahead and generate an image off that and see what we get. Now, I'm not super happy with what it generated. I'm going to go ahead and go landscape here and see if we can get a wider image. And let's go ahead and generate another one. Still not happy with it. Let's generate another one. Now we're talking. Now I really like this image. That's what I was looking for. So let's go ahead and take this one here, this waterfall coming into this stream with this green landscape around it. Looks like it's straight out of the Lord of the Rings or something like that. Let's customize it here. I'm going to dial up the mayhem a little bit, bring down the length slightly so it renders a little bit faster. And let's go ahead and leave everything else the same. And let's click make video. And I think what we'll find is because it's got this landscape and this flowing water, it's really going to have this cool effect when it's done. Check this out. Just that motion and switching between the images sort of gives it this feeling of flowing. And if you look at the waterfall in the background, it actually kind of makes the waterfall look like it's moving and the water in the foreground look like it's moving. This one seems to be free. And all you would do is click create a video and sign in with Google or sign in with Discord and you're in and you can start creating. I'm not sure if it's eventually it's going to be paid. I have no idea. But as of right now, you can get in and use it for free and generate videos like what you just saw. Now, caveat, there is going to be a watermark on it, but it's still pretty cool. You can still generate some cool stuff and see where things are going with this. Now, there is another one that supposedly acts fairly similar that I haven't played with yet. So I'm going to experience it right now for the first time on this video. And this one's called Kyber. And you can tell just by looking at the homepage that this one generates some cool sort of imagery as well. And here's some examples of images that this one generated where it looks like it kind of generates an image and then sort of does this like zoom in, zoom out effect on it to get the style that you see in these images here. Now, before we get into it, let's take a quick peek at the pricing, see how they're doing this here. So they have a free plan that gives you 50 credits or approximately five videos, and it will have a Kyber water mark on it. For $10 a month, it looks like you can get a thousand credits, which gets you about a hundred videos a month and no watermark. That's the yearly billing. Let's check out, check out the monthly. So monthly is actually 15 bucks a month if you want to pay monthly. Let's take a peek at how this one works. So you describe what you're looking for. It'll generate a few style options for you to choose from, and then you can download the video. So let's go ahead and click direct my video, and let's go ahead and log in and test this one out. You can see this is my first time using this, so I don't know what it's going to generate. I still have my 50 free credits here. Let's go ahead and create your first video. I want to create a video of select a subject in the style of select a style. All right, so let's select a subject here. Intricate machinery, beautiful sunset painting, secret garden, bustling shopping street. Let's try waterfall into a forest. You can see it's going to cost eight credits for this one. And let's go ahead and select a style. We've got 3D rendering, anime, art deco, art nouveau, cartoon, cubism, gothic art, minimalism, pop art, impressionism, graffiti, classic realism. Let's try classic realism and generate preview frames here. It says it'll take around 30 seconds. Okay, so I'm really excited by these frames that it generated for me. It generated these four frames. So it's saying select the first frame in your video. Now let's go ahead and select this fourth one over here and then click finalize video. And then it says it's going to take a few minutes of patience before. Wow. So I'm going to use the old snap the finger trick to speed up the process here. Here's what it generated. You can see it's kind of doing that zoom in and zoom out effect. But if you look at the water, it kind of gives it this feel of the water actually moving. So pretty cool stuff. And then I can come over here, download my video, and now I've got it available. Let's go ahead and play it back on my computer here. And I have access to this video now. Now, nothing that's out right now is really true text to video. It's really kind of text to image to video. There is some really, really cool tech in the works that's coming out from companies like Meta and Google that I'm really, really excited to get my hands on and play around with because once that technology gets more and more advanced, just think about the creative video ideas we'll all be able to do in our marketing and for fun and as B-roll and just so many cool things that we can do with it. And I just, I love nerding out about this stuff. So I'm excited to see all of this stuff that's in the works and play with it even more. If you love nerding out over cool tech and cool tools and all of this AI stuff and all of this generative art that's happening right now, come check out Future Tools. FutureTools.io is the site where I curate all of the cool tools that I come across. I make them filterable and sortable, and you can sort by the ones that people have upvoted the most and liked the most, show only the free tools that are available on the site that don't cost any money to play with. As of right now, 
there's 490 tools in the database. And by the time you watch this video, there's probably even more because I'm constantly coming across cool tools and sharing them on the website. So check out futuretools.io. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the newsletter. If you join the newsletter, then every Friday, I'm going to send you my five favorite tools from the week. I look at 100 plus tools every single week. And on my Friday newsletter, I give you the top five that I came across that week. I also share three interesting news articles in the area of AI. I share three cool YouTube videos and I share one cool way to make money using AI. So if you're not on that newsletter, join today and I'll send you the first newsletter this coming Friday. I hope you enjoy this video. I hope you enjoy nerding out over cool AI tech as much as I do. If you do, please like this video and subscribe to this channel because I'm going to keep making more videos and nerding out over cool tech tools. And as these new technologies emerge, I'm going to make videos about them and share them with you so that you can stay in the loop about all of this cool nerdiness that I'm into. So thanks so much for hanging out with me today. And and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Hi everyone. So by now you have probably heard of ChatGPT. It has taken the world and the AI community by storm. And it is a system that allows you to interact with an AI and give it text-based tasks. So for example, we can ask ChatGPT to write us a small haiku about how important it is that people understand AI, and then they can use it to improve the world and make it more prosperous. So when we run this, AI knowledge brings prosperity for all to see, embrace its power. <laughs> Okay, not bad. And so you could see that ChatGPT went from left to right and generated uh, all these words see, sort of sequentially. Now, I asked it already the exact same prompt a little bit earlier, and it generated a slightly different outcome. AI's power to grow, ignorance holds us back, learn, prosperity waits. So uh, pretty good in both cases and slightly different. So you can see that ChatGPT is a probabilistic system, and for any one prompt, it can give us multiple answers sort of uh, replying to it. Now, this is just one example of the prompt. People have come up with many, many examples, and there are entire websites that index interactions with ChatGPT. And so many of them are quite humorous. Explain HTML to me like I'm a dog. Uh, write release notes for Chess 2. <laughs> write a note about Elon Musk buying a Twitter, and so on. So as an example, uh, please write a breaking news article about a leaf falling from a tree. <laughs> uh, in a shocking turn of events, a leaf has fallen from a tree in the local park. Witnesses report that the leaf, which was previously attached to a branch of a tree, detached itself and fell to the ground. Very dramatic. So you can see that this is a pretty remarkable system, and it is what we call a language model, uh, because it, um, it models the sequence of words or characters or tokens more generally, and it knows how sort of words follow each other in English language. And so from its perspective, what it is doing is it is completing the sequence. So I give it the start of a sequence and it completes the sequence with the outcome. And so it's a language model in that sense. Now, I would like to focus on the under the hood of um, under the hood components of what makes ChatGPT work. So what is the neural network under the hood that models the sequence of these words? And that comes from this paper called Attention is All You Need. In 2017, a landmark paper a landmark paper in AI that produced and uh, proposed the transformer architecture. So GPT is uh, short for generatively, generatively pre-trained transformer. So transformer is the neural net that actually does all the heavy lifting under the hood. It comes from this paper in 2017. Now, if you read this paper, this uh, reads like a pretty random machine translation paper. And that's because I think the authors didn't fully anticipate the impact that the transformer would have on the field. And this architecture that they produced in the context of machine translation, in their case, actually ended up taking over uh, the rest of AI in the next five years after. And so this architecture, with minor changes, was copy-pasted into a huge amount of applications in AI in more recent years. And that includes at the core of ChatGPT. Now, we are not going to... What I'd like to do now is I'd like to build out something like ChatGPT. 
but uh, we're not going to be able to, of course, reproduce ChatGPT. This is a very serious production-grade system. It is trained on uh, a good chunk of internet, and then there's a lot of uh, pre-training and fine-tuning stages to it, and so it's very complicated. What I'd like to focus on is just to train a transformer-based language model. And in our case, it's going to be a character-level uh, language model. I still think that is uh, very educational with respect to how these systems work. So I don't want to train on the chunk of internet. We need a smaller data set. In this case, I propose that we work with uh, my favorite toy data set. It's called Tiny Shakespeare. And um, what it is is basically it's a concatenation of all of the works of Shakespeare, in my understanding. And so this is all of Shakespeare in a single file. Uh, this file is about one megabyte. And it's just all of Shakespeare. And what we are going to do now is we're going to basically model how these characters uh, follow each other. So, for example, given a chunk of these characters, like this, uh, given some context of characters in the past, the transformer neural network will look at the characters that I've highlighted and is going to predict that G is likely to come next in the sequence. And it's going to do that because we're going to train that transformer on Shakespeare. And it's just going to try to produce uh, character sequences that look like this. And in that process, it's going to model all the patterns inside this data. So once we've trained the system, I'd just like to give you a preview, we can generate infinite Shakespeare. And of course, it's a fake thing that looks kind of like Shakespeare. Um, apologies for, there's some jank that I'm not able to resolve in, in here, but um, you can see how this is going character by character, and it's kind of like predicting Shakespeare-like language. So, verily, my lord, the sights have left thee again, the king, coming with my curses with precious pale. And then Tranio says something else, etc. And this is just coming out of the transformer in a very similar manner as it would come out in ChatGPT. In our case, character by character, in ChatGPT, uh, it's coming out on a token by token level, and tokens are these uh, sort of like little subword pieces. So they're not word level, they're kind of like word chunk level. Um, and now the, I've already written this entire code uh, to train these transformers um, and it is in a GitHub repository that you can find and it's called a NanoGPT. So NanoGPT is a repository that you can find on my GitHub and it's a repository for training transformers um, on any given text. And what I think is interesting about it, because there's many ways to train transformers, but this is a very simple implementation. So it's just two files of 300 lines of code each. One file defines the GPT model, the transformer, and one file trains it on some given text data set. And here I'm showing that if you train it on an open web text data set, which is a fairly large data set of web pages, then I reproduce the, uh, the performance of GPT-2. So GPT-2 is an early version of OpenAI's GPT uh, from 2017, if I recall correctly. And I've only so far reproduced the, the smallest 124 million parameter model. Uh, but basically, this is just proving that the code base is correctly arranged. And I'm able to load the uh, neural network weights that OpenAI has released later. So you can take a look at the finished code here in NanoGPT. But what I would like to do in this lecture is I would like to uh, basically uh, write this repository from scratch. So we're going to begin with an empty file. And we're going to define a transformer piece by piece. We're going to train it on the tiny Shakespeare data set, and we'll see how we can then uh, generate infinite Shakespeare. And of course, this can copy paste to any arbitrary text data set uh, that you like. Uh, but my goal really here is to just make you understand and appreciate uh, how under the hood ChatGPT works. And um, really all that's required is a proficiency in Python and uh, some basic understanding of um, calculus and statistics. And it would help if you also see my previous videos on the same YouTube channel, in particular my Make More series, where I um, define smaller and simpler neural network language models. Uh, so multi allele perceptrons and so on. It really introduces the language modeling framework. And then uh, here in this video, we're going to focus on the transformer neural network itself. Okay, so I created a new Google Colab uh, Jupyter Notebook here. And uh, this will allow me to later easily share this code that we're going to develop together uh, with you so you can follow along. So this will be in the video description uh, later. Now, here I've just done some preliminaries. I downloaded the data set, the tiny Shakespeare data set at this URL, and you can see that it's about a one megabyte file. 
then here I open the input.txt file and just read in all the text of the string and we see that we are working with 1 million characters roughly. And the first 1,000 characters, if we just print them out, are basically what you would expect. This is the first 1,000 characters of the tiny Shakespeare dataset, roughly up to here. So, so far so good. Next, we're going to take this text. And the text is a sequence of characters in Python. So when I call the set constructor on it, I'm just going to get the set of all the characters that occur in this text. And then I call list on that to create a list of those characters instead of just a set so that I have an ordering, an arbitrary ordering. And then I sort that. So basically we get just all the characters that occur in the entire data set and they're sorted. Now the number of them is going to be our vocabulary size. These are the possible elements of our sequences. And we see that when I print here the characters, there's 65 of them in total. There's a space character and then all kinds of special characters and then uh, capitals and lowercase letters. So that's our vocabulary, and that's the sort of like possible uh, characters that the model can see or emit. Okay, so next we would like to develop some strategy to tokenize the input text. Now, when people say tokenize, they mean convert the raw text as a string to some sequence of integers according to some uh, notebook, according to some vocabulary of possible elements. So as an example, here, we are going to be building a character-level language model, so we're simply going to be translating individual characters into integers. So let me show you uh, a chunk of code that sort of does that for us. So we're building both the encoder and the decoder, and let me just talk through what's happening here. When we encode an arbitrary text, like hi there, we're going to receive a list of integers that represents that string. So for example, 46, 47, etc. And then we also have the reverse mapping, so we can take this list and decode it to get back the exact same string. So it's really just like a translation to integers and back for arbitrary string. And for us, it is done on a character level. Now, the way this was achieved is we just iterate over all the characters here and create a lookup table from the character to the integer and vice versa. And then to encode some string, we simply translate all the characters individually and to decode it back, we use the reverse mapping and concatenate all of it. Now this is only one of many possible encodings or many possible sort of tokenizers and it's a very simple one. But there's many other schemas that people have come up with in practice. So for example, Google uses a sentence piece. Uh, so sentence piece will also encode text into um, integers but in a different schema and uh, using a different uh, vocabulary. And sentence piece is a subword uh, sort of tokenizer. And what that means is that um, you're not encoding entire words, but you're not also encoding individual characters. It's, it's a subword unit level. And that's usually what's adopted in practice. For example, also OpenAI has this library called TickToken that uses a byte pair encoding tokenizer. Um, and that's what GPT uses. And you can also just encode words into like hell world into a list of integers. So as an example, I'm using the TickToken library here I'm getting the encoding for GPT-2, or that was used for GPT-2. Instead of just having 65 possible characters, or tokens, they have 50,000 tokens. And so when they encode the exact same string, hi there, we only get a list of three integers. But those integers are not between 0 and 64, they are between 0 and 50,256. So basically you can trade off the codebook size and the sequence lengths. So you can have very long sequences of integers with very small vocabularies, or you can have short um, sequences of integers with very large vocabularies. And so typically people use in practice these subword encodings, but I'd like to keep our tokenizer very simple. So we're using character level tokenizer, and that means that we have very small codebooks. We have very simple encode and decode functions, uh, but we do get very long sequences as a result but that's the level at which we're going to stick with this lecture because it's the simplest thing. Okay, so now that we have an encoder and a decoder, effectively a tokenizer, we can tokenize the entire training set of Shakespeare. So here's a chunk of code that does that. And I'm going to start to use the PyTorch library and specifically the torch.tensor from the PyTorch library. So we're going to take all of the text in Tiny Shakespeare, encode it, and then wrap it into a torch.tensor to get the data tensor. So here's what the data tensor looks like when I look at just the first 1,000 characters 
or the 1,000 elements of it. So we see that we have a massive sequence of integers, and this sequence of integers here is basically an identical translation of the first 1,000 characters here. So I believe, for example, that 0 is a newline character, and maybe 1 is a space, not 100% sure, but from now on, the entire data set of text is re-represented as just, it's just stretched out as a single very large uh, sequence of integers. Let me do one more thing before we move on here. I'd like to separate out our data set into a train and a validation split. So in particular, we're going to take the first 90% of the data set and consider that to be the training data for the transformer. And we're going to withhold the last 10% at the end of it to be the validation data. And this will help us understand to what extent our model is overfitting. So we're going to basically hide and keep the validation data on the side because we don't want just a perfect memorization of this exact Shakespeare. We want a neural network that sort of creates Shakespeare-like uh, text. And so it should be fairly likely for it to produce the actual, like, stowed away, uh, true Shakespeare text. Um, and so we're going to use this to uh, get a sense of the overfitting. Okay, so now we would like to start plugging these text sequences or integer sequences into the transformer so that it can train and learn those patterns. Now, the important thing to realize is we're never going to actually feed the entire text into the transformer all at once. That would be computationally very expensive and prohibitive. So when we actually train a transformer on a lot of these data sets, we only work with chunks of the data set. And when we train the transformer, we basically sample random little chunks out of the training set and train on just chunks at a time. And these chunks have basically some kind of a length and some maximum length. Now, the maximum length typically, at least in the code I usually write, is called block size. You can, you can uh, find it under different names like context length or something like that. Let's start with the block size of just 8. And then let me look at the first train data characters. The first block size plus 1 characters. I'll explain why plus 1 in a second. So this is the first 9 characters in the sequence in the training set. Now what I'd like to point out is that when you sample a chunk of data like this, so say the, these nine characters out of the training set, this actually has multiple examples packed into it. And uh, that's because all of these characters follow each other. And so what this thing is going to say when we plug it into a transformer is we're going to actually simultaneously train it to make prediction at every one of these positions. Now. In, the, in a chunk of nine characters, there's actually eight individual examples packed in there. So there's the example that when 18, when in the context of 18, 47 likely comes next. In the context of 18 and 47, 56 comes next. In the context of 18, 47, 56, 57 can come next, and so on. So that's the eight individual examples. Let me actually spell it out with code. So here's a chunk of code to illustrate. X are the inputs to the transformer. It will just be the first block size characters. Y will be the uh, next block size characters. So it's offset by one. And that's because Y are the targets for each position in the input. And then here I'm iterating over all the block size of eight. And the context is always all the characters in X uh, up to T and including T. And the target is always the teeth character, but in the target's array Y. So let me just run this. And basically it spells out what I said in words. Uh, these are the eight examples hidden in a chunk of nine characters that we uh, sampled from the training set. I want to mention one more thing. We train on all the eight examples here with context between one all the way up to context of block size. And we train on that not just for computational reasons, because we happen to have the sequence already or something like that. It's not just done for efficiency. It's also done uh, to make the transformer network be used to seeing contexts all the way from as little as one all the way to block size. And we'd like the transformer to be used to seeing everything in between. And that's going to be useful later during inference, because while we're sampling, we can start the sa uh, sampling generation with as little as one character of context. And the transformer knows how to predict the next character with all the way up to just context of one. And so then it can predict everything up to block size. And after block size, we have to start truncating because the transformer will never um, receive more than block size inputs when it's predicting the next character. Okay, so we've looked at the time dimension of the tensors that are going to be feeding into the transformer. There's one more dimension to care about, and that is the batch dimension. 
And so as we're sampling these chunks of text, we're going to be actually, every time we're going to feed them into a transformer, we're going to have many batches of multiple chunks of text that are all like stacked up in a single tensor. And that's just done for efficiency, just so that we can keep the GPUs busy, uh, because they are very good at parallel processing of, um, of data. And so we just want to process multiple chunks all at the same time. But those chunks are processed completely independently, they don't talk to each other, and so on. So let me basically just generalize this and introduce a batch dimension. Here's a chunk of code. Let me just run it, and then I'm going to explain what it does. So here, because we're going to start sampling random locations in the data set to pull chunks from, I am setting the seed so that um, in the random number generator, so that the numbers I see here are going to be the same numbers you see later, if you try to reproduce this. Now the batch size here is how many independent sequences we are processing every forward-backward pass of the transformer. The block size, as I explained, is the maximum context length to make those predictions. So let's say batch size 4, block size 8, and then here's how we get batch for any arbitrary split. If the split is a training split, then we're going to look at train data, otherwise at val data. That gets us the data array. And then when I generate random positions to grab a chunk out of, I actually grab, I actually generate batch size number of random offsets. So because this is four, we are ix is going to be a uh, four numbers that are randomly generated between zero and len of data minus block size. So it's just random offsets into the training set. And then x's, as I explained, are the first block size characters starting at i. The y's are the offset by one of that, so just add plus one. And then we're going to get those chunks for every one of integers i in ix and use a torch.stack to take all those uh, uh, one-dimensional tensors, as we saw here, and we're going to um, stack them up at rows. And so they all become a row in a four by eight tensor. So here's what I'm printing then. When I sample a batch XB and YB, the inputs to the transformer now are, the input X is the four by eight tensor, four uh, rows of eight columns, and each one of these is a chunk of the training set. And then the targets here are in the associated array Y, and they will come in to the transformer all the way at the end uh, to um, create the loss function. Uh, so they will give us the correct answer for every single position inside X. And then these are the four independent rows. So spelled out as we did before, uh, this four by eight array contains a total of 32 examples and they're completely independent as far as the transformer is concerned. Uh, so when the input is 24, the target is 43, or rather 43 here in the Y array. When the input is 2443, the target is 58. Uh, when the input is 244358, the target is 5, etc. Or like when it is a 525581, the target is 58. Right, so you can sort of see this spelled out. These are the 32 independent examples packed in to a single batch of the input X, and then the desired targets are in Y. And so now this integer tensor of um, X is going to feed into the transformer and uh, that transformer is going to simultaneously process all these examples and then look up the correct um, integers to predict in every one of these positions in the tensor y. Okay so now that we have our batch of input that we'd like to feed into a transformer let's start basically feeding this into neural networks. Now we're going to start off with the simplest possible neural network which in the case of language modeling in my opinion is the bigram language model and we've covered the bigram language model in my make more series in a lot of depth and so here I'm going to sort of go faster and let's just implement the PyTorch module uh, directly that implements the bigram language model. So I'm importing the PyTorch um, NN module uh, for reproducibility. And then here I'm constructing a bigram language model, which is a subclass of NN module. And then I'm calling it and I'm passing in the inputs and the targets. And I'm just printing. Now when the inputs and targets come here, you see that I'm just taking the index uh, the inputs x here, which I renamed to idx, and I'm just passing them into this token embedding table. So what's going on here is that here in the constructor, we are creating a token embedding table, 
and it is of size, vocab size by vocab size. And we're using an n-dot embedding, which is a very thin wrapper around basically a tensor of shape, vocab size by vocab size. And what's happening here is that when we pass IDX here, every single integer in our input is going to refer to this embedding table and is going to pluck out a row of that embedding table corresponding to its index. So 24 here will go to the embedding table and will pluck out the 24th row. And then 43 will go here and pluck out the 43rd row, etc. And then PyTorch is going to arrange all of this into a batch by time by channel uh, tensor. In this case, batch is 4, time is 8, and C, which is the channels, is vocab size, or 65. And so we're just going to pluck out all those rows, arrange them in a B by T by C, and now we're going to interpret this as the logits, which are basically the scores for the next character in the sequence. And so what's happening here is we are predicting what comes next based on just the individual identity of a single token. And you can do that because, um, I mean, currently the tokens are not talking to each other and they're not seeing any context except for they're just seeing themselves. So I'm a, I'm a token number five and then uh, I can actually make pretty decent predictions about what comes next just by knowing that I'm token five because some characters uh, know, um, sort of follow other characters in, in typical scenarios. So we saw a lot of this in a lot more depth in the Make More series. And here, if I just run this, then we currently get the predictions, the scores, the logits for every one of the four by eight positions. Now that we've made predictions about what comes next, we'd like to evaluate the loss function. And so in Make More series, we saw that a good way to measure a loss or like a quality of the predictions is to use the negative log likelihood loss, which is also implemented in PyTorch under the name cross entropy. So what we'd like to do here is loss is the cross entropy on the predictions and the targets. And so this measures the quality of the logits with respect to the targets. In other words, we have the identity of the next character. So how well are we predicting the next character based on the logits? And intuitively, the correct, um, the correct dimension of logits, uh, depending on whatever the target is, should have a very high number. And all the other dimensions should be a very low number. Right now, the issue is that this won't actually. This is what we want. We want to basically output the logits and the loss. This is what we want, but unfortunately, uh, this won't actually run. We get an error message. But intuitively, we want to uh, measure this. Now, when we go to the PyTorch um, cross entropy uh, documentation here, um, we're trying to call the cross entropy in its functional form. Uh, so that means we don't have to create like a module for it. But here when we go to the documentation, you have to look into the details of how PyTorch expects these inputs. And basically the issue here is PyTorch expects if you have multi-dimensional input, which we do because we have a B by T by C tensor, then it actually really wants the channels to be the, the second uh, dimension here. So if you, um, so basically it wants a B by C by T instead of a B by T by C. And so it's just the details of how PyTorch treats um, these kinds of inputs. And so uh, we don't uh, actually want to deal with that. So what we're going to do instead is we need to basically reshape our logits. So here's what I like to do. I like to take, basically give names to the dimensions. So logits.shape is B by T by C and unpack those numbers. And then let's uh, say that logits equals logits.view. And we want it to be a B times C, B times T by C. So just a two dimensional array, right? So we're going to take all the, we're going to take all of these um, positions here and we're going to uh, stretch them out in a one dimensional sequence and uh, preserve the channel dimension as the second dimension. So we're just kind of like stretching out the array so it's two dimensional. And in that case, it's going to better conform to what PyTorch uh, sort of expects in its dimensions. Now we have to do the same to targets because currently targets are um, of shape B by T and we want it to be just B times T. So one dimensional. Now, alternatively, you could always still just do minus one because PyTorch will guess what this should be if you want to lay it out. Uh, but let me just be explicit and say B times T. Once we've reshaped this, it will match the cross entropy case and then we should be able to evaluate our loss. Okay, so that right now, and we can do loss. 
And so currently we see that the loss is 4.87. Now, because our uh, we have 65 possible vocabulary elements, we can actually guess at what the loss should be. And in particular, we covered negative log likelihood in a lot of detail. We are expecting log or lon of um, 1 over 65 and negative of that. So we're expecting the loss to be about 4.17, but we're getting 4.87. And so that's telling us that the initial predictions are not uh, super diffuse. They've got a little bit of entropy, and so we're guessing wrong. Uh, so, uh, yes. But actually, we're I able, we are able to evaluate the loss. Okay, so now that we can evaluate the quality of the model on some data, we'd like to also be able to generate from the model. So let's do the generation. Now I'm going to go again a little bit faster here because I covered all of this already in the previous videos. So here's a generate function for the model. So we take some, uh, we take the the same kind of input idx here, and basically this is the current uh, context of some characters in a batch in some batch. So it's also b by t, and the job of generate is to basically take this b by t and extend it to be b by t plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, and so it's just basically it continues the generation in all the batch dimensions in the time dimension. So that's its job, and it will do that for max new tokens. So you can see here on the bottom, there's going to be some stuff here, but on the bottom, whatever is predicted is concatenated on top of the previous idx along the first dimension, which is the time dimension, to create a b by t plus 1. So that becomes a new idx. So the job of generate is to take a b by t and make it a b by t plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, as many as we want max new tokens. So this is the generation from the model. Now inside the generation, what, we're, what are we doing? We're taking the current indices, we're getting the predictions. So we get, uh, those are in the logits, and then the loss here is going to be ignored because um, we're, not, we're not using that and we have no targets that are sort of ground truth targets that we're going to be comparing with. Then once we get the logits, we are only focusing on the last step. So instead of a b by t by c, we're going to pluck out the negative one, the last element in the time dimension, because those are the predictions for what comes next. So that gives us the logits, which we then convert to probabilities via softmax. And then we use torch.multinomial to sample from those probabilities. And we ask PyTorch to give us one sample. And so idx next will become a b by one because in each uh, one of the batch dimensions, we're going to have a single prediction for what comes next. So this num samples equals one, will make this be a one. And then we're going to take those integers that come from the sampling process, according to the probability distribution given here, and those integers got just concatenated on top of the current sort of like running stream of integers. And this gives us a p by t plus one. And then we can return that. Now, one thing here is, you see how I'm calling self of idx, which will end up going to the forward function. I'm not providing any targets. So currently this would give an error because targets is, uh, is uh, sort of like not given. So targets has to be optional. So targets is none by default. And then if targets is none, then there's no loss to create. So it's just loss is none. But else, all of this happens and we can create a loss. So this will make it so um, if we have the targets, we provide them and get a loss. If we have no targets, we'll just get the uh, logits. So this here will generate from the model. Um, and uh, let's take that for a ride now. Oops. So I have another code chunk here, which will generate for the model, from the model. And okay, this is kind of crazy. So maybe let me, <laughs> let me break this down. So these are the IDX, right? I'm creating a batch will be just one, time will be just one. So I'm creating a little one by one tensor and it's holding a zero. And the D type, the data type is uh, integer. So zero is going to be how we kick off the generation. And remember that zero is, uh, is the element standing for a new line character. So it's kind of like a reasonable thing to, to feed in as the very first character in a sequence uh, to be the new line. Um, so it's going to be IDX which we're going to feed in here. Then we're going to ask for 100 tokens. And then n.generate will continue that. Now, because uh, generate works on the level of batches, we, we then have to index into the zeroth row 
to basically unplug the, um, the single batch dimension that exists. And then that gives us a um, time steps, just a one dimensional array of all the indices, which we will convert uh, to simple Python list from PyTorch tensor so that that can feed into our decode function and uh, convert those integers into text. So let me bring this back and we're generating 100 tokens. Let's run. And uh, here's the generation that we achieved. So obviously it's garbage. And the reason it's garbage is because this is a totally random model. So next up, we're going to want to train this model. Now, one more thing I wanted to point out here is this function is written to be general, but it's kind of like ridiculous right now because we're feeding in all this, we're building out this context and we're concatenating it all. And we're always feeding it all into the model. But uh, that's kind of ridiculous because this is just a simple bigram model. So to make, for example, this prediction about k, we only needed this w. But actually what we fed into the model is we fed the entire sequence. And then we only looked at the very last piece and uh, predicted k. So the only reason I'm writing it in this way is because right now this is a bigram model. But I'd like to keep this function fixed and I'd like it to work um, later when our characters actually um, basically look further in the history. And so right now the history is not used, so this looks silly, uh, but eventually the history will be used, and so that's why we want to uh, do it this way. So just a quick comment on that. So now we see that this is um, random, so let's train the model so it becomes a bit less random. Okay, let's now train the model. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a PyTorch optimization object. So here we are using the optimizer Adam W. Um, now, in the Make More series, we've only ever used the Casting Gradient Descent, the simplest possible optimizer, which you can get using the SGD instead. But I want to use Atom, which is a much more advanced and popular optimizer, and it works extremely well. For a uh, typical good setting for the learning rate is roughly 3e-4, uh, but for very, very small networks, like is the case here, you can get away with much, much higher learning rates, 1 negative 3 or even higher, probably. But let me create the optimizer object which will basically take the gradients and uh, update the parameters using the gradients. And then here, our batch size up above was only 4. So let me actually use something bigger, let's say 32. And then for some number of steps, um, we are sampling a new batch of data. We're evaluating the loss. Uh, we're zeroing out all the gradients from the previous step, getting the gradients for all the parameters, and then using those gradients to update our parameters. So typical training loop, as we saw in the Make More series. So let me now uh, run this for, say, 100 iterations, and let's see what kind of losses we're going to get. So we started around 4.7, and now we're getting to, down to like 4.6, 4.5, etc. So the optimization is definitely happening, but um, let's uh, sort of try to increase the number of iterations and only print at the end, because we probably want to train for longer. OK, so we're down to 3.6, roughly roughly down to three. This is the most janky optimization. <laughs> okay, it's working. Let's just do 10,000. And then from here, we want to copy this. And hopefully, we're going to get something reasonable. And of course, it's not going to be Shakespeare <laughs> from a bigram model. But at least we see that the loss is improving. And um, Hopefully, we're expecting something a bit more reasonable. Okay, so we're down at about 2.5-ish. Let's see what we get. Okay, well, dramatic improvements certainly on what we had here. So let me just increase the number of tokens. Okay, so we see that we're starting to get something at least like reasonable-ish. Um, certainly not Shakespeare, <laughs> but uh, the model is making progress. So that is the simplest possible model. So now what I'd like to do is, obviously the, this is a very simple model because the tokens are not talking to each other. So given the previous context of whatever was generated, we're only looking at the very last character to make the predictions about what comes next. So now these, uh, now these tokens have to start talking to each other and figuring out what is in the context so that they can make better predictions for what comes next. And this is how we're going to kick off the uh, transformer. Okay, so next, I took the code that we developed in this Jupyter Notebook and I converted it to be a script. And I'm doing this because 
I just want to simplify our intermediate work, which is just the final product that we have at this point. So in the top here, I put all the hyperparameters that we've defined. I introduced a few, and I'm going to speak to that in, in a little bit. Otherwise, a lot of this should be recognizable. Uh, reproducibility, read data, get the encoder and the decoder, create the train and test splits, uh, use the uh, kind of like data loader um, that gets a batch of the inputs and targets. This is new, and I'll talk about it in a second. Now, this is the bigram language model that we developed, and it can forward and give us a logits and loss, and it can generate. And then here, we are creating the optimizer, and this is the training loop. So everything here should look pretty familiar. Now, some of the small things that I added. Number one, I added the ability to run on a GPU if you have it. So if you have a GPU, then you can, this will use CUDA instead of just CPU, and everything will be a lot more faster. Now, when device becomes CUDA, then we need to make sure that when we load the data, we move it to device. When we create the model, we want to move uh, the model parameters to device. So as an example, here we have the NN embedding table, and it's got a dot weight inside it, which stores the uh, sort of lookup table. So that would be moved to the GPU, so that all the calculations here happen on the GPU, and they can be a lot faster. And then finally here, when I'm creating the context that feeds into generate, I have to make sure that I create on the device. Number two, what I introduced is uh, the fact that here in the training loop, here I was just printing the um, loss.item inside the training loop. But this is a very noisy measurement of the current loss because every batch will be more or less lucky. And so what I want to do usually um, is uh, I have an estimate loss function. And the estimate loss basically then um, goes up here. And <clears throat> it averages up the loss over multiple batches. So in particular, we're going to iterate eval iter times. And we're going to basically get our loss, and then we're going to get the average loss for both splits. And so this will be a lot less noisy. So here, when we call the estimate loss, we're going to report the uh, pretty accurate train and validation loss. Now, when we come back up, you'll notice a few things here. I'm setting the model to a validation phase, <clears throat> and down here, I'm resetting it back to training phase. Now, right now, for our model as is, this doesn't actually do anything because the only thing inside this model is this uh, nn.embedding, and um, this, uh, this um, network would behave both, would behave the same in both evaluation mode and training mode. We have no dropout layers, we have no batch norm layers, etc. But it is a good practice to think through what mode your neural network is in, because some layers will have different behavior uh, at inference time or training time. And there's also this uh, context manager, torch.nograd, and this is just telling PyTorch that everything that happens inside this function, we will not call dot backward on. And so uh, PyTorch can be a lot more efficient with its memory use because it doesn't have to store all the intermediate variables uh, because we're never going to call backward. And so it can, it can be a lot more memory efficient in that way. So also a good practice to tell PyTorch when we don't intend to do backpropagation. So right now, this script is about 120 lines of code. Of, and that's kind of our starter code. I'm calling it bygram.py and I'm going to release it later. Now running this script <clears throat> gives us output in the terminal and it looks something like this. It basically, as I ran this code, uh, it was giving me the train loss and the val loss and we see that we convert to somewhere around 2.5 with the bygram model. And then here's the sample that we produced at the end. And so we have everything packaged up in the script and we're in a good position now to iterate on this. Okay, so we are almost ready to start writing our very first self-attention block for processing these uh, tokens. Now, before we actually get there, I want to get you used to a mathematical trick that is used in the self-attention inside a transformer and is really just like at the heart of an, an efficient implementation of self-attention. And so I want to work with this toy example to just get you used to this operation and then it's going to make it much more clear once we actually get to, um, to it uh, in the script again. So let's create a B by T by C, where B, T, and C are just 4, 8, and 2 in the story example. And these are basically channels, and we have uh, batches, and we have the time component, and we have some information at each point in the sequence, so C. Now, what we would like to do is we would like these um, tokens 
So we have up to eight tokens here in a batch. And these eight tokens are currently not talking to each other, and we would like them to talk to each other. We'd like to couple them. And in particular, we, don't, we, we want to couple them in a very specific way. So the token, for example, at the fifth location, it should not communicate with tokens in the sixth, seventh, and eighth location, because uh, those are future tokens in the sequence. The token on the fifth location should only talk to the one in the fourth, third, second, and first. So it's only so information only flows from previous context to the current time step, and we cannot get any information from the future because we are about to try to predict the future. So, what is the easiest way for tokens to communicate? Okay, the easiest way I would say is okay if we're up to if we're a fifth token and I'd like to communicate with my past, the simplest way we can do that is to just do a wait uh, is to just do an average of all the um, of all the preceding elements. So, for example, if I'm the fifth token, I would like to take the channels uh, that make up the, that our information at my step, but then also the channels from the fourth step, third step, second step, and the first step. I'd like to average those up, and then that would become sort of like a feature vector that summarizes me in the context of my history. Now, of course, just doing a sum or like an average is an extremely weak form of interaction. Like this communication is uh, extremely lossy. We've lost a ton of information about the spatial ar arrangements of all those tokens, uh, but that's okay for now. We'll see how we can bring that information back later. For now, what we would like to do is, for every single batch element independently, for every teeth token in that sequence, we'd like to now calculate the average of all the vectors in all the previous tokens and also at this token. So let's write that out. Um, I have a small snippet here, and instead of just fumbling around, let me just copy-paste it and talk to it. So in other words, we're going to create X, and B-O-W is short for bag of words, because bag of words is, um, is kind of like um, a term that people use when you are just averaging up things. So this is just a bag of words. Basically, there's a word stored on every one of these eight locations, and we're doing a bag of words, so just averaging. So in the beginning, we're going to say that it's just initialized at zero, and then I'm doing a for loop here, so we're not being efficient yet. That's coming. <laughs> but for now, we're just iterating over all the batch dimensions independently, iterating over time, and then the previous uh, tokens are at this uh, batch uh, dimension, and then everything up to and including the teeth token. Okay? So when we slice out x in this way, xprev becomes of shape um, how many t uh, elements there were in the past, and then of course c, so all the two-dimensional information from these little tokens. So that's the previous uh, sort of chunk of um, tokens from my current sequence. And then I'm just doing the average, or the mean, over the zeroth dimension, so I'm averaging out the time here. And I'm just going to get a little c one-dimensional vector, which I'm going to store in x bag of words. So I can run this, and uh, this is not going to be very informative because, let's see, so this is x of 0, so this is the uh, zeroth batch element, and then expo at 0, now, you see how the, at the first location here, you see that the two are equal, and that's because it's, uh, we're just doing an average of this one token. But here, this one, is now an average of these two. And now this one is an average of these three, and so on. So, uh, and this last one is the average of all of these elements. So vertical average, just averaging up all the tokens, now gives this outcome here. So this is all well and good, uh, but this is very inefficient. Now the trick is that we can be very, very efficient about doing this using matrix multiplication. So that's the mathematical trick, and let me show you what I mean. Let's work with the toy example here. Let me run it and I'll explain. I have a simple matrix here that is a 3 by 3 of all ones, a matrix B of just random numbers, and it's a 3 by 2, and a matrix C, which will be 3 by 3 multiply 3 by 2, which will give out a 3 by 2. So here we're just using um, matrix multiplication. So A multiply B gives us C. Okay, so how are these numbers in C um, achieved, right? So this number in the top left is the first row of A dot product with the first column of B. And since all the, the row of A right now is all just ones, 
then the dot product here with with this column of b is just going to do a sum of these of this column so 2 plus 6 plus 6 is 14 the element here in the output of c is also the first column here the first row of a multiplied now with the second column of b so 7 plus 4 plus plus 5 is 16 now you see that there's repeating elements here so this 14 again is because this row is again all ones and it's multiplying the first column of b so we get 14 and this one is and so on so this last number here is the last row dot product last column now the trick here is uh, the following this is just a boring number of um, it's just a boring array of all ones but torch has this function called trill which is short for a triangular uh, something like that and you can wrap it in torch at once and it will just return the lower triangular portion of this okay so now it will basically zero out uh, these guys here so we just get the lower triangular part well what happens if we do that so now we'll have a like this and B like this and now what are we getting here in C well what is this number well this is the first row times the first column and because this is zeros uh, these elements here are now ignored so we just get a 2 and then this number here is the first row times the second column and because these are zeros they get ignored and it's just 7 the 7 multiplies this one but look what happened here because this is 1 and then zeros we what ended up happening is we're just plucking out the row of this row of B and that's what we got now here we have 110 so here 110 dot product with these two columns will now give us 2 plus 6 which is 8 and 7 plus 4 which is 11 and because this is 111 we ended up with the addition of all of them and so basically depending on how many ones and zeros we have here we are basically doing a sum currently of a variable number of these rows and that gets deposited into C so currently we're doing sums because these are ones but we can also do average right and you can start to see how we could do average uh, of the rows of B uh, sort of in an incremental fashion because we don't have to we can basically normalize these rows so that they sum to one and then we're gonna get an average so if we took a and then we did a equals a divide a torch dot sum in the um, of a in the um, oneth dimension, and then let's keep them as true. So therefore, the broadcasting will work out. So if I rerun this, you see now that these rows now sum to one. So this row is one. This row is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is zero, and here we get one thirds. And now when we do a multiply b, what are we getting? Here we are just getting the first row first row. Here now we are getting the average of the first two rows. Okay, so 2 and 6 average is 4, and 4 and 7 average is 5.5. And on the bottom here, we are now getting the average of these three rows. So the average of all of elements of B are now deposited here. And so you can see that by manipulating these uh, elements of this multiplying matrix, and then multiplying it with uh, any given matrix, we can do these averages in this incremental fashion because we just get, um, and we can manipulate that based on the elements of A. Okay, so that's very convenient. So let's swing back up here and see how we can vectorize this and make it much more efficient using what we've learned. So in particular, we are going to produce an array A, but here I'm going to call it way, short for weights. But this is our A. And this is how much of every row we want to average up. And it's going to be an average because you can see that these rows sum to 1. So this is our A. And then our B in this example, of course, is X. So what's going to happen here now is that we are going to have an expo 2. And this expo 2 is going to be way multiplying our X. So let's think this through. Way is T by T. And this is matrix multiplying in PyTorch, a B by T by C. And it's giving us uh, uh, what shape. So PyTorch will come here and it will see that these shapes are not the same. So it will create a bash dimension here. And this is a bashed matrix multiply. 
And so it will apply this matrix multiplication in all the batch elements um, in parallel and individually. And then for each batch element, there will be a T by T multiplying T by C exactly as we had below. So this will now create B by T by C and Xbo2 will now become identical to Xbo. So we can see that torch dot all close of Xbo and Xbo2 should be true. Now, so this kind of like convinces us that uh, these are in fact um, the same. So Xbo and Xbo2, if I just print them, uh, okay, we're not going to be able to, <laughs> okay, we're not going to be able to just uh, stare it down, but, um, well, let me try Xbo basically just at the zeroth element and Xbo2 at the zeroth element, so just the first batch, and we should see that this and that should be identical, which they are, right? So what happened here? The trick is we were able to use batched matrix multiply to do this uh, aggregation, really, and it's a weighted aggregation and the weights are specified in this um, T by T array. And we're basically doing weighted sums. And uh, these weighted sums are, are uh, according to uh, the weights inside here, that take on sort of this triangular form. And so that means that a token at the teeth dimension will only get uh, sort of um, information from the um, tokens preceding it. So that's exactly what we want. And finally, I would like to rewrite it in one more way and we're going to see why that's useful. So this is the third version, and it's also identical to the first and second. But let me talk through it. It uses softmax. So trill here is this matrix, lower triangular ones. Way begins as all zero. Okay, so if I just print way in the beginning, it's all zero. Then I used masked fill. So what this is doing is weight.masked fill, it's all zeros, and I'm saying for all the elements where trill is equal to equal zero, make them be negative infinity. So all the elements where trill is zero will become negative infinity now. So this is what we get. And then the final line here is softmax. So if I take a softmax along every single, so dim is negative one, so along every single row, if I do a softmax, what is that going to do? Well, softmax is um, is also like a normalization operation, right? And so, spoiler alert, uh, you get the exact same matrix. Let me bring back the softmax. And recall that in softmax, we're going to exponentiate every single one of these, and then we're going to divide by the sum. And so, for, if we exponentiate every single element here, we're going to get a 1, and here we're going to get uh, basically zero. Zero, 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 everywhere else. And then when we normalize, we just get one. Here we're going to get one, one, and then zeros. And then softmax will, again, divide. And this will give us 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and so on. And so this is also uh, the, uh, the same way to produce uh, this mask. Now, the reason that this is a bit more interesting, and the reason we're going to end up using it in self-attention, is that these weights here begin uh, with zero and you can think of this as like an interaction strength or like an affinity so basically it's telling us how much of each uh, token from the past do we want to aggregate and average up and then this line is saying tokens from the past cannot communicate by setting them to negative infinity we're saying that we will not aggregate anything from those tokens and so basically, this then goes through softmax and through the weighted, and this is the aggregation through matrix multiplication. And so what this is now is, you can think of these as um, these zeros are currently just set by us to be zero, but a quick preview is that these affinities between the tokens are not going to be just constant at zero, they're going to be data dependent. These tokens are going to start looking at each other, and some tokens will find other tokens more or less interesting. And depending on what their values are, they're going to find each other interesting to different amounts, and I'm going to call those affinities, I think. And then here we are saying the future cannot communicate with the past. We're, we're going to clamp them. And then when we normalize and sum, we're going to aggregate uh, sort of their values depending on how interesting they find each other. And so that's the preview for self-attention. 
And basically, long story short from this entire section is that you can do weighted aggregations of your past elements by having by using matrix multiplication of a lower triangular fashion. And then the elements here in the lower triangular part are telling you how much of each element uh, fuses into this position. So we're going to use this trick now to develop the self-attention block. So first, let's get some quick preliminaries out of the way. First, the thing I'm kind of bothered by is that you see how we're passing in vocab size into the constructor? There's no need to do that because vocab size is already defined uh, up top as a global variable. So there's no need to pass this stuff around. Next, what I want to do is I don't want to actually create, I want to create like a level of indirection here where we don't directly go to the embedding for the um, logits, but instead we go through this intermediate phase because we're going to start making that bigger. So let me introduce a new variable, n embed. <clears throat> it's short for number of embedding dimensions. So n embed here will be, say, 32. That was a suggestion from GitHub Copilot, by the way. Um, it also suggested 32, which is a good number. So this is an embedding table and only 32 dimensional embeddings. So then here, this is not going to give us logits directly. Instead, this is going to give us token embeddings. That's what I'm going to call it. And then to go from the token embeddings to the logits, we're going to need a linear layer. So self.lm head, let's call it, short for language modeling head, is n linear from n embed up to vocab size. And then when we swing over here, we're actually going to get the logits by exactly what the copilot says. Now we have to be careful here because this C and this C are not equal. Um, this is an embed C and this is vocab size. So let's just say that an embed is equal to C. And then this just creates one spurious layer of indirection through a linear layer, but uh, this should basically run. So we see that this runs and uh, this currently looks kind of spurious, but uh, we're going to build on top of this. Now, next up, so far we've taken these indices and we've encoded them based on the identity of the uh, tokens inside IDX. The next thing that people very often do is that we're not just encoding the identity of these tokens, but also their position. So we're going to have a second position uh, embedding table here. So self.position embedding table is an, an embedding of block size by an embed. And so each position from zero to block size minus one will also get its own embedding vector. And then here, first let me decode uh, b by t from idx.shape. And then here, we're also going to have a pause embedding, which is the positional embedding. And these are, this is Tordash arrange. So this will be basically just integers from zero to t minus one. And all of those integers from zero to t minus one get embedded through the table to create a t by c. And then here, this gets renamed to just say x, and x will be the addition of the token embeddings with the positional embeddings. And here the broadcasting node will work out. So b by t by c plus t by c, this gets right aligned, a new dimension of one gets added, and it gets broadcasted across batch. So at this point, x holds not just the token identities, but the positions at which these tokens occur. And this is currently not that useful because, of course, we just have a simple bigram model. So it doesn't matter if you're in the fifth position, the second position, or wherever. It's all translation invariant at this stage. Uh, so this information currently wouldn't help. Uh, but as we work on the self-attention block, we'll see that this starts to matter. Okay, so now we get the crux of self-attention. So this is probably the most important part of this video to understand. We're going to implement a small self-attention for a single individual head, as they're called. So we start off with where we were. So all of this code is familiar. So right now, I'm working with an example where I changed the number of channels from 2 to 32. So we have a 4 by 8 arrangement of tokens. And, each to and the information at each token is currently 32 dimensional. But we just are working with random numbers. Now we saw here that the code as we had it before does a, a simple weight, a simple average of all the past tokens and the current token. So it's just the previous information and the current information is just being mixed together in an average. And that's what this code currently achieves. And it does so by creating this lower triangular structure, which allows us to mask out this uh, weight um, matrix that we create. So we mask it out and then we normalize it. 
And currently, when we initialize the affinities between all the different sort of tokens or nodes, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. So when we initialize the affinities between all the different tokens to be zero, then we see that way gives us this um, structure where every single row has these um, uniform numbers. And so that's what that's what then uh, in this matrix multiply makes it so that we're doing a simple average. Now, we don't actually want this to be all uniform because different uh, tokens will find different other tokens more or less interesting and we want that to be data dependent. So for example, if I'm a vowel, then maybe I'm looking for consonants in my past and maybe I want to know what those consonants are and I want that information to flow to me. And so I want to now gather information from the past, but I want to do it in a data dependent way. And this is the problem that self-attention solves. Now, the way self-attention solves this is the following. Every single node or every single token at each position will emit two vectors. It will emit a query and it will emit a key. Now, the query vector, roughly speaking, is what am I looking for? And the key vector, roughly speaking, is what do I contain? And then the way we get affinities between these uh, tokens now in a sequence is we basically just do a dot product between the keys and the queries. So my query dot products with all the keys of all the other tokens, and that dot product now becomes way. And so um, if the key and the query are sort of aligned, they will interact to a very high amount, and then I will get to learn more about that specific token as opposed to any other token in the sequence. So let's implement this now. We're going to implement a single, what's called head of self-attention. So this is just one head. There's a hyperparameter involved with these heads, which is the head size. And then here I'm initializing linear uh, modules and I'm using bias equals false, so these are just going to apply a matrix multiply with some fixed weights. And now let me produce a key and Q, K and Q, by forwarding these modules on X. So the size of this will now become B by T by 16, because that is the head size, and the same here, B by T by 16. So this being the head size. So you see here that when I forward this linear on top of my X, all the tokens in all the positions in the B by T arrangement, all of them in parallel and independently produce a key and a query. So no communication has happened yet. But the communication comes now. All the queries will dot product with all the keys. So basically what we want is we want way now, or the affinities between these, to be query multiplying key. But we have to be careful with, uh, we can't matrix multiply this, we actually need to transpose uh, k, but we have to be also careful because these are uh, when you have the bash dimension. So in particular we want to transpose uh, the last two dimensions, dimension negative 1 and dimension negative 2. So negative 2, negative 1. And so this matrix multiply now will basically do the following. b by t by 16 matrix multiplies b by 16 by t to give us b by t by t, right? So for every row of b, we're now going to have a t square matrix giving us the affinities, and these are now the way. So they're not zeros, they are now coming from this dot product between the keys and the queries. So this can now run, I can, I can run this and the weighted aggregation now is a function in a data dependent manner between the keys and queries of these nodes. So just inspecting what happened here, the way takes on this form. And you see that before way was uh, just a constant, so it was applied in the same way to all the batch elements. But now every single batch elements will have different uh, sort of way because uh, every single batch element contains different uh, tokens at different positions. And so this is not data dependent. So when we look at just the zeroth uh, row, for example, in the input, these are the weights that came out. And so you can see now that they're not just exactly uniform. Um, and in particular, as an example here for the last row, this was the eighth token. 
and the eighth token knows what content it has, and it knows at what position it's in. And now the eighth token, based on that, uh, creates a query. Hey, I'm looking for this kind of stuff. Um, I'm a vowel, I'm on the eighth position, I'm looking for any consonants at positions up to four. And then all the nodes get to emit keys. And maybe one of the channels could be, I am a, I am a consonant, and I am in a position up to four. And that key would have a high number in that specific channel. And that's how the query and the key, when they dot product, they can find each other and create a high affinity. And when they have a high affinity, like say, uh, this token was pretty interesting to, uh, to this eighth token. When they have a high affinity, then through the softmax, I will end up aggregating a lot of its information into my position. And so I'll get to learn a lot about it. Now, just uh, this, we're looking at way after this has already happened. Um, let me erase this operation as well. So let me erase the masking and the softmax just to show you the under the hood internals and how that works. So without the masking and the softmax, way comes out like this, right? This is the outputs of the dot products. Um, and these are the raw outputs, and they take on values from negative, you know, two to positive two, etc. So that's the raw interactions and raw affinities between all the nodes. But now, if I'm a if I'm a fifth node, I will not want to aggregate anything from the sixth node, seventh node, and the eighth node. So actually, we use the upper triangular masking. So those are not allowed to communicate. And now we actually want to have a nice uh, distribution. Uh, so we don't want to aggregate negative 0.11 of this node. That's crazy. So instead, we exponentiate and normalize. And now we get a nice distribution that sums to 1. And this is telling us now in a data-dependent manner how much of information to aggregate from any of these tokens in the past. So that's way, and it's not zeros anymore, but, but it's calculated in this way. Now there's one more uh, part to a single self-attention head. And that is that when we do the aggregation, we don't actually aggregate the tokens exactly. We aggregate, we produce one more value here, and we call that uh, the value. <laughs> So in the same way that we produced key and query, we're also going to create a value. And then here, we don't aggregate x. We calculate a v, which is just achieved by uh, propagating this linear on top of x again. And then we output way multiplied by v. So v is the elements that we aggregate, or the, the vector that we aggregate instead of the raw x. And now, of course, uh, this will make it so that the output here of the single head will be 16-dimensional, because that is the head size. So you can think of x as kind of like private information to this token, if you, if you think about it that way. So x is kind of private to this token. So I'm a fifth token, at some, uh, and I have some identity, and uh, my information is kept in vector x. And now, for the purposes of the single head, here's what I'm interested in, here's what I have, and if you find me interesting, here's what I will communicate to you. And that's stored in V. And so V is the thing that gets aggregated for the purposes of this single head between the different nodes. And that's uh, basically the self-attention mechanism. This is, this is what it does. There are a few notes that I would make, like to make about attention. Number one, attention is a communication mechanism. You can really think about it as a communication mechanism where you have a number of nodes in a directed graph where basically you have edges pointed between nodes like this. And what happens is every node has some vector of information and it gets to aggregate information via a weighted sum from all of the nodes that point to it. And this is done in a data-dependent manner, so depending on whatever data is actually stored at each node at any point in time. Now, our graph doesn't look like this. Our graph has a different structure. We have eight nodes because the block size is eight, and there's always eight to tokens. And uh, the first node is only pointed to by itself. The second node is pointed to by the first node and itself, all the way up to the eighth node, which is pointed to by all the previous nodes and itself. And so that's the structure that our directed graph has, or happens, happens to have, in an autoregressive sort of scenario like language modeling. But in principle, attention can be applied to any arbitrary directed graph, and it's just a communication mechanism between the nodes. The second note is that notice that there's no notion of space. So attention simply acts over like a set of vectors in this graph. And so by default, these nodes have no idea where they are positioned in the space. 
And that's why we need to encode them positionally and sort of give them some information that is anchored to a specific position so that they uh, sort of know where they are. And this is different than, for example, from convolution, because if you run, for example, a convolution operation over some input, there is a very specific sort of layout of the information in space, and the convolutional filters sort of act in space. And so it's, it's not like inattention. Inattention is just a set of vectors out there in space, they communicate, and if you want them to have a notion of space, you need to specifically add it, which is what we've done when we calculated the um, relative, the positional encode, encodings and added that information to the vectors. The next thing that I hope is very clear is that the elements across the batch dimension, which are independent examples, never talk to each other. They're always processed independently. And this is a batched matrix multiply that applies basically a matrix multiplication uh, kind of in parallel across the batch dimension. So maybe it would be more accurate to say that in this analogy of a directed graph, we really have, because the batch size is four, we really have four separate pools of eight nodes, and those eight nodes only talk to each other. But in total, there's like 32 nodes that are being processed. Uh, but there's um, sort of four separate pools of eight. You can look at it that way. The next note is that here in the case of language modeling, uh, we have this specific uh, structure of directed graph where the future tokens will not communicate to the past tokens. But this uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the constraint in the general case. And in fact, in many cases, you may want to have all of the uh, nodes talk to each other uh, fully. So as an example, if you're doing sentiment analysis or something like that with a transformer, you might have a number of tokens and you may want to have them all talk to each other fully because later you are predicting, for example, the sentiment of the sentence. And so it's okay for these nodes to talk to each other. And so in those cases, <clears throat> you will use an encoder block of self-attention. And uh, all it means that it's an encoder block is that you will delete this line of code, allowing all the nodes to completely talk to each other. What we're implementing here is sometimes called a decoder block. And it's called a decoder uh, because it is sort of like a decoding language and it's got this autoregressive format where you have to mask with the triangular matrix so that uh, nodes from the future never talk to the past because they would give away the answer. And so basically in encoder blocks you would delete this, allow all the nodes to talk. In decoder blocks this will always be present so that uh, you have this triangular structure. Uh, but both are allowed and attention doesn't care. Attention supports arbitrary connectivity between nodes. The next thing I wanted to comment on is you keep me you keep hearing me say attention, self-attention, etc. There's actually also something called cross-attention. What is the difference? <laughs> so <clears throat> basically, the reason this attention is self-attention is because the keys, queries, and the values are all coming from the same source from X. So the same source X produces keys, queries, and values. So these uh, nodes are self-attending. But in principle, attention is much more general than that. So for example, in encoder-decoder transformers, uh, you can have a case where the queries are produced from X, but the keys and the values come from a whole separate external source, and sometimes from uh, encoder blocks that encode some context that we'd like to condition on. And so the keys and the values will actually come from a whole separate source. Those are nodes on the side, and here we're just producing queries, and we're reading off information from the side. So cross-attention is used when there's a separate source of nodes we'd like to pull information from into our nodes. And it's self-attention if we just have nodes that would like to look at each other and talk to each other. So this attention here happens to be self-attention. But in principle, um, attention is a lot more general. Okay, and the last note at this stage is, if we come to the attention is all you need paper here, we've already implemented attention. So given query key and value, we've uh, multiplied the query and the key, we've softmaxed it, and then we are aggregating the values. There's one more thing that we're missing here, which is the dividing by one over square root of the head size. The DK here is the head size. Why are they doing this? Why is this important? So they call it the scaled attention. And it's kind of like an important normalization to basically have. The problem is if you have unit Gaussian inputs, so zero mean unit variance, K and Q are unit Gaussian, then if you just do weigh naively, then you see that your way actually will be, uh, the variance will be on the order of head size, which in our case is 16. But if you multiply by one over head size square root, so this is square root and this is one over, then the variance of way will be one, so it will be preserved. Now, why is this important? You'll notice that way here will feed into softmax. 
And so it's really important, especially at initialization, that way be fairly diffuse. So in our case here, we sort of locked out here, and way had a fairly diffuse numbers here. So um, like this. Now the problem is that because of softmax, if way takes on very positive and very negative numbers inside it, softmax will actually converge towards one hot vectors. And so I can illustrate that here. Um, say we are applying softmax to a tensor of values that are very close to zero, then we're going to get a diffuse thing out of softmax. But the moment I take the exact same thing and I start sharpening it, making it bigger by multiplying these numbers by eight, for example, you'll see that the softmax will start to sharpen. And in fact, it will sharpen towards the max. So it will sharpen towards whatever number here is the highest. And so um, basically we don't want these values to be too extreme, especially at initialization. Otherwise softmax will be way too peaky. And um, you're basically aggregating um, information from like a single node. Every node just aggregates information from a single other node. That's not what we want, especially at initialization. And so the scaling is used just to control the variance at initialization. Okay, so having said all that, let's now take our self-attention knowledge and let's uh, take it for a spin. So here in the code, I've created this head module and implements a single head of self-attention. So you give it a head size, and then here it creates the key query and the value linear layers. Typically people don't use biases in these. Uh, so those are the linear projections that we're going to apply to all of our nodes. Now here, I'm creating this trill variable. Trill is not a parameter of the module. So in sort of PyTorch naming conventions, uh, this is called a buffer. It's not a parameter and you have to call it, you have to assign it to the module using a register buffer. So that creates the trill, uh, the tri lower triangular matrix. And when we're given the input x, this should look very familiar now. We calculate the keys, the queries, we cal calculate the attention scores inside way. Uh, we normalize it, so we're using scaled attention here. Then we make sure that uh, future doesn't communicate with the past, so this makes it a decoder block. And then softmax, and then aggregate the value and output. Then here in the language model, I'm creating a head in the constructor, and I'm calling it self-attention head. And the head size, I'm going to keep as the same, an embed, just for now. And then here, once we've encoded the information with the token embeddings and the position embeddings, we're simply going to feed it into the self-attention head, and then the output of that is going to go into uh, the decoder language modeling head and create the logits. So this is the so, sort of the simplest way to plug in a self-attention component uh, into our network right now. I had to make one more change, which is that here in the generate, uh, we have to make sure that our IDX that we feed into the model, because now we're using positional embeddings, we can never have more than block size coming in because if IDX is more than block size, then our position embedding table is going to run out of scope because it only has embeddings for up to block size. And so therefore I added some uh, code here to crop the context that we're going to feed into self um, so that uh, we never pass in more than block size elements. So those are the changes and let's now train the network. Okay, so I also came up to the script here and I decreased the learning rate because uh, the self-attention can't tolerate very, very high learning rates. And then I also increased the number of iterations because the learning rate is lower. And then I trained it and previously we were only able to get to up to 2.5 and now we are down to 2.4. So we definitely see a little bit of an improvement from 2.5 to 2.4 roughly, uh, but the text is still not amazing. So clearly the self-attention head is doing some useful communication, but um, we still have a long way to go. Okay, so now we've implemented the scale.product attention. Now next up in the attention is all you need paper. There's something called multi-head attention. And what is multi-head attention? It's just applying multiple attentions in parallel and concatenating their results. So they have a little bit of diagram here. I don't know if this is super clear. It's really just multiple attentions in parallel. So let's implement that fairly straightforward. If we want a multi-head attention, then we want multiple heads of self-attention running in parallel. So in PyTorch, we can do this by simply creating multiple heads. So however, heads, however many heads you want, and then what is the head size of each? And then we run all of them in parallel into a list and simply concatenate all of the outputs. And we're concatenating over the channel dimension. So the way this looks now is we don't have just a single attention that uh, has a hit size of 32. 
because remember, an embed is 32. Instead of having one communication channel, we now have four communication channels in parallel. And each one of these communication channels typically will be uh, smaller uh, correspondingly. So because we have four communication channels, we want eight dimensional self attention. And so from each communication channel, we're going to gather eight dimensional vectors. And then we have four of them, and that concatenates to give us 32, which is the original and embed. And so this is kind of similar to, um, if you're familiar with convolutions, this is kind of like a group convolution. Uh, because basically, instead of having one large convolution, we do convolution in groups, and uh, that's multi-headed self-attention. And so then here, we just use SA heads, self-attention heads instead. Now, I actually ran it, and uh, scrolling down, I ran the same thing, and then we now get this down to uh, 2.28, roughly. And the output is still, the generation is still not amazing, but clearly the validation loss is improving, because we were at 2.4 just now. And so it helps to have multiple communication channels, because obviously these tokens have a lot to talk about. <laughs> they want to find the consonants, the vowels, they want to find the vowels just from certain positions, uh, they want to find any kinds of different things. And so it helps to create multiple independent channels of communication, gather lots of different types of data, and then uh, decode the output. Now, going back to the paper for a second, of course, I didn't explain this figure in full detail, but we are starting to see some components of what we've already implemented. We have the positional encodings, the token encodings that add. We have the masked multi-headed attention implemented. Now, here's another multi-headed attention, which is a cross-attention to an encoder, which we haven't, we're not going to implement in this case. I'm going to come back to that later. But I want you to notice that there's a feed forward part here, and then this is grouped into a block that gets repeated again and again. Now the feed forward part here is just a simple uh, multi-layer perceptron. Um, so the multi-headed, so here position-wise feed forward networks is just a simple little MLP. So I want to start basically in a similar fashion, also adding computation into the network. And this computation is on the per node level. So I've already implemented it, and you can see the diff highlighted on the left here when I've added or changed things. Now, before we had the self multi headed self attention that did the communication, but we went way too fast to calculate the logits. So the tokens looked at each other but didn't really have a lot of time to think on what they found from the other tokens. And so what I've implemented here is a little feed forward single layer, and this little layer is just a linear followed by a relative nonlinearity, and that, that's it. So it's just a little layer, and then I call it feed forward. Um, an embed, and then this feed forward is just called sequentially right after the self attention. So we self attend, then we feed forward, and you'll notice that the feed forward here, when it's applying linear, this is on a per token level. All the tokens do this independently. So the self attention is the communication, and then once they've gathered all the data, now they need to think on that data individually. And so that's what feed forward is doing, and that's why I've added it here. Now, when I train this, the validation loss actually continues to go down, now to 2.24, which is down from 2.28. Uh, the outputs still look kind of terrible, but at least we've improved the situation. And so, as a preview, we're going to now start to intersperse the communication with the computation. And that's also what the transformer does when it has blocks that communicate and then compute, and it groups them and replicates them. Okay, so let me show you what we'd like to do. We'd like to do something like this. We have a block, and this block is basically this part here, except for the cross-attention. Now, the block basically intersperses communication and then computation. The computation, the communication is done using multi-headed self-attention, and then the, the computation is done using a feed-forward network on all the tokens independently. Now, what I've added here also is you'll notice this takes the number of embeddings in the embedding dimension and the number of heads that we would like, which is kind of like group size in group convolution. And I'm saying that the number of heads we'd like is 4, and so because this is 32, we calculate that because this is 32, the number of heads should be 4, um, number, uh, the head size should be 8, so that everything sort of works out channel-wise. Um, so this is how the transformer structures uh, sort of the, uh, the sizes, typically. So the head size will become 8, and then this is how we want to intersperse them. And then here, I'm trying to create blocks, which is just a sequential application of block, 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 so that we're interspersing communication feedforward many, many times, and then finally we 
decode. Now, I actually tried to run this, and the problem is this doesn't actually give a very good uh, answer, a very good result. And the reason for that is we're start, starting to actually get like a pretty deep neural net. And deep neural nets uh, suffer from optimization issues, and I think that's what we're kind of like slightly starting to run into. So we need one more idea that we can borrow from the um, transformer paper to resolve those difficulties. Now there are two optimizations that dramatically help with the depth of these networks and make sure that the networks remain optimizable. Let's talk about the first one. The first one in this diagram is you see this arrow here, and then this arrow, and this arrow. Those are skip connections, or sometimes called residual connections. They come from this paper, uh, the Residual Learning for Image Recognition, from about 2015, uh, that introduced the concept. Now, these are basically, what it means is you transform the data, but then you have a skip connection with addition from the previous features. Now, the way I like to visualize it, uh, that I prefer, is the following. Here the computation happens from the top to bottom, and basically you have this uh, residual pathway and you are free to fork off from the residual pathway, perform some computation, and then project back to the residual pathway via addition. And so you go from the, uh, the uh, inputs to the targets only via plus and plus and plus. And the reason this is useful is because during backpropagation, remember from our micrograd video earlier, addition distributes gradients equally to both of its branches that, that fed as the input. And so the supervision or the gradients from the loss basically hop through every addition node all the way to the input and then also fork off into the residual blocks. But basically you have this gradient superhighway that goes directly from the supervision all the way to the input, unimpeded. And then these residual blocks are usually initialized in the beginning so they contribute very very little, if anything, to the residual pathway. They, they are initialized that way. So in the beginning they are sort of almost kind of like not there. But then during the optimization, they come online over time and they uh, start to contribute. Uh, but at least at the initialization, you can go from directly supervision to the input. Gradient is unimpeded and just flows. And then the blocks over time kick in. And so that dramatically helps with the optimization. So let's implement this. So coming back to our block here, basically what we want to do is we want to do x equals x plus self-attention and x equals x plus self.feed forward. So this is x, and then we fork off and do some communication and come back. And we fork off and we do some computation and come back. So those are residual connections. And then swinging back up here, we also have to introduce this projection. So nn.linear. And uh, this is going to be from after we concatenate this. This is the size n embed. So this is the output of the self-tension itself. But then we actually want the uh, to apply the projection, and that's the result. So the projection is just a linear transformation of the outcome of this layer. So that's the projection back into the residual pathway. And then here in the feed forward, it's going to be the same thing. I could have a, a self dot projection here as well, but let me just simplify it and let me uh, couple it inside the same sequential container. And so this is the projection layer going back into the residual pathway. And so that's, uh, well, that's it. So now we can train this. So I implemented one more small change. When you look into the paper again, you see that the dimensionality of input and output is 512 for them. And they're saying that the inner layer here in the feed forward has dimensionality of 2048. So there's a multiplier of four. And so the inner layer of the feed forward network should be multiplied by four in terms of channel sizes. So I came here and I multiplied four times embed here for the feed forward and then from four times an embed coming back down to an embed when we go back to the project uh, to the projection so adding a bit of computation here and growing that layer that is in the residual block on the side of the residual pathway and then I trained this and we actually get down all the way to uh, 2.08 validation loss and we also see that the network is starting to get big enough that our train loss is getting ahead of validation loss so we started to see like a little bit of overfitting and um, our our um, uh, generations here are still not amazing, but at least you see that we can see like is here, this now, grief sync, like this starts to almost look like English. So um, yeah, we're starting to really get there. Okay, and the second innovation that is very helpful for optimizing very deep neural networks is right here. 
So we have this addition now, that's the residual part. But this norm is referring to something called layer norm. So layer norm is implemented in PyTorch. It's a paper that came out a while back here. Um, and layer norm is very, very similar to bash norm. So remember back to our Make More series part three. We implemented bash normalization. And uh, bash normalization basically just made sure that um, across the bash dimension, any individual neuron had unit uh, Gaussian um, distribution. So it was zero mean and unit standard deviation, one standard deviation output. So what I did here is I'm copy pasting the bash norm 1D that we developed in our Make More series. And see here we can initialize, uh, for example, this module, and we can have a batch of 32 100 dimensional vectors feeding through the bash norm layer. So what this does is it guarantees that when we look at just the zeroth column, it's a zero mean, one standard deviation. So it's normalizing every single column of this uh, input. Now the rows are not uh, going to be normalized by default because we're just normalizing columns. So let's now implement layer norm. Uh, it's very complicated. Look, <laughs> we come here, we change this from zero to one. So we don't normalize the columns, we normalize the rows. And now we've implemented layer norm. <laughs> so now the columns are not going to be normalized, um, but the rows are going to be normalized. For every individual example, it's 100 dimensional vector is normalized uh, in this way. And because our computation now does not span across examples, we can delete all of this buffers stuff uh, because uh, we can always apply this uh, operation and uh, don't need to maintain any running buffers. So we don't need the buffers. Uh, we don't, uh, there's no distinction between training and test time. Uh, and we don't need these running buffers. We do keep gamma and beta. We don't need the momentum. We don't care if it's training or not. And this is now a uh, layer norm. And it normalizes the rows instead of the columns. And this here is identical to basically this here. So let's now implement layer norm in our transformer. Before I incorporate the layer norm, I just wanted to note that as I said, very few details about the transformer have changed in the last five years, but this is actually something that slightly departs from the original paper. You see that the add and norm is applied after the transformation, uh, but um, in, now it is a bit more uh, basically common to apply the layer norm before the transformation. So there's a reshuffling of the layer norms. Uh, so this is called the pre-norm formulation, and that's the one that we're going to implement as well. So slight deviation from the original paper. Basically, we need two layer norms. Layer norm one is uh, an end dot layer norm, and we tell it how many, um, what is the embedding dimension. And we need the second layer norm. And then here, the layer norms are applied immediately on X. So self dot layer norm one in applied on X, and self dot layer norm two applied on X before it goes into self attention and feed forward. And uh, the size of the layer norm here is an embed, so 32. So when the layer norm is normalizing our features, it is uh, the normalization here uh, happens, the mean and the variance are taken over 32 numbers. So the batch and the time act as batch dimensions, both of them. So this is kind of like a per token um, transformation that just normalizes the features and makes them uh, unit mean, uh, unit Gaussian at initialization. But of course, because these layer norms inside it have these gamma and beta trainable parameters, uh, the layer norm will uh, eventually create outputs that might not be unit Gaussian, but the optimization will determine that. So for now, this is the uh, this is incorporating the layer norms, and let's train them up. Okay, so I let it run, and we see that we get down to 2.06, which is better than the previous 2.08, so a slight improvement by adding the layer norms. And I'd expect that they help uh, even more if we had a bigger and deeper network. One more thing I forgot to add is that there should be a layer norm here also, typically, as at the end of the transformer and right before the final uh, linear layer that decodes into vocabulary. So I added that as well. So at this stage, we actually have a pretty complete uh, transformer according to the original paper, and it's a decoder-only transformer. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but at this stage, uh, the major pieces are in place, so we can try to scale this up and see how well we can push this number. Now, in order to scale out the model, I had to perform some cosmetic changes here to uh, make it nicer. 
So I introduced this variable called nLayer, which just specifies how many layers of the blocks we're going to have. I create a bunch of blocks, and we have a new variable number of heads as well. I pulled out the layer norm here, and uh, so this is identical. Now, one thing that I did briefly change is I added uh, dropout. So dropout is something that you can add right before the uh, residual connection back, or right before the connection back into the residual pathway. So we can drop out that as the last layer here. We can drop out uh, here at the end of the multi-headed restriction as well. And we can also drop out here uh, when we calculate the um, basically affinities and after the softmax, we can drop out some of those. So we can randomly prevent some of the nodes from communicating. And so dropout uh, comes from this paper from 2014 or so. And basically it takes your neural net and it randomly, every forward backward pass, shuts off some subset of uh, neurons. So randomly drops them to zero and trains without them. And what this does effectively is because the mask of what's being dropped out is changed every single forward backward pass, it ends up kind of uh, training an ensemble of subnetworks. And then at test time, everything is fully enabled and kind of all of those subnetworks are merged into a single ensemble, if you, can, if you want to think about it that way. So I would read the paper to get the full detail. For now, we're just going to stay on the level of this is a regularization technique. And I added it because I'm about to scale up the model quite a bit and I was concerned about overfitting. So now when we scroll up to the top, uh, we'll see that I changed a number of hyperparameters here about our neural net. So I made the batch size be much larger, now it's 64. I changed the block size to be 256. So previously it was just eight, eight characters of context. Now it is 256 characters of context to predict the 257th. Uh, I brought down the learning rate a little bit because the neural net is now much bigger, so I brought down the learning rate. The embedding dimension is now 384, and there are six heads. So 384 divide six means that every head is 64 dimensional as it as a standard. And then there are going to be six layers of that. And the dropout will be a 0.2. So every forward backward pass, 20% of all of these um, intermediate uh, calculations are disabled and dropped to zero. And then I already trained this and I ran it. So uh, drum roll, how well does it perform? <laughs> so let me just scroll up here. We get a validation loss of 1.48 which is actually quite a bit of an improvement on what we had before, which I think was 2.07. So we went from 2.07 all the way down to 1.48 just by scaling up this neural net with the code that we have. And this, of course, ran for a lot longer. This maybe trained for, I want to say, about 15 minutes on my A100 GPU. So that's a pretty good GPU. And if you don't have a GPU, you're not going to be able to reproduce this. Uh, on a CPU, this would be... Um, I would not run this on a CPU or a MacBook or something like that. You'll have to break down the number of uh, layers and the embedding dimension and so on. Uh, but in about 15 minutes we can get this kind of a result and um, I'm printing some of the Shakespeare here but what I did also is I printed 10,000 characters so a lot more and I wrote them to a file and so here we see some of the outputs. So it's a lot more recognizable as the input text file. So the input text file just for reference looked like this. So there's always like someone speaking in this manner and uh, our predictions now take on that form. Except, of course, they're, uh, they're nonsensical when you actually read them. So, it is, every crimpty be a house. <laughs> oh, those preparation. <laughs> we give heed. Um, you know. Oh, ho, sent me you mighty lord. <laughs> Anyway, so you can read through this. Um, it's nonsensical, of course, but this is just a transformer trained on the character level for one million characters that come from Shakespeare. So it's sort of like blabbers on in Shakespeare-like manner, but it doesn't, of course, make sense at this scale. Uh, but I think, I think still a pretty good demonstration of what's possible. So now, I think uh, that kind of like concludes the programming section of this video. We basically kind of uh, did a pretty good job in, um, of implementing this transformer, uh, but the picture uh, doesn't exactly match up to what we've done. So what's going on with all these additional parts here? So let me finish explaining this architecture and why it looks so funky. Basically what's happening here is what we implemented here is a decoder-only transformer. So there's no component here. This part is called the encoder, 
and there's no cross attention block here. Our block only has a self attention and the feet forward, so it is missing this third in between piece here. This piece does cross attention, so we don't have it and we don't have the encoder, we just have the decoder. And the reason we have a decoder only uh, is because we are just uh, generating text and it's unconditioned on anything. We're just we're just blabbering on according to a given data set. What makes it a decoder is that we are using the triangular mask in our uh, transformer. So it has this autoregressive property where we can just uh, go and sample from it. So the fact that it's using the triangul triangular mask to mask out the attention makes it a decoder and it can be used for language modeling. Now, the reason that the original paper had an encoder-decoder architecture is because it is a machine translation paper. So it is concerned with a different setting in particular. It expects some uh, tokens that encode, say, for example, French, and then it is expected to decode the translation in English. So, so you typically these here are special tokens. So you are expected to read in this and condition on it. And then you start off the generation with a special token called start. So this is a special new token um, that you introduce and always place in the beginning. And then the network is expected to output neural networks are awesome and then a special end token to finish the generation. So this part here will be decoded exactly as we, we've done it. Neural networks are awesome will be identical to what we did. But unlike what we did, they want to condition the generation on some additional information. And in that case, this additional information is the French sentence that they should be translating. So what they do now is they bring in the encoder. Now the encoder reads this part here. So we're only going to take the part of French and we're going to uh, create tokens from it exactly as we've seen in our video and we're going to put a transformer on it but there's going to be no triangular mask and so all the tokens are allowed to talk to each other as much as they want and they're just encoding whatever's the content of this French uh, sentence. Once they've encoded it, they they basically come out in the top here. And then what happens here is in our decoder, which does the uh, language modeling, there's an additional connection here to the outputs of the encoder. And that is brought in through a cross attention. So the queries are still generated from X, but now the keys and the values are coming from the side. The keys and the values are coming from the top generated by the nodes that came outside of the, deco the encoder. And those tops, the keys and the values there, the top of it, feed in on a side into every single block of the decoder. And so that's why there's an additional cross attention. And really what it's doing is it's conditioning the decoding, not just on the past of this current decoding, but also on having seen the full, fully encoded French um, prompt, sort of. And so it's an encoder-decoder model, which is why we have those two transformers, an additional block, and so on. So we did not do this because we have no, we have nothing to encode, there's no conditioning, we just have a text file and we just want to imitate it, and that's why we are using a decoder-only transformer, exactly as done in GPT. Okay, so now I wanted to do a very brief walkthrough of NanoGPT, which you can find on my GitHub. And uh, NanoGPT is basically two files of interest. There's train.py and model.py. Train.py is all the boilerplate code for training the network. It is basically all the stuff that we had here. It's the training loop. It's just that it's a lot more complicated because we're saving and loading checkpoints and pre-trained weights, and we are uh, decaying the learning rate and compiling the model and using distributed training across multiple nodes or GPUs. So the training.py gets a little bit more hairy, complicated. Uh, there's more options, etc. But the model.py should look very, very um, similar to what we've done here. In fact, the model is, is almost identical. So first, here we have the causal self-attention block. And all of this should look very, very recognizable to you. We're producing queries, keys, values. We're doing dot products. We're masking, applying softmax, optionally dropping out. And here we are pooling the, the values. What is different here is that in our code, I have separated out the multi-headed attention into just a single individual head and then here I have multiple heads and I explicitly concatenate them whereas here uh, all of it is implemented in a batched manner inside a single causal self-attention and so we don't just have a B and a T and a C dimension we also end up with a fourth dimension which is the heads 
And so it just gets a lot more sort of hairy because we have four dimensional array um, tensors now, but it is um, equivalent mathematically. Uh, so the exact same thing is happening as what we have. It's just, it's a bit more efficient because all the heads are now treated as a batch dimension as well. Then we have the multilayer perceptron. It's using the Gelu nonlinearity, which is defined here except instead of ReLU. And this is done just because OpenAI used it and I want to be able to load their checkpoints. Uh, the blocks of the transformer are identical, the communicate and the compute phase, as we saw, and then the GPT will be identical. We have the position encodings, token encodings, the blocks, the layer norm at the end, uh, the final linear layer, and this should look all very recognizable. And there's a bit more here because I'm loading checkpoints and stuff like that. I'm separating out the parameters into those should, that should be weight decayed and those that shouldn't. Uh, but the generate function should also be very, very similar. So a few details are different, but you should definitely be able to look at this uh, file and be able to understand a lot of the pieces now. So let's now bring things back to ChatGPT. What would it look like if we wanted to train ChatGPT ourselves, and how does it relate to what we learned today? Well, to train in ChatGPT, there are roughly two stages. First is the pre-training stage, and then the fine-tuning stage. In the pre-training stage, uh, we are training on a large chunk of internet and just trying to get a first decoder-only transformer to babble text. So it's very, very similar to what we've done ourselves, except we've done like a tiny little baby pre-training step. Uh, and so in our case, uh, this is how you print a number of parameters. I printed it and it's about 10 million. So this transformer that I created here to create a little Shakespeare um, transformer was about 10 million parameters. Our data set is roughly 1 million uh, characters, so roughly 1 million tokens. But you have to remember that OpenAI uses different vocabulary. They're not on the character level. They use these um, subword chunks of words. And so they have a vocabulary of 50,000 roughly elements. And so their sequences are a, a bit more condensed. So our data set, the Shakespeare data set, would be probably around 300,000 uh, tokens in the OpenAI vocabulary, roughly. So we trained about 10 million parameter model on roughly 300,000 tokens. Now, when you go to the GPT-3 paper and you look at the transformers that they trained, they trained a number of transformers of different sizes, but the uh, biggest transformer here has 175 billion parameters. Uh, so ours is again, 10 million. They used this number of layers in the transformer. This is the N embed. This is the number of heads, and this is the head size. And then this is the batch size, uh, so ours was 65. <laughs> and the uh, learning rate is similar. Now, when they trained this transformer, they trained on 300 billion tokens. So again, remember, ours is about 300,000. So this is uh, about a million fold increase. And this number would not be even that large by today's standards. You'd be going up uh, 1 trillion and above. So they are training a significantly larger model on uh, a good chunk of the internet. And that is the pre-training stage. But otherwise, these hyperparameters should be fairly recognizable to you. And the architecture is actually like nearly identical to what we implemented ourselves. But of course, it's a massive infrastructure challenge to train this. You're talking about typically thousands of GPUs uh, having to you know, talk to each other to train models of this size. So that's just the pre-training stage. Now, after you complete the pre-training stage, uh, you don't get something that responds to your questions with answers and is not helpful and etc. You get a document completer, <laughs> right? So it babbles, but it doesn't babble Shakespeare, it babbles internet. It will create arbitrary news articles and documents and it will try to complete documents because that's what it's trained for. It's trying to complete the sequence. So when you give it a question, it would just uh, potentially just give you more questions. It would follow with more questions. It will do whatever it looks like, the, some close document would do in the training data on the internet. And so who knows, you're getting kind of like undefined behavior. It might basically answer with two questions with other questions. It might ignore your question. It might just try to complete some news article. It's totally unaligned, as we say. So the second fine tuning stage is to actually align it to be an assistant. And uh, this is the second stage. And so this ChatGPT blog post from OpenAI talks a little bit about how this stage is achieved. We basically, um, there's roughly three steps to, the, to this stage. Uh, so what they do here is they start to collect training data that looks specifically like uh, what an assistant would do. So there are documents that have the format where the question is on top and then an answer is below. 
and they have a large number of these, but probably not on the order of the internet. Uh, this is probably on the order of maybe thousands of examples. And so they, they then fine tune the model to basically only focus on documents that look like that. And so you're starting to slowly align it. So it's going to expect a question at the top and it's going to expect to complete the answer. And uh, these very, very large models are very sample efficient during their fine tuning. So this actually somehow works. But that's just step one, that's just fine tuning. So then they actually have more steps where, okay, the second step is you let the model respond and then different raters look at the different responses and rank them for their preference as to which one is better than the other. They use that to train a reward model so they can predict, uh, basically using a different network, how much of any candidate response it would uh, be desirable. And then once they have a reward model, they run PPO, which is a form of policy, policy gradient um, reinforcement learning optimizer to uh, fine tune this sampling policy uh, so that the answers that the GPT, chat GPT now generates are expected to score a high reward according to the reward model. And so basically there's a whole aligning stage here or fine tuning stage. It's got multiple steps in between there as well. And it takes the model from being a document completer to a question answerer. And that's like a whole separate stage. Uh, a lot of this data is not available publicly. It is internal to OpenAI and uh, it's much harder to replicate this stage. Um, and so that's roughly what would give you a chat GPT. And NanoGPT focuses on the pre-training stage. Okay, and that's everything that I wanted to cover today. So we trained, to summarize, a decoder-only transformer following this famous paper, Attention is All You Need, from 2017. And so that's basically a GPT. We trained it on a tiny Shakespeare and got sensible results. All of the training code is roughly 200 lines of code. I will be releasing this um, code base. So also it comes with all the git log commits along the way as we built it up. In addition to this code, I'm going to release uh, the um, notebook, of course, the Google Colab. And I hope that gave you a sense for how you can train um, these models like, say, GPT-3 that will be um, architecturally basically identical to what we have but they are somewhere between 10,000 and 1 million times bigger, depending on how you count. And so uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, we did not talk about any of the fine-tuning stages that would typically go on top of this. So if you're interested in something that's not just language modeling, but you actually want to, you know, say, perform tasks, um, or you want them to be aligned in a specific way, or you want um, to detect sentiment or anything like that, basically anytime you don't want something that's just a document completer, you have to complete further stages of fine-tuning, which we did not cover. Uh, and that could be simple supervised fine-tuning, or it can be something more fancy like we see in ChatGPT, where you actually train a reward model and then do runs of PPO to uh, align it with respect to the reward model. So there's a lot more that can be done on top of it. I think for now we're starting to get to about two hours mark, uh, so I'm going to um, kind of finish here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture, uh, and uh, yeah, go forth and transform. See you later. Morning, everybody. David Shapiro here. We are back for part two of the um, Knowledge Graph Supreme Court decision thing. So we're using ChatGPT and GPT-3 to help us along. And uh, as a quick recap, where we left off was um, I <laughs> didn't get that far, um, but I downloaded about 22 Supreme Court opinions. This was about antitrust law, so a very specific domain. Um, and then I got them converted to text. So that is, um, I did that with another uh, uh, repo, it's fine. Um, but then what we did was, uh, the, the big thing that we achieved was that we figured out that we can get GPT-3 to just go ahead and write my, um, write the, uh, whatchamacallit for us, the, the, the knowledge graph JSON. And so what I'm doing is, um, the nodes that I asked for was, each node should be a case citation, precedent, or prior opinion. Each node should have several properties such as date, case number, involved parties, reasoning for including in this opinion, and other relevant information. So that um, worked really well, because you see like it's got a case number, it tells me when it happened, 
Um, and then the reasoning, so like involved parties, like it, great. This is phenom This is phenomenal information. So what we're doing is we're going to create a cross-linked web as to like why all these things are interlinked. Um, so that way, theoretically, if a uh, the, the, this hypothetical use case, if an attorney is researching antitrust laws so that one they can you know go to a court court of appeals or even present to the supreme court they will have a masterful understanding of established law and the reason that this is important is because common law is um how uh, law works in america it's by prior precedent is the so you've got the the laws that are laid down by the legislative branch and then interpreted by the judicial branch and so the judicial branch keeps track of their own interpretation right because there's the legislative branch it, it it has to do with separation of powers anyways so that's how we got where we are um it worked really well and um there's all kinds of what ifs and gotchas that i'm not going to worry about because this worked really well and we can iterate over the over the long term so but this i had to plug in manually and it's about four pages so like if we do if we search for how many new pages there are two, three, yeah, one, two, three. So that this has four pages total, um, which th that, that, that was good. So the next problem is we got to take these and regardless of how long they are, we have to break them down into chunks of four pages maximum. Um, so rather than do this manually, I was like, why don't I just ask chat GPT? So here we go. Um, I have a folder named um, do, 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 uh, let's see, um, opinions, uh, text, um, this folder, uh, contains, um, uh, text files of SCOTUS decisions, um, that were converted from PDFs. The pages are demarcated by um by the words new page i need a python function um so i'm basically talking to this thing like i'd be talking to a, a developer i need a python function where i pass um pass uh da, 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 da. actually no i actually let's just ask it to do the whole thing i need a python function that um reads every uh, uh, file in opinions underscore text um, and then breaks um, each file into chunks of four pages. Um, the purpose of this is to um, limit the size of each subsequent file please then save the chunks into um into a folder named chunks uh text um and append um a serial number to the original file name for instance um you know, star underscore one, star underscore two, and so on. All right, let's see what it does. Why would this violate the content policy? Okay, I sent in feedback. Um, let's see what we've got. So, Import OS split text files, input folder, output fo folder, pages per chunk. So good, it's parameterized it. Um, if not, uh, output folder, make it nice. Okay. For file and OS lister, input folder um, with open OS path join, uh, input folder file, R as F, read it, excellent. Pages equals split on new page, perfect. So it understood that. For I in chunk enumerate page range zero pages per chunk, excellent. So this is this is a, a list comprehension that will break it into equal chunks or chunks of four. 
output file equals this underscore plus oh dang that's good that's good okay um this is wonderful so let's go to this um i had started writing it and then i was like i don't have the energy for this <laughs> i'm telling you i have said it on twitter and i've said it on uh, mostly twitter but linkedin and a few other places english your ability to describe what you want is going to be the primary programming language from now on period end of story if you can think through a function then um yeah this is this is it so let's run this let's see if this worked um da, 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 need a command prompt cd and we're in the uh, scotus opinions um and then we'll do python step 01 split chunks why you no work um this actually happens quite a bit um let's see if it can fix it um so thanks that mostly worked but through this error can you fix that error please now if this can debug this i know exactly what it is yep Yep, there you go. You need to specify the encoding. Yep, perfect. Oh, wow. Okay, it's saying add the ignore flag. Wonderful. Wonderful! Adding encoding UTF-8 should be sufficient. Um, so that goes do to do to do to do right here. Hmm. Fascinating. Did it get farther? This is weird though. Input folder file contents read encoding UTF eight as info. So sometimes this happens um let's see what is the encoding here so sometimes what i do is i'll convert it to something and then i'll um convert back so let's yeah hmm i wonder what happens if we do Let's add let's add that ignore thing. Rather than rather than getting lost in the weeds, let's just do errors equal ignore. Because you know what? I looked at the text file, it looks fine to me. Oh, and let's also see if it um Okay, it got pretty far already. So it got pretty far in the process before blowing up. One, two, three. So now we've got all the chunks. Cool, cool, cool. Um all right, heck with it. Send it. What do you mean? This was in, so this was in split text files, F write. Oh, it couldn't write it. Interesting. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, so when we write it, we need to, we need to convert it to ASCII and back. Um, so, let's see if it understands this oh man i'll be i'll be jazzed if it if it understands this okay um great that worked uh now i have a new problem here's the error um please find a solution for this new bug so what so the problem here is and i um, yeah, that you're trying to join a list of strings that contain spaces. Uh, don't think so. New page. Nope, that's not it. Replace. No, no. No, I don't think that's it. I think we need to fix the um, 
string encoding. Um, here's the last part of the error. I feel like I'm talking to like HAL 9000. Yep, there it is. That's it. Yep. Ah, so we need to add the encoding to, to UTF-8. Right, okay, that makes sense. This thing is smarter than me. <laughs> um, okay, so when we write it, yeah. Oh, that's the problem. I okay. Um, encoding equals UTF eight. Okay, cool. But uh, this took way less brain power. <laughs> okay. Let's see if that works. CLS clear screen. That was fast. All right. So now we have 144 chunks of text. Let's see what the biggest one is. Twenty. Uh. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I think the uh, I think the OCR messed up with this one. <laughs> Provides that the Sherman Act. Okay, I'm probably disturbing my audience. <laughs> What's funny is that it got the capital letters fine, but then the rest, it's like no. I wonder if it was like if the scanner bed was like moving too slowly or something. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to pause this because I'm going to keep laughing. <laughs> Okay, I had to stop and make myself tea. I'm still probably going to be laughing a bit. I'm sorry. Okay, now normally, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know why this is so funny. Normally, um, this would uh, what I would do is just delete data. But in this case, I don't want to lose anything. And imagine like, what if half of our files were like this? So let's come up with a solution. Um, so I'm going to. So this 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 function works. So I'm going to say, okay, cool. Let's make a new script. So let's go back over to ChatGPT. Great, that all worked. Um, but it turns out the OCR barfed on a few files. So the um, so there are lots of duplicated characters, such as um, please write a new script using spacey or NLTK to um, deduplicate uh, extra characters. Um, search through all the files in, um, let's see, what was the folder name? Chunks.txt in chunks underscore text. Um, deduplicate <clears throat> deduplicate characters um, and then save the cleaned up copy um, in a new folder called um, deduped text. All right. Will that work? I don't know if that'll work. Is Spacey that good? Or T in doc. Um, okay. I think I'll need to add the encoding, but let's give it a shot. And let me make sure I've got pip and pip install spacey. Okay. 
So while that's running, I will do save and we'll come back here and we'll do um, step O2. Oh, so you might notice I start, I, 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 um, I do my functions like in order. So that way, like if you're looking at this repo, you don't have to like try and reverse engineer what order to run things in. Like it's just intrinsic documentation. Um, ddupe characters.py. Okay, Python step 02. And I know that it's gonna barf on um, this. So let's do encoding e equals UTF, UTF-9. UTF-9 is clearly better than UTF-8, right? It's the next version. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in a mood today, apparently. <laughs> you having a giggle, mate? Okay. Um, Let's see if it works. I'm not going to use the GPU for something this simple. It's a small skipping registered, can't find, and it doesn't seem to be a Python package. Huh. Let's see. Um, it gave me this error. What does it mean? <laughs> it didn't work. And this is the value of having good error messages, kids. Interesting. All right. Let's see if that worked. Still didn't work. Um, okay. All right. So in this case, it seems like we found a limitation still didn't work. Spacey load. Is requirement already satisfied? Yeah, it says it's already satisfied. Um, let's go. Let's go to Google. Let's see if. Uh, let's see if this. All right. Import. So it looks like you need to do, you need to install. Let's try this. That looks like it did a thing. Sorry, I, I wasn't talking through it. So basically I was looking, I found, I found a spacey issue on GitHub and um, let's see, it hasn't bombed yet. So I wonder if it's working, um, deduped. Ooh, cool. There's nothing that's 20, uh, oh, no, it didn't work. Still didn't work, okay. Um, yeah, so it seems like spacey is not sufficient, or at least this isn't. Um, okay, so let's go back here, go back to this. Um, okay, I got spacey to load, but the original script does not work. The words um, in some files are still wrong um, with lots of duplicated characters. Um, so, for instance,
for example, I probably should have asked it another way. Yep. Yep. Okay, so it's actually going to tell me. Yeah, use regex. So that's uh, regex is actually the way I would have done it originally. So it looks like this might be the right way to do it. it so, all right, let's see what it says. Blah, 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 blah. Do the same thing. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's give this a try. I will give that a try. But what about <clears throat> uh, words where um, there are supposed to be duplicated characters? Like book or look. <laughs> um, does your script handle that? Can we use NLTK or Spacey or something else to account for correct words? Also, while this is running, I'm going to address the elephant in the room, and that was that like a week ago I made a video saying like, meh, chat GPT isn't that great. Um, and uh, so obviously, like, I kind of have my foot in my mouth because this is amazing. Um, it also looks like it failed. Um, so, whew, all right, let me do a time check. We are at 23 minutes, so we're almost done for the day. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It'll it's gonna give me that thing. So I think what we'll do is we'll just check to see if this happens um, because it's better to have some data than none. So uh, I think what we'll do. All right. Split chunks. That one worked. Dedupe characters. So what we need to do is find the ones where this happened. Right. So. Um, generally, it looks like, yeah. Looks like it only happened in one document. Yeah, okay. So in this case, we'll say we'll pass in any file that um, starts with this. So we'll 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 uh, we'll we'll eat the eat the cost, and what I mean by that is we'll just excel accept that some data is not going to be quite as good, but that's plausible because like it's an OCR mistake. But the thing is, is we just need it to be small enough to fit in. Um. So deduplicate characters. Uh. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I don't I don't think this is going to work. So it, it's close, but it's not quite. Um, thanks. Um, can you modify the uh, the uh, the script that uses regex instead? Um, the only problem is in files with in the name. Can you just sort um, or filter, filter out any other files. Okay, so let's see what it comes up with there. Um, meanwhile, it looks like this is the largest one that is um, not good, right? So it's 13,000 characters long. So let's see how many tokens this is. So as long as it's, that's getting pretty close. Um, let's see if we can, if, if our, uh, prompt will work. So prompt, and then we'll do, 
text DaVinci 03, temperature zero, and our maximum length is going to be like 600 tokens. Otherwise, it's going to be too long. So let's see if let's see if that's enough. The output is pretty short, so but JSON is pretty token intensive, so I wouldn't be surprised if it yeah, so we ran out of space. So it looks like we need to go back and do smaller chunks. Um, but fortunately, these are earlier scripts are really easy. So for instance, we just come back here and instead of doing, um, uh, we, we just update this. So instead of four pages, we do three. And so then what we'll do is we'll come in here to um, opinions is fine, chunks, let's delete these. And then we'll rerun um, Python step 01. And so now what we should have is more chunks. So now we have 188 chunks. But you see the the um, that one, that one. So this is this is now the largest, um, and it's only 10 kilobytes or nine nine thousand um, characters long. So this should be small enough to run. Let's see how many tokens it is. Um, okay, so that's now we're down to 2,800 tokens. Let me remove the JSON part. So now we're at 2,500 tokens tops. So we can do we can do um, we can do like 1,450. Um, so that's more than twice as many tokens. So let's see, it's it's more than twice as many tokens with 25% uh, less input. So theoretically, this should be the limit. Um, cool. All right. Excellent. I think this is good. All right, so we're almost done for the day. Um, let's see what ChatGPT said. Deduplicate characters. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's do this for the dedupe. Um, so let's come back here, save it, um, and then we'll do Python step 02 dedupe. All right, we needed to add the, um, whatchamacallit, encoding. Encoding equals UTF-8, and then for the right, encoding equals UTF-8. Okay, so now if we go to the deduped, oh, actually here, we need to delete this. It did all of them, interesting. Um, Oh, it, that's, no, if, if not in file. It got the logic wrong. I'm like, no, it was only supposed to do like five of these. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so now the largest of these is eight kilobytes, which is plenty small. So we come back to chunks and we'll replace those. Replace, yes. So now our absolute largest file is 10 kilobytes, 9,300 characters. So this should all easily fit within, um, no, this should all easily fit within our prompt window here. So now we need to just go ahead and um, <clears throat> run the thing. So, all right, so let's say, excellent. We are now ready to run our uh, prompts. Are you familiar with OpenAI um, Python module? OpenAI is? Dot, dot, dot. I'm wondering if it's slowing down because um, uh, people are waking up. This is one advantage of being a super early bird is I get up earlier than like everyone else. <laughs> Granted, you know, it's always middle of the day somewhere in the world. Um, anyways, uh, da, 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 da. so this may or may not help us with, um, with this part. So now let's see, open file, save file, open AI key, text DaVinci 03, temp that, that we can do this up to 1450. That's fine. Um, encode. All right. So this, I just, uh, cannibalized another, um, thing. 
Um, we do not want to clean that up because this is going to be there. It's fine. All right. Network error. Yeah, I figured that would happen. Um, okay, so let's do a refresh. Um, I have a folder called, what is the name of my folder? God, I have like chipmunk, chipmunk memory. It's hard. Chipmunk memory um, called chunks.txt called chunks underscore text um, that is full of dot text files. Um, each file, um, please write a Python script that uses OpenAI module and new module and calls um, and uses text DaVinci 03 as the engine. Uh, I will say as the model um, and uh, uses the contents of the file in the chunks folder to uh, populate a prompt. The prompt is stored as, um, let's see, prompt underscore JSON LD uh, citation nodes dot text and has a placeholder called, um, what did I call the placeholder? Chunk. Called chunk. Um, in other words, open the text file or no, um, let's see, open the prompt file, then replace chunk with the contents of the file from chunks.txt and use this as the prompt for um, OpenAI. Set the temperature to zero and the token count to 1450. Uh, let's see if that works. Certainly, here's a script that should do what you have described. I do it differently because I use Windows. I know I'm a charlatan. Um, I think it's going to work. So this is the, the implications of this. If ChatGPT knows how to call GPT, in theory, you can create a machine that can do its own experiments with language models. I want to say that again. The implication here is now we have a system of a machine that understands the code to call itself well enough, and then obviously this thing is intelligent enough to uh, understand results, you could, in theory, have something that trains itself or makes its own data sets or whatever. Um, okay, so I like this. Whoops. Uh, copy code. Let's come over here and do this. Um, I guess I didn't say what to do with the response. Um, so we'll do, let's see. Um, dun, 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 dun. And then, yeah, we don't need any of this stuff. So that's fine. Um, and then we need to, rather than print, um, we'll need to save. Great. Um, the output from the, the uh, let's see, great. Now, response.text should be in JSON format. Can you please save the output to a new folder called, um, uh, let's see, we'll say called ag underscore JSON. Um, 
instead of just printing. Um, we should, uh, let's see, otherwise, uh, let's say, use the same file name as the .txt file, but just replace the .txt with .json. Um, let's see, before you write this script, can you uh, tell me if you understand? Um, give me some pseudocode uh, so I can check to make sure we understand each other. If this works, yeah. Well, it understands the concept of pseudocode. And then it's going to go ahead and write the script. Okay, cool. So let's see if it fixes it. Um, asking for the pseudocode may or may not be viable, um, especially because this code is so simple. It might have been easier just to ask for it to um, <clears throat> to just go ahead and do it. Um, but yeah, so we're also going to need to do um, in coding equals UTF-8. Always need to do that. Here, I'll just copy this. And then we'll need the same. Yep. Okay. Cool. So instead of printing it, we save it. So with open as blah, 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 write. So let's go ahead and add, grab this, comma. Um, I think we're ready. So then one last thing though is um, what I like to do is we'll keep, we'll keep the print um, just so that way we know what's going on. And uh, we'll add new line, new line, new line, um, and then response.txt. Um, here, actually, we'll add a little, little demark. OK, let's see if this works. CLS, uh, Python step 03, open file is not defined. Ah, right, because I used um, my own function for that. Um, do, 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 do. So let me, um, darn it. Here, let me pause this for a second. I'll just copy this function from somewhere else. You don't need to see that. Okay, so what I had to do is I had to add this function. So what I usually do is because I have a very particular way of doing things and I do it every time, I usually write my own open file and um, and write and save file function, which always does it in UTF-8, which is why I have to keep manually adding this stuff. Because you, you, you pick a default and you stick with it. So rather than ASCII or ANSI or whatever, I just say everything is UTF-8. Anyways, this should work. Um, CLS. And if this works, I'll pause it. We'll take a look at the results and call it a day because then the last step is gonna be getting it all together and visualizing it. That is gonna be fun. Come on, you can do it. Um, key error text. Response.txt. Okay, so it didn't like that. Um, all right, well, let me look at one of my other functions. Um, let's see, let's do YouTube, generate chapters. So I do response choices text, ah, response. So it didn't understand that part, but that's fine. Um, okay, so instead we'll do text equals, and we'll do dot strip. So then we'll just do text and then write text. So that should work. And away we go. So 
95% of this was done with chat GPT. If it works, there was a couple things that I had to fix manually, um, uh, but you know, it did its best. Um, and it, what I was really impressed by, one of the things I was really impressed by, oh, there we go. Um, no such file. It didn't like the backslash backslash, but we got we got some good JSON here. Um, okay, so then we got to open kg JSON replace dot text with blah. Okay. So let me tell it this. Say, okay, okay, that mostly worked, uh, but I got an error. Um, it may be important to note I'm running on Windows. Here's the error. Okay, so it's going to be fixing this. So anyways, there's just a couple things um, that it didn't like. Okay, it didn't... Wait, is it that simple that it just... it What didn't exist? Oh, it didn't create it. Okay. Because the previous script, it, it checked and then made sure it existed. Um, okay, so anyways... Um, yeah, so there's only a couple things that I had to go outside of this or, or background knowledge that I had. But for instance, when I asked it to use Spacey or NLTK, um, it tried, it didn't work, um, but then it suggested use regex instead, which is, you know, I would have done that as someone who's been cleaning up uh, bulk data for a long time. Um, okay, so then It should add the little thing, you know, check if the, yep, there we go. This function, this bit right here, I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see it. <laughs> um, if it doesn't exist, then make it. Okay, cool. So basically all we need is this. Really, you only need to check once. You don't need to check every single time, but whatever. That's fine. So then we'll come down here, check if it exists. All right. CLS, clear screen. With any luck, this worked. But yeah, so most, I mean, the vast majority of the code, it did. I just told it what to do. Now imagine you slap a voice interface, so then you don't even have to um, type it out, right? Uh, use Whisper, use OpenAI's Whisper. Hey, are you, are you listening, OpenAI? I want this. I want to be able to talk through the code. Um, okay, so now we're saving this stuff. It should be here. Hey, look at that. Okay, so this will take a little while to run but we've got good JSON. It worked. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop the video for today. I'm gonna let this finish running. Um, and then tomorrow we will merge all this together and visualize it. Thanks for watching. All right, gang, David Shapiro here. Uh, we are going to wrap up this uh, tutorial series on uh, using ChatGPT to code. Um, so first though, I need to do a, a couple of plugs. So one, um, I just recorded a really great podcast episode with Bax T Future. Um, that'll be coming out on his channel, uh, probably later this week. It was a three and a half hour long conversation. Um, and, uh, we talked about the, uh, it was, it was in one, one part was a recap of, uh, 2022 in terms of AI and technology. And then we pivoted to talk about, AI startups because that's all the rage right now. Um, yeah, so look for look for that over on his channel. Uh, number two is I need to do a plug for myself. Um, so one of my goals is to be able to do this full time, and I'm not going to do it with ad revenue. So um, please consider jumping over to my Patreon page and supporting me on Patreon. One person said that they were confused by the levels. They're they're no different. I just give you different options for level of support. Um, what I what I used to do was I used to have where if you paid enough, I would like give you like one on one time, uh, but I don't have enough time to do that. So instead, I just added levels and and what you do get if you support me on Patreon is access to my ex exclusive blog where I'll give you insider updates as to what I'm up to, some of my thoughts. Um, and also you get like priority access because sometimes I'll ask my Patreons like, hey, can you connect me to something or I want to talk to you guys. Um, so if you want to get on the inside, uh, definitely hop over to Patreon. And then lastly, if you want to sync up um, and collaborate with me or my team, um, 
please feel free to come and connect with me on LinkedIn. I check LinkedIn far more than Twitter or Discord nowadays. So with that out of the way, let's get back to what we were working on. So here's where we left off. Oh, uh, nope, you don't need to see my Spotify. Um, so we got to the point where we have all of our, all of our uh, uh, opinions broken down into JSON files. Um, so let's see, the biggest one is six kilobytes, so that's not too big. Um, and I got, this one got cut off, so it's not, this one's not even, not even, not even good, um, not even usable. That's fine. Um, this one got cut off as well. <clears throat> part, part of that was probably uh, token limits. Um, this one, this one was finished. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so a lot of this is not going to be usable. And remember, this is like rapid prototyping. So, um, I, that's why I'm not, that's why I'm just kind of like going as fast as I can. And I'm not really like trying to make a, a finished product. Um, but this is like proof of concept, but we do have some that are good or mostly good at least. So let's see what we can do now. I went to ask GPT, chat GPT, uh, how do we visualize it in a Gephi? So I've seen people talk about Gephi. So I went and downloaded it, got it installed. Um, it's definitely like a free open source one. But unfortunately, it only uses GXF, GEXF or GraphML or CSV. But we've got everything in, in JSON. So if we want to visualize any of these, we've got to do it in G, uh, GEXF. I'm not sure what the correct pronunciation is, um, but graphic exchange or graph exchange uh, file. So it's basically a type of XML. So let's see. Um, let's talk to this guy and say, okay, um, I've got a folder called, let's see, what did I call this folder? KG underscore JSON. That is full of that JSON uh, LD formatted um, KG files. Um, I need to convert them to GEXF for Gephi. Um, but here's the problem. Some of the JSON files are malformed not completed. So we need to first check if they render properly. If not, we can ignore them and skip them. Um, but the second problem is they don't all follow the same, um, the same, uh, let's see, format. So let me show you what I mean. So for instance, um, in this one, there's no graph element, but in others there are, right? So there's, there's no graph element in this one, but then we grab another one. Um, this one has similar. Oh, and so by the way, this is why I say we need to keep fine tuning is because when you get to really specific cases like this, um, you want a very consistent format. Um, and, but just telling, just telling it instruct. Oh, so here's, here's an example where there's context and like, yeah, they, there's different like methods anyways. So, um, some have, let's see, for instance, some have, uh, graph properties and others don't. Um, we need to write a Python script that will open them, validate them, um, and homogenize them. We need uh, the, the ultimate goal is to, um, output a single GEXF file. Is this even possible? Do we need to break this down into multiple steps? All right, let's see what it says.
Okay, so it's going to walk through the reasoning that it uses. Okay, there's a valid Py, Py LD, uh, Python is valid JSON LD. Network X library to create graph object from the JSON L data. Cool. Okay, so this just walked through the entire process. Um, <laughs> someone, someone on the internet, uh, I think it was on LinkedIn, said, uh, "Chat GPT is going to make everyone dumber and lazier. You should learn to do it yourself." And I definitely agree. So let's talk about this because this this video is not going to take too long. Um, but let's talk about the implications of this for a second. I'm I'm in this headspace because I just had that interview with Bax. So. This just taught me a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know, right? Um, I didn't know about the Pi LD thing. I didn't know about Network X. So I just had a problem and I said, help me solve this problem. Now, does that make me dumber, right? Because I didn't go read the hard way, you know, like I got, you know, I've, I downloaded uh, the Gephi, you know, um, documentation, but this is still like, I have to skim and, and, and you know, it's 32 pages. That's a lot of reading. What is ultimately valuable? Time. Time is the most valuable uh, commodity in all of existence. It's more precious than gold. So the fact that this is able to help me do more in less time, and I will learn some of the underlying stuff in the wash, right? So here's the thing is like, we build machines to abstract away uh, 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 some of our labor, right? That's what computers do. That's why they have the name computer. They compute math. That was how they started. Was um, what some of the first use cases of mechanical computers was to calculate uh, firing solutions for for big navy guns um, during World War II. And the women who did that, who did all the math, they were called computers. It was the computer pool, but it was human computers. <laughs> Anyways, so we always build machines to offload our mental labor. So this is just the next the next uh, iteration of that. Um, I'm, now, I'm not saying like this is not the same as a, as a TI-83 calculator. This is miles beyond that. But at the same time, this will ultimately allow me to do more, experiment faster, and, and generally accelerate things. And nobody bemoans databases, right? Like to me, if someone's complaining like, oh, this just makes you lazy, like that's about the same as saying like, oh, well, you should just print everything out and manually collate your database. <laughs> like, no, we're not going to do that. Use SQL. Um, and so to me, it's like, and, and I'm saying this as someone who is typically like a Luddite, like I am the last person to adopt new technologies usually, especially in my day job, in my professional life, because you know what? New stuff is fragile and it breaks and it's expensive and it's difficult to integrate, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. But this is different. ChatGPT is different because this is helping me do better. Here, I'm going to give you a nice little kudos feedback. This is great. I don't know why they ha why you have to like. All you need is a true false, right? Actually, no. I bet they're they're asking you why because that is a even better label, and they can improve it further. Um, anyways, so all right, get off my soapbox. That's not why y'all are here. Let's move on. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so this is fine. Use it to, to parse and load it into Python dictionary. That's fine. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Great idea. Let's start with the first script. Um, this first one will use JSON module to try to load the JSON. Um, we should use a try accept clause um, in case it blows up. Um, if the JSON doesn't even load, we can move on. Um, okay, cool. Next, um, let's see, once the JSON object is loaded into memory, then please, please use um, 
the PyLD uh, library function is valid JSON uh, LD um, to check if it is legit. Assuming it passes that, um, let's see. Yep. Uh, assuming it passes that, uh, well, actually here, um, please write this script. Um, yeah. And then while it's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and see if I need to install anything. So pip install pyld. And then let's see, what else did I need? We need, um, I think that's as far as we need right now. So let's do uh, pip install network x. All right. This looks good. We're going to need to add the uh, encoding UTF-8. Okay, so it'll tell us if it is valid and if not. Excellent. So let's go ahead and give this a try. Um, so then we'll save this here as step 03, validate json.py. Excuse me. All right, and then let's come over here and zoom in a little bit. And we'll do uh, cd to SCOTUS, and then we'll do Python. Wow, sorry, my typing is horrible this morning. <laughs> I think I moved my keyboard around, and it's like just slightly to the left, and so like my fingers are wrong. Muscle memory is everything, man. All right, Python. Uh, what was it? Step. I have two step threes. That's that's incorrect. That's gonna mess with my my OCD. Sorry, buddy. Step 04. No, don't keep it in. That's the wrong pile. All right. Come back here. Step 04. My counting is off. My typing is off. It's fine. I'm doing great. Doing great, sweetie. All right. No, my th has no is valid JSON LD. So it just made that up. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, we got an error. Um, are you sure this is a real function? This might be harder than I thought. <laughs> Chat GPT <laughs> loading wheel. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. I can't let you ask that question, Dave. <laughs> It's going to get mad at me. All right, let's see if it works. We might not even need to um, validate it. Uh, because if it ha if it does have a function that allows us to convert, if JSON LD error, okay. All right, let's try this. Oh, and also I just remembered that we need to replace. We need to do. Um, Encoding equals UTF-8. Anytime we have an open um, statement, we need to do that because I encode everything in UTF-8. All right, let's try this again. Uh, has no module validate. That's fine. 
Um, so in this case, like, it would be great if it had that function, but it doesn't. Okay, so do 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 do. Um, let's ignore. <clears throat> it didn't work either. Either let's ignore the validate step. After all, uh, Python pep eight uh, says it's, or I, I don't know if it's pep eight. Um, uh, Python philosophy says. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. So instead of validating, let's just try to convert it directly to GIFX. Um, is that the file type? GIFX, yeah. Um, so let's just try and convert it directly to GIFX. Um, again, using a try accept uh, clause. Um, uh, I'd like you to update. <clears throat> yeah, do, 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 do. I'd uh, like you to update the try accept clauses to catch the errors and print them so I can see what happened. So in total, this script should be simpler. Um, try to load the JSON and then try to convert to GEF X. In both steps, uh, output any errors. Um, if it is successful, um, actually, yeah. Uh, just print the results as we go for this script. Okay, so let's see what it does. So basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm having it write a script to do an experiment just to see if it'll get all the way through. Because since the cognitive labor is less on me, I'm like, just write this script, let's see what happens, right? Um, <laughs> as I was talking to some people about this kind of technology, I realized we are infinitely closer to having Star Trek level computers than anyone realizes or maybe maybe we do realize that's why the why, that's why it's uh, it's exciting because with just a little bit more logic behind this i could say computer um download the uh, all the supreme court opinions uh, about um about uh antitrust laws you know and chat gpt says okay cool uh and it can and if you give it an internet connection it can go find it and go find that data download it you say okay cool uh what's the what does the data look like you know, computer says it's in PDF format. Cool, scrape it. And it goes from there. And then it says, okay, now what do you want me to do, right? And you just have a conversation with the machine. This is capable of that, just with a little bit more behind the scenes. Okay, let's see. Excellent. I love it. So by it, by rapidly iterating, and I have done no coding except for adding the uh, the encoding thing. Actually, here, um, great. I just need you to make one last change, um, and that is to always include um, encoding equals UTF. Actually, I think it's lowercase UTF eight um, while opening, reading, and writing files. Um, everything is uh, in UTF-8. Um, so let's just set that as standard for all our scripts. Hello, computer. Would that be worth something to you? Okay. So if, so I was, when I was talking with Bax, one of the things he said is he suspects that ChatGPT has a scratch pad. So what does that mean? In technical terms, it doesn't mean that it's writing on a notepad, although that would be cool. But what it what it what it could mean is that if, if it does have a sidebar document where it can remember critical pieces of information, regardless of how long the conversation gets. So um, if it does have that, then it's like, hey, let me just keep track of, you know, 
the top 10 most important facts about this conversation. Um, but yeah, let's see if it works. All right, cool. So let's come back here and do this. Validate JSON. So look at this, 28 lines, not bad. What am I doing? Run the script. Just run the script. Error while converting. So it looked like all of them failed, but it did something. <laughs> um, yeah, this is not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, it, what might behoove us, so if I, if, if I were doing this project, let's say, for instance, I, I think I got as far as I can get, but let me show you what I would do. Um, so let's, let's rewind a little bit. Cause I think, I think that this is just going to blow up. Um, yeah, I don't think it, it didn't succeed on a single one of them. Um, so clearly there's some fragility here. Um, we got to JSON files, but they're all inconsistent and they're all different sizes and so on. So what we would need to do is when we're extracting the, 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 the knowledge graph, what we would need to do is probably come here and specify a format. Now, the problem here is if we use FewShot, so this is why I say we need fine tuning. Um, if we use FewShot, we're gonna run out of tokens. And even if they double the token, the token count, we're still gonna like, the more tokens we can fit in at once, the better. Um, it, but now, so there's, pro there's probably some intermediary steps, right? Because rather than just going straight from documents to knowledge graphs, which it worked, right? Worked rather well, but the process is fragile. We might need to have other intermediary steps such as distilling the information down. Um, so let me, let me show you what I mean by that. Um, here, let me pause it for just a second uh, as I change workspaces. Okay, we're right back. All right, so I took one of these chunks. It's 7,600 characters long. Um, so rather than go straight to knowledge graph, let's see, let's do some prompt engineering and see, because like we basically have to start over. Um, all right, so uh, there's, there's a lot of superfluous information. So um, let's see, how did I word this prompt? This is a super valuable prompt, by the way. And I don't mind sharing it because I've talked to other people and they've figured it out. So this is, this is, this is the most valuable, one of the most valuable prompts I have ever figured out. So write notes about the following uh, document. Um, uh, let's see, use bullet points um, in complete sentences. Um, I think that's all you need. And then you say notes. So this compression method um, usually is like the best way to compress anything. Um, yeah. Now, one thing I don't like is that it actually used the actual bullet point character rather than a dash. Um, use bullet points in complete sentences. Use um, hyphen uh, for the uh, point. So this is like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so just, it's a list of assertions. Cedric Kushner promotions does this. Don King is the president of that. Uh, petition of Don King allegedly that he had done this as, as part through a RICO pattern. Petitioner sued Don King. Um, but this is not good, right? This is the, the, so the, the reason I'm okay with sharing this is because while this is a really powerful prompt, it's not quite universal. And the reason that it's not universal is because you still lose a little bit too much context. Um, and so you always have to modify this prompt. Um, so the Second Circuit expressed the view that 1862 is blah, blah, blah. Um, great. So we're getting, we're getting some of this. But for instance, we lost like the title, right? Like what, what is going on? Um, so it, we, we lost this. So um, we need to say like, what is the document about? We need to include all details, um, such as, uh, yeah, so I'll just tell you, include all details, such as uh, titles, citations, uh, dates, and so on. Um, so that should work. So from the last time, um, 
we stopped here, right? And then I've doubled the length of the instruction. So I also want to point out this instruction would not work in text DaVinci 02. These instructions only work now with um, text DaVinci 03. All right, so let's see what happens. There we go. See how the sentences are, are much longer? So Cedric Kushner Productions uh, v. King is a case from October term 2000, which the Supreme Court of the United States reversed and remanded the decision of the United States Courts of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Bam. Perfect. Perfect. So this is the kind of information, it's almost even written like a lawyer would speak, right? This tells you real fast in very plain language what happened. So this is information that, that is one, useful, and two, could be embedded in a, um, in a knowledge graph or could be used to extract the information. Now, let me show you something. Um, so actually, this is actually a really good prompt. I'm gonna save this. <laughs> um, whenever you come up with a really good prompt, save it. Um, do, 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 prompt notes detailed. Um, yeah, so we took, we took, let, let me, let's do some token counts. So we took, uh, do, 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 do. All right, so without it, it is 1,966 tokens. And then we com we compress that down to 221 tokens. So we got a, um, a compression ratio of almost 10 to one, and we kept the most salient details and those salient details were, were kept with enough context that like it's still useful. Like you read this and it's like, oh, this is a great executive summary. Um, so there you go. Uh, so that, this is probably the direction that I would go. Like rewind, let's take this and instead of going to JSON, let's try and do this with, uh, with um, uh, GEXF. Uh, I think you guys get the point. Um, and also we're already like at 30 minutes. <clears throat> so we'll say that we, uh, we'll call this a partial success. We got really far. Um, we got uh, exceptional use of, of chat GPT. We found a huge fragility. Um, it was confabulating uh, modules and functions that didn't exist. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. So let me tell you why. Is because it used its imagination, and I'm anthropomorphizing it on purpose, it used its imagination to imagine this is what we would need. And then it just kind of went and looked for it. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't take a whole lot of cognitive architecture to find those mistakes and then say, actually, this is something that would be great if it existed. Why don't I go write it? Right. And so then it, you know, it keeps track of its dependencies. It could write its own user stories. Right. Say here. Actually, let me just show you. Um, OK. Um, uh, think about everything that didn't work, write some user stories um, to submit to various uh, projects like PyLD um, and NetworkX. That would have made this project easier. I think this is going to work. Because here's the thing, um, by breaking it down into steps, there we go. Yes, yes, yes. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Okay. So even if something doesn't work, it doesn't have to necessarily fix it um, live in vivo, right? This is the process that we follow as humans. There's no need to actually just like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, to, to, to fix it live. It's I ran into a problem, let's fire this off and then have another system integrate these. Um, look at this, oh man, oh man. As a developer, I wanna be able to validate JSON-LD data without having to manually catch errors so that I can quickly identify and fix issues with my data. Yes, as a developer, I wanna be able to easily convert JSON-LD data to a standardized format so that I can process and visualize the data consistently regardless of its original format. 
Yes, perfect developer story or user story. As a developer, I want to have simple and intuitive way to create and save knowledge graphs in a variety of formats such as Gexf so that I can use the tool that is most suitable for my needs. Excellent. Universal converter. As a developer, I want to have access to a wide range of layout algorithms and visualization options so that I can create clear and informative visuals of my knowledge graphs. That's already solved, but great. As a developer, I want to be able to easily filter and analyze my knowledge graphs so that I can gain insights into the relationships between different nodes and edges. Fantastic. These first four or three. Mm, mm, perfect. Okay. I'm going to stop here because I'm about to go down a really deep rabbit hole, but I think I know what my next videos are going to be, and that is using ChatGPT for every aspect of the development life cycle. We're going to explore Agile, CI, CD, Web Native, all that, because this is incredible. All right. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, David Shapiro here for a video. So today we are going to do AutoMuse Blogger. So rather than generating long format fiction, we're gonna generate blog posts. Now, before we get started, before we get started, um, I have to warn you that one, this use case, if you were to try and just do this and put it directly online, that is against OpenAI's policies. So don't do this, this is for research purposes only. Now, that being said, you are allowed, as far as I know, you are allowed to use AI to generate content as long as you then um, put human eyes on it to like edit it, clean it up, make sure that it's safe. Um, and then also, uh, I think part of the EULA requires that you say this was written by AI, I think. Um, obviously, check with, uh, check with OpenAI before going live on any apps that do this kind of thing. But that being said, um, lots and lots of folks have wanted blogs and I've just had this churning in the back of my head so we will uh, we will take a stab at this now also um, I posted a, a poll on YouTube and the results were overwhelming y'all want to have um, fewer videos but higher quality videos it was overwhelming so um, stay tuned this is gonna be my first one where I'll do some editing after the fact and, uh, and we'll go from there because I've also got the chapters, right? I figured out how to automatically do chapters with, uh, with GPT-3. All right, so all that out of the way, let's get started. First, um, when, I, when I'm starting a project like this, um, what I've started doing is kind of brainstorming, getting my thoughts out because then I have a template to follow. Um, oftentimes you see me rely on intuition and intuition is good and it works much of the time but not always and plus it's also not something that i can just tell you like use your intuition so let's actually do a process so what we're going to do is just brainstorm okay what it, what do we think this is actually going to do so first we're going to say take a prompt of some sort natural natural language instructions like i want a blog about x um, brainstorm the structure of the request so um if you just ask instruct series to write, it'll start writing it. I mean, GPT-3, generative pre-trained model, it's generative, it will write. But one thing that it doesn't do is it doesn't necessarily think about structure. Um, and so given whatever the, um, the input is, let's think about um, the best way to do it. Uh, so like, um, uh, let's see, like maybe list um, a bunch of sections. And then what we can do is we can probably iterate on that list to improve it. Um, like, is this a good list? Oops. Um, okay, so then once we have a list of sections, um, then we can say, okay, uh, okay, what, after we have the sections, then do we just start writing or do we do some research? Probably we'll do some research. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, brainstorm um, some interesting uh, like some facts or points to include for each section yeah and then let's see and also we're gonna keep we're gonna keep this in mind the whole time right so let's just bold that um, okay so then we got some list and points and then we actually want to write the thing um, okay, so then we'll write the actual 
sections, um, and then six uh, iterate improve the sections, and then done and done. Okay, so that's where we'll start. Um, I'm not going to dive into automatically pulling from external sources for this one. For this, we're going to start with something simple because GPT-3 already knows a lot. Um, but perhaps in a future version or a different kind of thing, I might explore like an automatic knowledge graph builder um, because that's something I've wanted to do anyways. Um, but for, for, the, for the sake of this one, we're just going to assume that GPT-3 already has the information built uh, embedded in it somewhere because it's already read a lot of news and read it and Wikipedia and stuff. So the topic that I was going to do um, was going to be um, uh, Shinto in Japan because I'm reading a book about Japanese history and culture. So it's something that I happen to know a little bit about and of course like GPT-3 has already read all of Wikipedia on all of these things. So I'm going to assume that it has enough knowledge to do this. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the playground and we will say um, so basically we're going to start with some prompt engineering I'll say um, uh, let's see um, write a blog outline write a killer blog outline for the following request from a customer. Okay. Request. Um, I want a cool blog post about the history of Shin uh, Shinto and Hori Gates in Japan. Like, I'm basically adopting the persona of like a surfer bro. Um, like, uh, how did they come up with that idea? What does it mean? Um, and let's see, and what are the coolest ones to see? I'm going to Japan uh, next summer because I'm a weeb. Sorry. Um, I have a bunch of friends who are, uh, what is it? Cenophile would be China. What do you call it if someone is like, an actual term if someone is obsessed with Japan. They're into anime and stuff. I used to be in high school. My my high school girlfriend got me into anime, and I was into it for like 10 years, and then I kind of like got over it. I'm still a nerd. I'm not trying to defend that. Okay. Write a killer blog about, uh, outline for the following uh, request from a customer. All right, so the request is this. Okay, so now um, brainstorm a list of sections for this blog post. Um, each section, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, the outline should meet the customer's requests, and each section should, uh, be, uh, let's say, highly descriptive, provide a paragraph, um, explaining what should go should go into each section. Okay, so then we'll do sections, and we'll start with one. So one thing that I do, you'll notice uh, often that I'll do a uh, caps lock for for these things. What that does, it, it's very similar to what it does for humans. So for humans, it draws your eye to it, where you're like, okay, cool, this is like a thing that I need to pay attention to. Um, but also, it's a different set of tokens. It's new. It's represented differently inside of GPT-3 which um, allows it to kind of notice, oh, this isn't just the word request, this is capital R request. Okay, so let's just let this run. Let's turn the token count up to a thousand. And then it starts writing it. Okay, I don't want you to actually start writing it. Um, so this isn't so good. I want to actually give me like yeah, not, not just a table of contents, but like describe each section. So this is this is one thing that's really infuriating about um, about the Instruct series is that if you can tell if it was trained to do something like what you're asking it to do, because it'll do it really well. But if it wasn't, it will just give you a table of contents and then start writing a thing. Um, 
Yeah. Actually, hmm. I wonder if I confused it. Let's see. All right. Because, like, what is Shinto? There we go. How to incorporate tour gates into your Japan trip. That's not so bad. Okay, so by I confused it when I said like add a paragraph because then it's like okay let's let's write out all these things and then yeah all right let's run this a couple times just to make sure that it's going to give me consistent behavior. The significance of tour gates, the different types of tour gates, the most famous tour gates in Japan. Okay, I think we're off to a good start. So let's copy this as our first prompt. Um, okay, so we'll do. request and then we'll do that so this we've got prompt um, so this is going to be uh, sections so let's see brainstorm the structure um, take a list a bunch of sections iterate on that list to improve it is this a good list was I a good list you were the best list all right so what I mean by this is um, lots of folks have started asking about like doing um, like having GPT-3 check itself to improve uh, its own performance. And I find that it can work really well, not always. Um, so let's just give, let's take a stab at this. Um, let's copy this whole prompt out just for posterity's sake. Okay, um, I brainstormed the following list of blog sec uh, of sections of a blog um, based on the customer's request. Um, I need to uh, s uh, um, brainstorm to see if there's any there are any improvements I can make to this. Uh, 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 I guess outline. Yeah, that's the word. I know words. Okay, so then we'll do, we'll copy the customer request and then we'll do outline and let's come back over here and copy that. All right, and so then we'll do uh, brainstorm, let's see, no. Brainstorm some possible improvements. All right, let's see what it does. Yeah, it doesn't get it. Well, maybe. It added a list. It added an, an item, how to visit Tory Gates. Oh, okay. Let's run that again, see if it gives us what is Shinto, okay. Tips for seeing Tory Gates. So it did add a section. All right. Hmm. I wonder what happens if we do this again, again. Okay. What happens if we just regurgitate this? Shinto festivals associated with Torah gates. Look at that. Okay. So if we run this, so this. I'm at the point in my career with GPT-3 where, like, if my intuition generates a prompt that behaves correctly the first time, I don't trust it. <laughs> because I'm like, wait a second. Hmm. Is this an accident? So then we'll say... Outline? Um, but basically, prompt, um... Improve outline and we'll change the sections to outline because for whatever reason, my brain did not helpfully supply the word outline because um, that's where you start when you're writing anything. Start an outline. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so then we'll take, I keep leaning over because my camera, my microphone's a little bit in the way. So if the audio is a little bit worse, I apologize, but I want to not be leaning over the whole video. Okay, let's just, Keep recycling this to see um, see if it keeps improving. Frequently asked questions. 
I wonder if it's just going to keep adding sections because this is actually doing a good job of like, what can we do to add to this? So probably if, if it keeps going indefinitely, okay, so it, now what we have done is, is it has converged. So what we can do is we'll just keep rerunning this um, until, until we get convergence, which means that the input is the same as the output. Um, okay, so yeah, so that's good. And what am I doing? All right, so improve outline. Uh, let's see, keep it an editor. No, because I named it wrong. So we've got the outline and then we've got improve outline. And that's good. Okay. Yes. I wonder, will it break if I... If I give it a number one, that might prompt it to ensure that it will... Oh, additional resources. Okay. So one thing that you can do is you can kind of give it a clue as to what you want, want it to look like. And so that's what you do here where I have this. This is just, it's a clue. It says, give me a numbered list, right? I don't have to tell it to give me a numbered list. I just give it a little tiny breadcrumb to say, give me a numbered list. Um, so I might do the same here, just so that way, because sometimes you might end up with something where it's like, hey, I'm gonna come up with a completely new idea. Um, but if you tell it what you want implicitly or explicitly, so this is an implicit request of the machine. So this might this might break it. We'll have to after we run it, we might um, we might have to come back to this. Um, okay, let's go here. Okay, request. All right, and then I think it's time to start coding actually. Um, cause what I like to do is before I get too far, um, actually no, well, hmm, let me take a look at, uh, at the readme. How far do we want to go? Okay. So we got the iteration. So we're already halfway done. Brainstorm some facts or points to include for each section. Okay. So let's try this then. Let's try our hand at yada, yada, yada. I wish I hadn't closed those other ones. Okay, so given... Uh, let's see, I have the following uh, blog request to write. Um, I am focusing on uh, writing one section at a time. Um, or, uh, let's see, I need to brainstorm, uh, no, I need to jot down some notes about each section before I proceed. No, not each section, this section. Um, this section before I proceed, okay. Um, section, so then we'll just say, what is Shinto? And then we'll say, um, let's see. Here are my research notes on this section. I need to write uh, everything I know about this. And let's see what it does. Mm, okay. Here are my, let's see, let's, let's see what happens if we say detailed research notes. There we go. Much better. The, yep. Issei Grand Shrine. God of the Sun Goddess Amaterasu. Okay. This is all in line with what I'm reading in my book. So it looks like it has, um, this is actually one that I'm not sure. I haven't read about that in the book. But anyways, so it does look like it's being accurate. Um, although I wish this was a little bit more, I do, I, I like the, the that it, it seemed like it produced a little bit more when it was a list. So what, let's see if we give it a clue. Um, yeah. Shinto is the largest with over 100 million follower, followers. 
located in the city of Ize. Um, first, and then if we do this again, um, see, but this isn't everything that you know, right? Like I said, I asked for detailed research notes. I need to write everything I know, and it gives me six bullet points. Really? Really? Um, okay, that's fine. But one thing that's interesting is it seems like Shinto means the way of the gods. It almost seems like I can just run it a few times and it will give me different outputs each time. So maybe for this section, we just run it a couple times. Actually, this seems like it's working okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so probably what we'll do is just break the sections down and then we will um, we'll run this where we're asking for notes on each section. We'll run it a couple times um, to kind of get a little bit more out of it, out of the machine. Um, that seems like it, it's working okay-ish. Um, okay, so then we'll do request, and then we'll do um, section, and then we'll just leave this open-ended so it might produce a paragraph, it might produce a, a list. Okay, so we'll do prompt research. Um, actually here we'll do section research and so what this is doing just to take a step back and tell you like okay what is what is this actually doing so one misconception that people have is whether or not GPT-3 is pulling from a database or searching the internet or what how is it how is it doing all this and so all this information is embedded in the neural network and so what we're doing is we're writing a prompt to pull that information out of the neural network. Um, and so the, this works in a similar fashion to how human brains work in that our, all of our knowledge and memories is implicit in the array of connections in our brain. And so with the right input or the right, and sometimes the input can come from inside of our own brains. Like if you're sitting there thinking like, I need to think about everything I know about Japan. You can kind of, you know, trace the dots. You can connect the dots and get, you know, kind of pull out memories from your own brain. Um, and we're doing the same thing here. We're, we're breaking apart that, that cognitive process of, okay, let me think through about everything that I know about this. Um, and so that's what we're doing deliberately. Um, okay, so we got this section. Um, brainstorm some facts or things to include. Uh, let's see, we'll just repeat, repeat this like two or three X times. Um, and so then what, then what we'll do is this is actually working better than I thought. Okay. So we'll say, we'll copy out some of this information and run it a couple times. Estimated 4 million followers. See, that's something where it's like a hundred million and now there's 4 million, like, okay. So we don't know if it's accurate, but this could also be a benefit of running, running it a few times. Oops, what just happened? How did I do that? Current editor, there we go. Okay, so that's three iterations. Let's go for four. Because it seems like if you get four first codified in the 8th century CE. According to the book I'm reading, that is not true. Um, Japan didn't have written language until after the 4th century AD CE. So it couldn't have been codified. And it's saying 4 million again. So <laughs> we will do fact checking in another video. Okay. Um, all right. 
I have compiled research notes. Um, I have compiled the following research notes. I need to rewrite these notes into um, into a uh, long professional blog post. It must be um, engaging and interesting. And so then we'll do research and then we'll do um, engaging blog post. And so basically all I'm going to do is take each of those sections, do some research, some internal brainstorming research, um, and then we'll will generate a post on each of those sections. There you go. Now one thing is that will be that it, that it will tend to do is it'll have these like little like sign offs, right? And it's like, okay, I don't want I don't want that. But, but we might have to deal with that. Okay. Anyways, we'll pro we can probably fix that at the end, actually. So let's go ahead and just copy this out. Okay. Um, so we'll do research and then engaging blog post. So this will be prompt. Um, this will be uh, section pros. So we're actually producing a final product at this point. Um, yeah, I think I think we're almost done because then we got the actual sections iterate and improve. Ah, okay. So yeah, I like that. Um, so if we if we take this. We might need a second. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, this will actually work out well. Um, I think I've got it all saved here. Yeah, okay. So then we'll just copy this here. Um, I wonder what will happen if I just say, like, let's see, I've compiled, I need to rewrite the notes into a long professional blog post. It must be engaging. I have the first draft of the post. Now I need to improve on it. Okay, so then we'll say um, first draft. Oh, hang on, my dog's barking. I gotta go see what he's barking at. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, yes, so first draft and then we'll just add some new lines and do second draft. And you see, like this, this is getting long, but one, we've broken it down into sections. Um, so we don't have to write the whole blog post at once. And you see it's only a thousand tokens. Um, so we're only at a quarter of our, of our maximum. Um, okay. Look at this. Shinto beliefs and practices were first brought to Japan by Chinese immigrants? I don't know that that's accurate. But we see that this has, this has gotten a little bit better. Um, it's definitely integrating a little bit more of the information. Whether or not this information is factually accurate is different. So in a future version, I'll probably, what I'll do is show you how to integrate from a corpus of facts of, of, of like other information rather than just relying on confabulation and neural recall. So this, when you ask, when you ask GPT-3 to just barf out a bunch of facts, that's called neural recall and it can be pretty accurate, um, but it can also be crazy wrong. Um, okay. So let's see what happens if we just do this iteration a couple more times. So it's just, Whoops. Oh, it's just jumping down. Okay. Is 
that's actually making it shorter. Oh no. It clarified it a little bit. Okay. Okay, so this, this seems like it works okay. So let's add this as a, um, so we'll do section, second draft, and then we'll do this as research. Add a double new line there just to make it nice and consistent. And then we'll prompt, um, pr uh, excuse me, prose, um, actually do prompt improve prose. And then we'll just stitch it all together and that's all programmatic. Um, okay, fault temperature to seven, the tokens to 1000, because that's what we want. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, well, first we need the uh, the topic. Okay, so topic equals open file, and we'll do topic dot text. So I will save that here. So we'll save topic dot text. Is. All right, so we get the topic, and then the first thing we do is outline it, and then we improve the outline. Okay. I've got too many tabs open. <laughs> Let me close some of these. Ah, no. Don't close that one. Cancel, cancel. <laughs> Abort. Okay. And then we'll say, um, let's see, outline equals um, yeah. Here, I'll just do this the messy way. Um, I can work on cleaning it up and making it more efficient later. I have coffee and I'm not drinking it. What the heck is wrong with me? Topic. Um, okay, so now we're gonna do build the outline. Prompt equals open file. So this was, see this is why I need to keep at least the prompts open. All right, so prompt outline and then it'll be prompt um, improve outline and then section research, which we'll just run a few times Prompt, um, improve prose. Um, okay, and then prose. Okay, cool. So the outline we only run once. So I'll do prompt outline dot text, and then we'll do dot replace um, topic. Or no, I guess it was request. Yeah. So just to keep things consistent, we'll do request. Because the worst thing you can do for yourself is use use multiple names for the same variable. It's very confusing. I do not recommend that. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm having to lean away from from my microphone again, and it's making it's throwing off my whole keyboard situation. As someone who writes, it's like there's this flow connection, um, and you can't hear it because I've got the uh, the like noise cancellation, but I use a mechanical keyboard. So you're welcome for that, for using the, the thing. I use NVIDIA Broadcast, which is really helpful. Um, okay, so we're replacing it request with the request. That should be good. Um, and then we'll do um, outline equals, and we'll do one um, plus, and we're gonna remove that. And then we'll do plus. Um, GPT-3 completion prompt okay and then for debug we'll just print the outline and we'll run this to make sure that it works um, Python generate whoops 
CD, AutoMuse, Blogger, Python Generate. Request.txt. Right, because I changed the file name in here, but it didn't read my mind and change the file name out here. Okay, <clears throat> try that again. Okay, cool. So that worked. That looks good. Um, all right, so then what did I do? I did, um, see this is this is why you write down what your plan is. <laughs> Open the readme back up. Um, okay, so we got that. Iterate on the list. That's right, we did this about four times. Um, okay, so then we'll say um, for i in list range zero four, we are going to do outline equals um, improve outline. And then we'll pass it the request and the outline. And so basically this is this is the easiest way to do a recursive thing. So we'll do def improve outline and we're going to have the request and the outline passed in. And so then we're just going to use this prompt. Um, so we say prompt equals uh, to, 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 to open file prompt improve outline dot text and so what you're seeing here this is this is the um, the most basic form of recursive programming with GPT-3 where you feed the same the output into the same function several times um, so dot replace request with request and then dot replace um, outline with outline. Make sure that I use the right terminology. Yes, outline is there. Brainstorm some possible improvements. Okay, and then we'll copy the same outline one dot. And so the reason that you have to include this is because the prompt already has that. See, if you don't have that, then the first one will not have its numbered list. And that just, it just, it's bad form and it doesn't look good. Um, and then we'll do return outline. Okay, so then we will, um, here, we'll... Actually, for debug purposes, I'll just leave all this. So do new line, new line, outline, and then we'll do... Improved outline. Okay. Now let's test this real quick. What is Shinto? Tips for visiting. Facts. Okay, so it is it is reliably recreating what we wanted. And then it converged. Uh, and then it blew it up. Curse you. Okay. Yeah, it didn't, it, it just, it randomly nuked it. Okay, let's have fewer iterations. Because if you do, if you, <laughs> if you, t if you try your luck, it will eventually break. Um, the coolest Tory gates in Japan, different types of Tory gates. Okay, so doing one initial iteration and then three iterations seems to be good. All right, so we'll leave it at that. Um, cool. So actually, it can be kind of fun to leave the uh, the debug output. So I'll probably just leave that there so that when you're running it, you can see what it's doing. Okay, now we consult the scriptures. We got the good list. Brainstorm some facts or uh, points for each one. Yes. Okay, so then section research. Yes, okay. So sections equal outline dot split lines. So now the sections list, we can iterate on this um, a few times. But we're actually zeroing in on the final product. So let me think of how to do this. Because do we want to write it one section at a time? I think we do. Yeah, because the, the way that it breaks down now is we do the research on the section. We do the pros on the section, and then we stitch it all together. We Im improve the pros, and then we have the final product. Okay, so we'll do final blog equals. 
So we'll do that. Okay, so four section in sections. So we're gonna just we're gonna take each section and just write the whole thing. We might have a final step where we kind of like clean up the whole blog. Um, actually, that's not a bad idea. Let me go ahead and add that note so I don't forget. Um, iterate through the sections and done. Lies. Um, uh, let's see. Clean up the final product. Yes. Okay, so for section in sections, uh, first is hashtag research. <laughs> Sorry, I need to drink this coffee. Hashtag research. Okay. Um, yes. So we'll say research equals uh, that. And then uh, let's see, how many times did we do this? I think we did it like three or four times. So we'll do we'll do the same thing that we did here. So for I in list range, we'll say um, uh, 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 result equals um, research topic. Actually, no, here, we'll call it neural recall because that's a more accurate thing as to what we're doing. So the neural recall is, yeah, so we need to pass the request in the section. Requests, section, and there will be some redundancy, but that's fine. That's why we added the seventh step to clean up the final product to just, let's rewrite the whole thing to be one nice, consistent blog post. Um, okay. So result equals neural recall, def neural recall. This is like, this is the nerdier version of total recall. Uh, request, extra points if, uh, well, I guess they made a remake of that. Um, but the original total recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger came out when I was uh, much younger. I was alive when it came out. Some of my viewers are older than me. Many of them are younger, so if you raise your hand, uh, give me a thumbs up or, or a comment in the section in the in the comments below if you remember the original Total Recall. Okay, Neural Recall. What is it that we're doing? This is basically just another prompt. Prompt equals open file uh, prompt section research dot text, and then we do dot replace. Uh, yes. Uh, what were the sections that I had in here? Request and section, right. These two. Ah! See, that is where you do yourself a favor if you have variables that are very simple and straightforward and make sense. Uh, and then place uh, section with section. Okay. And then we do, uh, let's see, um, notes equal GPT-3 completion prompt, um, and then return notes. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, oh, you can just do return this. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but I got out of the habit of doing that because every now and then you'll want to do some little like post-processing, like notes equals notes dot replace, you know, that with that you know, depending on uh, the kind of format you're looking for. Um, so I just got out of the habit of, re of returning the function result directly um, and, and capturing the results in a variable and then passing the variable back. It's either or, you can do whatever you want. Um, it saves you a line of code, um, but you know, okay, a line of code, who cares? Um, to me, it's not really worth saving. Okay, so then Research equals research plus, um, let's see, that's going to have no new line, so we'll do plus new line, dollar s, and then we'll do dollar result. Um, yes, okay, so the research will be done, so research equals research dot strip, which that will remove any superfluous um, white space from the ends, so now we've got the research. Yes, so we'll, we'll run the research a couple times. We've done the research, um, and then we take the research and write the blog post. Okay, um, so do first draft. Draft, not draft five. 
Um, okay. This should be as straightforward as prompt equals uh, prompt section, no. What am I doing? Good grief. Open file. Prompt section prose.txt and do replace research with research. So this is, there's a couple things happening here. So there's prompt chaining, which is where you've got prompt, 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 prompt. So that's prompt chaining, but then we're also doing iterative loops. So we're doing recursive loops inside of the prompt chain. Um, so this is this is pretty advanced, but this is this is just the same process that a human goes through when writing when writing a, a thing. You you brainstorm the structure, you gather all the facts, then you write the prose, and then you iterate on the prose and make it better. Um, now I need to improve on it. I wonder if it would be good if we um, gave it some descriptions, like we need to make it more engaging. Um, but whatever. Okay. Prompt open file. Okay, and so then we'll say prose equals GPT-3 completion um, prompt. There you have it. All right, so that's our first edition of the prose. And then we do the same thing here where we attach the research and the prose. This should actually probably, we'll change this to prose keep it nice and consistent. And I think we did it, what, like two or three times before it started kind of going off the rails? So we'll do we'll do just two improvements of improving the pros. Um, okay, so pros equals um, uh, improve pros. And so what did I have in here? We have the research and the pros. Research and prose. Um, so we just improve itself. So recursive programming for, for kitties who don't know, you could not do this where you pass a variable, where you, you assign a variable and pass it at the same time. This is a newer thing. Back in the days of Pascal and C++, you, what you would have to do, uh, you'd have to declare something like prose2 equals prose, and then you'd say prose equals prose2. It's silly but now you don't have to do that anymore. Now you can just call it directly and it's just a single step. Um, okay, so the improve prose is going to be the same as improve outline with mild difference. So we'll do improve prose and instead of request and outline, it's research and prose. So we'll do um, Improve prose, research, oops, uppercase, and prose. Oh, whoops. Gotta replace both. Lowercase, and then prose. Uppercase. And then we don't need that. And so then we also change the name back to prose and prose. Okay, so then we call improve prose, we just call it a handful of times, and we end up with a better uh, set of prose. And actually what we'll do is we'll declare the final blog as a list, and so then we'll do um, final blog dot append um, prose. So that'll be a list of sections that we can then, we can keep them separate so that we can give them um, headers, and also we can continue to improve them separately if we want. Are we done? Hold on. <laughs> this is what happens to me. I get so focused on what I'm doing that it's just like, wait, that's the end, right? I know there is one last thing, but I want to see how this looks um, before we do the final step, which is this one, clean up the final product. Um, okay, so let's give some, uh, whoops. Let's come back here. Let's get some output as we go. Um, so we'll print new line, new line, research. Um, yeah, so we'll do, first we'll print um, new line, new line, section. 
section. Use that variable, right? Yep. So then we do the section, and then we do research because we need to. We need something to look at while we're, you know, doing this. Um, and we'll do print uh, new line, new line, prose, prose, and then we'll just copy this down here, and then it'll be appended. And so then finally, here at the end of all things, we will just do. Um, here, we'll do from pprint import pprint. So this is pretty print. So we'll do pretty print final blog. And this is just for debug. Okay, so let's, I need to zoom out a little bit because this is enormous. Well, no, let's see, let's see how it looks. Okay, generate a blog, end to end. History of Shinto. Improved outline. Predictions for the future of the religion. That's cool. Heck yeah. And then? Oh wow. That got real long, so we're gonna have 10 sections. Do, 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 do. We'll probably like accelerate this. Oops, it crashed. Recirc is not defined. What do you mean I did a typo? Let's see, this is line 87. Huh, <laughs> oops, right here. Dang, so close, but this is why you test your code. All right, let's do this again. All right, I am gonna make it a little smaller because this is outputting quite a bit. So we'll do, we'll go down to 24. There. How to build a Tory gate. There we go. Oh, we've got... Ugh. Yeah, we've got the double new lines. So for the out, for the final outline, um, outline equals outline dot replace, and we'll do double new line with just single new line. Because we're gonna end up with yeah, okay, but this is, this is, this is all right. So far, so good. Cool, cool, cool. And then the section has nothing. Yeah, darn it. Darn it! <laughs> and it puts out nothing. We'll just let it finish and see what happens. There are about 80,000 Shinto shrines. There's all of our research, so that's good. Welcome to my blog about Shinto. <laughs> Okay, cool. So this is gonna iterate through each of these sections for a little while. I think I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video and uh, we'll see, cause you get, you get the idea. We don't need to read this. So we'll pause the video, we'll come back once it's done. It worked, mostly. Um, it produced a lot of content, I'll put it that way. Um, now unfortunately, this was just a test run, so we've got all this, so let's just, Let's just get all this out to a text file. And um, so I, I added this while we were waiting where it'll actually save it out to file because I should have done that. Um, and I'll probably separate out so that we'll clean up the blog afterwards. But first, let's just see what we've got. So let's do a re find and replace the single quotes with nothing, replace all, and then we'll replace um, backslash backslash n with nothing. Actually, no, this will be normal find and replace. So that cleans that up. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay. That is 
Yeah, there's a lot. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we've got it's 21,000 characters long. Um, so clearly, this is like, yeah, this 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 is quite a bit. Um, I think what I'm going to do, because uh, that's that's hmm, well, how many tokens is this? Let's plug this into 50, 50 5,000 tokens. So we want it to be maybe half that, maybe not quite as long. So what we'll do is we'll do um, just a little bit less research and a little bit less, a uh, little bit less brainstorming. Um, so hopefully that will make it a little bit more reasonable because what I'd like to be able to do is to do the final cleanup in one window, um, and we can't do that right now. Um, okay, so we've got this. I've got it so that it'll save it out to file. I wish that I had done this the first time, but what we're going to do is we're going to choose an entirely different topic because I tested it on one topic. Um, so I want a blog post about the history of the printing press. Um, I'd like to know how it influenced um, religion politics and war throughout history and up through the modern age. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and kick this off, generate blog, and then we'll come back with a brand new blog and then we will get into, um, we'll get into the, um, the process of improving a blog automatically. Um, why is it doing nothing? Did it not do any research? Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause it, and we'll come back in just a second. Okay, we have a blog post about the printing press. Um, and I think I actually lied. I think I'm going to call it here because this is actually not bad. Um, and it doing improving an existing document is worth its own project. So I think uh, what's going to come after this is I'll have one video um, or a project about pulling from external sources like how to search and automatically compile sources because that has applications all over the place um, such as automated research um, uh, for like academia, not just writing blogs, and then automatically improving stuff at basically being an editor is a whole other function. So we will call this a day. Git status, git add, git commit am, all done, and git push. So, uh, yeah, so there's a blog post out here. It is now 10,000 characters long, which means that it should fit into a single um, yeah, window. So you could, in theory, ask GPT-3, hey, take this blog post and rewrite it if you want to. I'm not going to worry about it because, um, yeah, this video is already plenty long and you, have, you now have an end-to-end -end process of prompt chaining and recursive prompting um, in order to uh, generate you know, be very generative and make something better. Remember, use this responsibly. I am not responsible if you uh, use this to do something unethical. Um, yeah, this is on you. Uh, anyways, thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe and consider supporting me on Patreon. Have a good day. Hey everyone, David Shapiro here with a new kind of video. <clears throat> I'm going to try, I've had this idea for a while, I've had this idea of doing a working session. And what I mean by that is I'm just going to walk you through my entire process. Sometimes people don't really believe me when I tell them how fast I work or how easy this stuff is. So you know what, I'm just going to record it end to end. Um, and here's the project today. <clears throat> Someone said, nice vid. So this is my co-writing flash fiction with GPT-3. Let me zoom in a little bit. Um, he says, nice vid and the character dialogue one. I'm curious if you've tried using GPT-3 to generate a high-level logical plot summary where you prompt for a, structure, for a structure like setup, incident, an inciting incident, midpoint, false high, etc., etc. In my experiments, it is too extensive prompt chaining. Perhaps that's because it's a more complex task. I say, I tried that with my Autumn Muse project, and it was not great at it. However, this is something that could be fine-tuned. 
So that gave me an idea. Let me do an outline generator. So I just created this repo. Here is the repo here. Um, and uh, I've added a couple files. I just added my API key um, and, and a, a boilerplate thing. So let me just show you. CD outline generator, get status, get add, get commit, AM, initial commit, get push. Okay, so you will see, I just did a, I just did a push. There's only a handful of files in here. Let's get started. Okay, so the first thing to do with this is playground. Let's go to text DaVinci 02. So the very first thing, let me zoom back in here, is um, <clears throat> uh, we need some raw data to work with. So we're going to synthesize some data. So the first thing is, um, let's just right off the cuff, let's see if this prompt works. Write a detailed, um, uh, no, not write, imagine, no, brainstorm, there we go, brainstorm a plot synopsis for a random story. Um, <clears throat> let's say detailed plot synopsis. Um, and let's just see what that does. The town of Shepherdstown is a historic located in Appalachian of uh, blah blah blah. Sorry, I'm trying to read too fast. Um, <clears throat> this is great. And it decides, blah blah. Okay, it keeps going. Okay, perfect. So the town of Shepherdstown is a historic small town located in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. The town is home to a variety of shops and businesses, as well as a number of different families. The McBride family has lived in Shepherdstown for generations, and they own a large farm on the outskirts of town. The youngest McBride daughter, Lizzie, is a free-spirited 18-year-old who has always been drawn to the town's history. She loves to explore the old buildings and learn about the town's past. One day, Lizzie discovers a hidden room in one of the buildings, one of the old buildings, the room is filled with dusty old boxes and furniture. Lizzie starts to explore, and she finds a secret passage that leads to a hidden staircase. She climbs the staircase to find herself in a secret attic. The attic is filled with old clothes, furniture, and books. Lizzie starts to look through the books, and she finds an old journal. The journal is filled with the handwritten accounts of the town's history. Lizzie is fascinated by the journal and decides to start her own research project on the town's history. She spends the summer exploring the town's past and learning. This, like, oh man, this is some pure literary fiction right here. Okay, so we've got a an initial prompt. So let's go ahead and just save this. Um, and we'll say, we'll call this um, prompt underscore premise dot text. And so then what I do is I've got this, <clears throat> this script that I'm starting. Um, let's change this to DaVinci 02. And we'll use the same, um, the same settings, so no frequency penalty, no presence penalty. Um, I'll leave these, the stops, uh, actually no, I'll just remove those, because they are not relevant to this project. Okay, I think that's all we need. So go with PEP8, two new lines beneath each one. Okay, so this is a function that I copy paste in all my projects. Um, some people have noticed that, that every now and then your, your, um, your prompt will fail and uh, or your completion will fail and so I just have a retry built in it rarely needs that especially nowadays I think they I think they've upped their capacity but basically I just say like um, oh I need to import sleep as well um, from time import sleep um, so basically it'll just wait a second and then try again in case it fails to talk to OpenAI um, okay so for this since I like the prompt let's do if name equals main and this is not strictly required for this just because it's um I'm prototyping I could just jump straight into a loop um, however this is good practice to do if name equals main if you want to call this from something else um, I'm not going to do that since I just do imperative programming and rapid prototyping but I just got in the habit and I like it because it just says okay let's demarcate this okay um, let's see for I in range um, let's see, 0 to 10. Let's just do 10 for now. Um, let's see, premise equals um, GPT-3 completion, prompt equals, oh wait, prompt equals 
need to load the file. So I'll just copy this with open, and what did I call it, prompt premise? Because I will use different prompts in the future as in file, so we'll say prompt equals in file dot read. Okay, oh, and another thing I forgot is what I do is I, uh, I grab the, um, the output and I strip it, so that removes all um, white space on, from the edges, and then I also do a, um, a regex um, swap replace for any any additional white space and just replace it with an individual space. So in this case, if it adds too much vertical space, like new lines, I want to remove all the new lines just so it ends up with a single block of text like you see here. Um, it's it's not always necessary, but sometimes GPT-3 will spit out too much, too much uh, vertical white space and I want to condense it. Um, so that's why I have this little bit here. And that actually reminds me I need to also import re, which is regex. Um, okay, so premise equals GPT-3 completion prompt, so that'll pass in the prompt. I've got the engine set to default to text DaVinci 02. I've got tokens 500 just in case it gets cut off. Um, but you see here, the uh, these instructions are super short um, because text DaVinci 02 is pretty darn good. Um, okay, so let's run this. Oh wait, I actually need to save it. Okay, so let's see, with open... Um, what did I name that folder? Premises. Uh, premises slash, uh, I guess I need a file name. Um, <clears throat> let's do, let's start at one and go to 200. Uh, file name equals premise underscore dollar, or, uh, uh, text insert, I don't remember the name of that right now, text, and then we'll do I, okay. So that will give us a serial number, so we'll then, we'll say premises that, and do file name, write, encoding equals UTF-8. Um, I always do UTF-8 because GPT-3 sometimes outputs stuff that will not encode in ASCII, or other simpler things, and UTF-8 is just universal. Um, so we'll do, uh, oops, as out file. Um, out file dot write uh, premise. I think that's I think that's all I need to do. Um, and then we'll do an exit right here. So what I often do is just for debugging and testing, I'll just have it do one instance. Um, and then let's add a print, print premise. Uh, da, 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 da. We'll do new line, new line, new line, premise. So that way we can separate them all out. Exit. So that'll just be a quick test. Make sure. Okay. Um, I think that's it. So Python generate premises. Can I zoom in on this? Can I make this bigger? Edit. Properties, uh, cursor, no, not cursor size. Font, there we go. Make the font a little bit bigger so you can see. It. There we go, look at that, beautiful. Let's go a little bit bigger so that you can see what the heck is going on. You don't have to squint at your screen. 36, that's enormous. Um, maybe that's a little too big. Ah, heck with it. No module named OpenAI. Really, I forgot to re, okay, so I recently reinstalled my computer. Um, pip install OpenAI. The rest of this, while that's installing, the rest of these um, time and regex are are default um, with uh, GPT-3. Um, so you don't need, or not GPT-3, Python. Sorry. Um, the only the only module I need to install here is OpenAI. Okay, successfully built, installing. It's doing all this fun stuff. Okay, let's try that again. Python generate premises. Error communicating is not valid under, hmm, interesting. It doesn't like it. Okay, I guess it doesn't like my empty, whatchamacallit here, so we'll just do blah, blah, blah. Maybe I should exclude that if I'm not gonna have anything meaningful in it. Okay, let's try again, do clear screen. 
generate premises. And the answer is save GPT-3 log is not defined. Oh, right, because I, I grabbed this function from something else. Um, save GPT-3 log. Um, so I usually, in, in a lot of my projects, is I'll save every interaction with GPT-3. So let me just co comment that out. Um, my bad, sorry. Again, I, just, I told you I was going to go through the entire process. Um, this, is, this is what prototyping looks like with Dave. Um, hopefully it'll work this time. Fail fast and keep going. There we go. Okay, cool. Look at this. Um, incomplete format. Oh yeah, I did do that. I it, I called me out on my on my crap. I I messed it up here. Okay, the sky is orange and the sun is red, casting an eerie glow over the small town of Shepherdstown. Um, it really likes Shepherdstown, doesn't it? I wonder how often it will do Shepherdstown because the the one up here also says Shepherdstown. Um, Interesting. Okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> if it if it likes that, that's fine. Um, we'll see if it if it repeats that. But let's go fix this thing because I missed. We need the percent %s for file name. Okay, and that should. If I'm not mistaken, it will not have. Yeah, it did not succeed. Okay, generate premises. I'll see what it does this time. Shannon left to run the family. Okay, so this generated a premise. Um, yep, she knows it would be inappropriate to pursue a relationship with someone she is employer. So that's a that's a typo. That doesn't make any sense. Shannon and Diego must find a way to resist their feelings. So this came up with a with a romance. Um, so one thing you can do is I often will do, um, I'll often have placeholders. So like, let's say we want to modify the premise for a random story, let's say like, you know, romance story. Actually, let's do it this way. So we'll do romance and instead of doing, um, instead of doing 200 of each one, we'll do like, we'll do like 50. So I'll do like romance, um, science fiction, fantasy and like uh, literary fiction or something. So we'll just do 50 of each and we'll do um, premise, uh, romance. There we go. I think this will be good. So then we'll get a, we'll get a broader variety. Um, yes. Okay. So then we can assume that this, yes, premise one dot text. Yay. Look at that. And actually let's switch this open with, choose another program, Notepad++, always use Notepad++. Okay, so there you have it. You see we've got a premise um, for a story. And so let's go ahead and close that. And that that took, um, uh, what am I doing, manage account, okay, usage. This will take a minute to load, but this is stupid cheap. Um, because that was like 200, that was like 200 um, tokens. Um, so yeah, that was, that last one was 164 tokens and it cost less than a penny. 266 tokens cost two cents. So, you know, if I generate 200 of these premises, it'll be about a dollar, right? Um, and if you've been watching my YouTube channel this month, um, everything that I've shown you has cost $2. That is how cheap GPT-3 is getting to use. Okay, so, look, quick little aside, let's comment out the exit. So we should generate now 50 premises um, of romance. Um, and then we'll change this to sci-fi, fantasy, and other stuff. Do a quick save. So now we'll do CLS, Python, generate premises. Okay, so basically this is step one of generating synthetic data. Um, and I've been doing this for let me pause my video for a second to see how long. Okay, so that was 15 minutes. Um, from zero to getting um, an unlimited number of synthetic data, we, uh, we're going from here. And you see it's outputting everything as it goes. Um, it looks like it's using some similar stuff over and over again. Interesting. Jenna is looking forward to the weekend. Um, okay, so it is, it is a little bit repetitive. That's interesting. I wonder if there's something we can do 
to make it a little less repetitive. At the beach house, beach house. All right, so solutioning time. This is way too darn repetitive. Um, I think we might need to have a, a first thing, something that kind of stands before um, generating premise. Okay, so uh, generate a list of random characters, locations, um, and genres. So then we'll just do a dash there. Giraffe Lighthouse Comedy. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, let's say long list and see what that does because a giraffe lighthouse comedy that's not helpful um, oh random characters let's see so we need to tell it for a story um, this is for brainstorming a story generate a long list of random characters locations and genres there we go oh good 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 okay so here's what happens is it gives us some random stuff um, let's run this a couple times to see if it gives us um, similar things because like a group of friends who get stranded on a desert island camping trip in the woods um, let's see if it's repetitive again a family who owns a farm group of students okay yeah this is this is okay this is a little bit more random um, run it a few more times skilled archer town that is terrorized by a band of robbers dark forest oh this is great a final battle between good and evil wonderful um, okay so here's what we're gonna do we are going to create another prompt that stands before the first one because we saw that it was being way too repetitive okay um, let's call this prompt brainstorming brainstorm okay so first we're going to do that and then ooh ooh I'm gonna need to change this because we don't want we want to actually split the lines yeah okay so we'll need to change a couple things let's see how should I approach this I think I'm just gonna to need to take this out because uh, we want to maintain the lines and um, we will say I don't want to waste too many tokens um, actually let's simplify this because I don't need multiple Outputs, I need just one. Generate a, a list. Um, generate a list of. Well, no, because having a list output allows it to be more creative because there will be some slight variances. Oh, also, oh, I wonder if I could fix this just by turning up the temperature. Let's go back. Look, before we get too carried away, let's turn up the temperature a little. 1.0, because this can go up to this can go up to 2. Okay, before before we get too carried away with over solutioning it, let's try simple things. Um, so over here we've got seven romances. Looking at the console output, um, most of them involve Jenna. Most of them involve the weekend at a beach house. So all right, let's see if we can restart this and we get a better um, better set of outputs. Um, let's see. Let's go back here. Python generate premises. All right, so all I did was I changed the temperature from 0 0.7 to 1.0. Um, so let's see if we get that repetitiveness again. Jenna is looking forward to her evening run. Okay, that's a little bit better. Jenna and Ryan hit it off. Tamara is a successful businesswoman who seems to have it all. She's beautiful and smart. Great. Starting to get some variety. Um, oh, but you see how we're getting some, some more vertical white space that I don't like. Hannah sets cross-country road trip. Good. Linda is high-powered executive. Um, yeah, okay, this is getting better. Um, so the simple thing is the better thing. All I had to do was turn up the temperature. 
Um, let's add the canceling the white space, add that back in. That's fine for now. Jenny is a young woman who is struggling to find her place in the world. Good. Rachel is a successful young woman. Notice how all the romances start with a, with a woman. Um, falls in love with Luke, who learns to trust again. Sherry had always been a hopeless romantic. So here's what I'll do. Um, I'll wait for this to get to about um, like 20 or so, or uh, 25 rather, and then I'll change the prompt. Actually, no, I don't need to stop it. All I need to do is change the prompt. Um, so we'll go to this. So this is this is one advantage. Actually, no, that won't work because I only load the prompt once. Um, yeah. So for every iteration, if I move this up into the into the loop, then I could just change the prompt mid-flight. So actually, let's do that. Um, so let's do that. Put that here. So now, while it's iterating, I can change the prompt mid-flight without having to cancel it. Um, that'll be nice. Long day of work to her loving fiance, Miles. Um, Jenna and the stranger. When Olivia's mom dies, she's left to fend for herself. Um, so this is all this is all very like Anglo-centric. These are all like typical, pretty much typically American names. These aren't even like European names. Um, so let me go ahead and pause this now. And let's add a little bit of variety. But first, we're going to want to change where it starts. OK, so we're at 16. So let's go here, and we'll start. Um, we'll, go, we'll start at 17, and we'll go up to, uh, let's see, let's, uh, we'll just go up to 30. And then we'll change this to, uh, let's close that one so I can stop clicking on it. Um, for brainstorm a detailed plot synopsis for a random romance. Let's say Europe. Uh, no, let's say French romance story. Um, and watch how much just one word changes this output. And let's see, make sure that I change the, where it starts. Um, so it'll go from 17 to 30. Uh, okay, that'll be fine. Okay. So, because basically what we're doing now is where, oh, Elise, there we go. Dashing Parisian gentleman, Pierre. Oh, wonderful. Um, okay. So what we're doing is we're generating synthetic um, data right now. So ultimately, this will be the input that we use in the future. Why is it paused? There we go. Oh, wow. That's a much longer one. Excellent. Um, so, you know, we got 17, like, you know, white bread American um, premise romance plots. Um, and we're going to use those to generate um, like a three act structure in a little bit. Um, but we want variety, right? We don't want just Anglo-centric American stories. We want a variety. So, um, oh, look at that name. Antoinette Gaudier. Ha! Huh. Love this. Meet, meets brooding. So there's another problem. Um, meets brooding artist Claude Monet. Oh, wow, look at that. Look at that. This is great. Okay. Sorry, I'm just really happy, really excited about this. The goal, the reason why they're numbered, is because we got to get up to 200 total. Um... So 200 total, uh, that's going to be enough for us to, uh, for us to, um, what am I trying to say? Sorry, I'm thinking really fast and my mouth can't keep up. We need to get a minimum of 200 samples in order to fine tune a model. That is OpenAI's recommended um, kind of baseline minimum. Okay. Pardon me, I have to check, uh, I have to check something. Okay, sorry about that pause, um, but I think that's fine for you guys as watching the video. Just skipped ahead. Okay, so now we've got um, 30, uh, well, zero, one, 1 through 29 um, premises. Um, it's just scrolling up here. Francois is a young woman who lives in Paris with her husband. Um, oh, that looks like that repeated. That's okay. It's okay if we get some repetition. So what have we learned? So far, we've learned to turn the temperature up a little bit. Let's go up a little bit higher next time, just to see. Um, it can start to go off the rails, so that's why I have the, the console output, just so I can see what it, what's doing um, as I'm generating this data. But already I've got about, you know, what is this, 30 items. Um, how much data is this? This is 24 kilobytes of data um, that I didn't have to write. All I did was tell the machine what I wanted it to do. All right, so first let's update our starting point. So we'll go from 30 to... 45, we'll just do 15. 
and let's do a Bollywood romance story. Um, and this is going to take a while, but I will explain stuff to you um, as we go. And if it gets too boring, I'll pause the video so it'll just skip ahead, so don't worry. Um, if I, if I pause the video and it skips ahead, it's just because I'm letting some of this process finish. Okay, so let's do the generate premises, but we change the prompt to Bollywood romance, and we've got the prompt premise, and now the output is still premise romance, and we're doing from number 30 to 45. Okay, let's go. Let's see what happens. Let's see how these go. Do, 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 do. Rhea and Raj have been married for five years. They have a two-year-old daughter. Look at this. They moved to Mumbai. Oh, man, this is wonderful. Um, it's so creative. And look how fast it's spitting this stuff out. I could never, I could never write this fast. No human could. No ten people could. So I'm just churning out. Um, looks like it is a little repetitive, Raj and Simran. Of course, it could be that Raj is a common name. Um, I... I, I, I work with a lot of Indian folks, and I know that there are some common names. Like, my name is Dave. That's freaking common, right? So, like, I know that, like, Karthik and Satish are ultra-common names in, uh, in India. Um, Raul, there's another common one. So, yeah, um, it looks like having the temperature a little bit higher is good. Um, I'm not seeing repetitive patterns in here. Um, even the names are often um, unique. Uh, that's good. Okay, so while this is running, let's see what are, what are we up to? 36, so we've got about 10 more. Um, let's grab one of these. Whoops. If I know where I'm going. Okay, so let's grab this and and start, start figuring out. Um, let's see. Um, construct, that's a good one. Construct a three-act structure for the following... Yeah, sure. Grammarly is like the most nagging um, grammar teacher ever, but it helps me be a better writer. Um, also, speaking of, between GPT-3 and Grammarly, you combine those two, you're an unstoppable writer. You can produce content so fast. Uh, construct a three-act structure for the following um, story premise. Um, each, uh, each act should have a brief description one to two sentences okay premise so we'll do a premise there and now we'll do um, three act structure act one all right let's see what this does it might just be All right, let's see how this compares. All right, I guess I have to read it all out. Okay, it all begins with Samir, a young man from a wealthy family, meets Naina, um, a simple girl from a small village. Naina has come to the city to make a better life for herself. She is immediately attracted to Samir, but is too shy to say anything. Ooh, a shy girl story. Um... One day, out of the blue, Samir expresses his feelings for Naina and confesses his love for her. Um, Naina is overjoyed and eagerly accepts his proposal. They begin to date, and their families approve of the match. However, just as things seem to be going well, Samir, Samir's father suddenly dies. Interesting. Leaving him the sole heir to the family business, Samir is forced to take on a lot of responsibility and doesn't have much time for Naina. Oh, oh man, this is a good story. I want to watch this movie. <laughs> uh, Naina begins to feel neglected and wonders if Samir is really the man she thought he was. Um, Samir is soon caught in a world of money and power, and Naina feels like she is losing him. One day she decides to go back to her village, leaving Samir behind. Samir realizes how much he loves Naina and how much he has been neglecting her. He decides to go to her village and confess his love. Naina is hesitant, but eventually agrees to give him another chance. They share a passionate embrace, and their families rejoice at the news of their reunion. Oh man, I can imagine so much song and dance in this Bollywood picture. Okay, so let's see how that has translated to a three-act structure. Act one, um, she's immediately attracted. Okay, out of the blue. It almost looks like it's just... Okay, it's just splitting it up. Um, this is not... This is... Okay. Um, break the following... Um, 
uh, following premise down into a list of major plot points. Use the save the cat model for screenplays. Okay, so then let's try this again. Save the cat. Plot point one. Okay, let's see what happens. Mm, I don't like it. It's not working. Hmm. Okay, so this is where we have to get more and more creative. Because it's just regurgitating it, and that's not exactly what I want. Um, and I want to avoid doing a um, doing a few shot example. Um, here, let's break this down even simpler. Um, write a scene. Write the opening scene for the following. No, we, we really do need an outline. Um, let's see, what was it? Translate or rewrite? Rewrite this, uh, the following premise into an outline. Outline. All right, let's see if this works. So again, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just experimenting. Rapid iteration. Okay, again, it's just um, their families rejoice. I guess this is okay because then this we can break each of these points down into we can break them down further, um, and and we can expand the story for each of these. Like, break this down into, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, this the, these premises are so good. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, I think I think we can work with this. I think we can work with this. Also, this is probably done. Um, let's go ahead and get this started. Uh, Raj and Priya, a painter falls in love with a girl. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And that should have us up to, what was that, 45 total? Um, so we need just a couple more romance. Um, let's go ahead and set this to run. Um, all right, imaginary audience in my head. What kind of romance should we do? Oh, paranormal romance, done. Paranormal romance story. Uh, and then we will go from 45 to 51. So that'll take us all the way up to 50. 50 on the dot. CLS, Python, generate some premises. <sighs> Luke is actually a werewolf. That's fun. This is great. I love this. Um, okay, this will only take a minute because we're almost done already. 47. Jenna's looking for Jenna looks forward to the weekend a lot in GPT-3's brain. Um, <laughs> this is funny. Do, 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 do. When you wake up from your car accident, you find, oh, this is a first person story. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, honestly, these premises are so good. Like, I don't know if I need to break them down in any further. Um, but let's see. Let me go back to this guy's comment. Because maybe, maybe this is more of an extraction thing. Um, he said, you know, setup, inciting incident, midpoint, false high, all hope is lost, and climax. Okay. Actually, you know what, dude? John David Parsons, I'm just going to copy this because this is such a powerful way to start. Um, let me just paste this in here. Um, identify the following elements. All right, just copy that for now. Let's go back over here. Romance. Oh, wait, nope. Brainstorm a detailed plot synopsis for a random. All right, so now we're going to switch to... Uh, let's see, 75. Actually, no, we'll say 76. Um, now we're going to switch to, what did I say, sci-fi? All right, sci-fi. And we'll say um, science fiction story. And then we'll switch that over from, like, science fiction to 
like, um, actually, no, let's say random hard science fiction, and then we'll do, like, um, epic or space opera. Yeah, we'll do space opera next. Okay, so let's get this running. Uh, NA. That's interesting. Did it really just, like, spit out NA? It did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> GPT-3 said, no, I'm not going to give you a premise. Okay, whatever. Um, we'll just delete that one. Let's see what it's doing. In the future, the human race has all but wiped out a race of advanced aliens. Wow, we're, we're jackasses. Um, okay. So we're getting some stories. Okay, identify the following elements for the premise. Um... One, setup. Why does it keep jumping all the way down? Two, inciting incident. Three, midpoint. Four, false high. Five, all hope is lost. Six. Climax. And I will actually probably go copy KM Wyland's story beats because KM Wyland is pretty good. Okay, so one. Um, setup. All right, let's see if it can identify. Let's turn the temperature down because we don't want it to be as creative now. Um, we, do want it, we do want it to be somewhat creative, but we don't want it to go off the rails. Okay, this looks like it's working. Leaving Samir behind. I don't know that that actually worked. Let's see, let's see what happens if we turn the temperature down even more. And I'll try turning it back up in just a second. Okay. So, again, this is just kind of like regurgitating the same. Um, there's not really any value add. That's, that's why I'm not so happy with this is because these premises are so great. So it's like, okay, well, what, what do we do from here? Um, I guess, I, guess I, will, I will go back and say, like, okay, it can, it can be helpful if we have a, um, have a good, like, breakdown. Um, well, let's see. KM Wylan... Plot beats. Uh, what are her? Here we go. Uh, first act, the hook. First plot point, inciting incident, event, key event. First half of the second act, midpoint. This is not the list that I was thinking of because it doesn't include the pinch points. Oh well, this is good enough. Um, set up, inciting incident, midpoint, falls high, all hope is lost, dark night of soul, whatever, climax. That's fine. We'll go with this. Um, all right, so temperature of 0 0.5. Let's see if it's consistent. Okay, so this does break it down into a few points. Um, we'll go with that for now. Uh, I really think that we should expand on this, though. Actually, here, let's, let's be more creative. Uh, okay, write a detailed opening scene for a film with the following premise. Um, use, uh, let's see, what is the standard screenplay format called? Okay. Um, use standard um, script formats for Hollywood films. Screenplay. Let's see what it does with this. Fade in. Oh, wow.
This is this is fascinating. Screenplay fades in. Exterior of Naina's village. Day. We see a small village in the middle of nowhere. There are simple houses and dirt roads. We see a young woman, Naina, walking down the road. She's carrying a small bag and looks determined. Naina to herself. This is it. I'm going to the city and I'm going to make something of myself. Wow, this is phenomenal! Oh, man. Okay, Naina jumps out of the way and falls to the ground. Naina angry. What the hell? The car stops and a young man, Samir, gets out. He looks apologetic. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I'm fine. Just watch where you're going next time. Samir nods. Okay, I'm, I'm, I will. I'm really sorry. Waves him off. It's fine. Just be more careful. Um, I think it ended because ran out of tokens. Uh, okay, I really like this. So instead of, instead of, um, instead of, because the premise is complete. We don't need, we don't need to break that down. It's got, this is a full story. Um, so let's copy this and say, we'll save this as prompt screenplay, or well, we'll just call it a script. Um, okay. And then if I'm not mistaken, this is probably done. Yay! The year is 20, 2755. The human race has been decimated by a pandemic. It swept across the globe. Ha! Huh, too relevant. The year is 20XX. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, cool. So we should have up to number 75. We've got a whole bunch of sci-fi premises. So let's go back here. We'll start at 76 and go to 101. And we're going to change the prompt script. What did I say? Or the premise? This is going to be a um, space opera science fiction story. Okay, so let's kick this off again while it's running in the background. And that'll be that'll be half of our of our premises. Big Jeff is an unlikely hero. <laughs> a portly space trader. Oh man, these are great. In a galaxy far, far away, a young farmer dro really? Really? It's just copying Star Wars? That's fine. Um, okay. So we can't expect GPT-3 to always be super unique, but um, that's fine. We don't need it to be. So this starts to get a little bit more complicated for these prompts. So now that we've got material that we want to feed in, we're going to need to add a few more functions. And so what I'll do is I'll copy this because this script is just for generating premises. So what we'll do is we'll save this and now we'll say, um, we'll call this generate scripts.py. Um, because we will need to take, um, actually, maybe we won't. Uh, yeah, we will need to take all this out because that does too much to the um, to the thing. We need to keep the format. Um, we'll need to turn the temperature back down. I think we're at 0 0.5 on here. Yep, 0 0.5. We'll keep 500 tokens. Actually, let's do a little bit more because the screenplay. We want we want to expand this, right? Um, screenplay, fade in. Um, it doesn't even have a name. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, so we need this. Actually, here, let's copy this whole thing. And the prompt for the script. So then what we do is we add a token for the premise. <clears throat> okay, and we go here. So um, I just want to point out the original idea was to create a um, was to create a outline generator, but I realized that the that the premise generator was more powerful than an outline generator, um, and so basically I'm moving the goalposts on myself and saying actually let's go a little bit further, let's do something unique, um, and so we'll do scripts, um, and so this is going to be the the script that um, that matches matches what we're doing. Um, we'll leave, let's change the script, write, write a detailed opening scene, um, de write detailed opening scenes, plural, for a film with the following premise. Use standard script formats for Hollywood films. So we'll put in the premise and then the screenplay. Okay, so, and then I will also turn, um, you probably saw uh, generate... Oops, sorry, gener generate scripts. Turn it up to a thousand tokens. Um, da Vinci instruct can go up to four thousand. Um, so this one, so you see, like that can go up to four thousand. 
that's going to get pricey and it's also going to take a while. So I'm not going to go that, I'm not going to go that far. Um, okay. This is done. Kira is a young woman born on a small space station. Okay, cool. So now we should have, we've got exactly a hundred premises. Um, we've got romance, sci-fi. What did I say? Oh, fantasy. Okay. So let's go back in here and switch to fantasy. Um, how long has this video been? Okay. We're at 46 minutes. Um, and we're, we're, we're a good chunk of the way done. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, we are going to generate some more premises. Prompt premise, so we're gonna switch to fantasy and we're gonna go from 101 to 126. And the prompt for the premise is going to be a random high fantasy story. Um, this one will be specifically like, well, it says high fantasy, so that implies magic and dragons. Um, and then we'll do another kind of fantasy after this. All right, so let's let that rip, rip and roll. Make sure that it's, it runs. Uh, the kingdom of Alabaster, really, is in peril. The king has been assassinated and the queen has been kidnapped. This is This sounds fun. Far in the land of Doran, there lived a great kingdom. People were thriving and happy under the leadership of King Gelador. That's cool. Um, okay, they triumph and Doran is restored. Rin, a young woman of humble beginnings. Okay, this is great. Um, a young woman discovers she's a reincarnated princess of a lost kingdom. That's cool. She must venture into... Uh, yeah, okay. So that's running. In the meantime, generate scripts. Okay, so we removed that. Um, so what we have to do here is instead, I'll leave that in place for now. So we'll do um, import OS. Uh, premises equals OS lister um, premises. And so then what we'll do is we'll do for premise in premises. And also you can do you can do a one liner here. Um, actually, so let's let's do it that way. Because that's more Pythonic. For premise in premises, uh, we will do um, uh, let's see, we'll say text equals uh, no with open, because we'll use the same um, yeah, here we go. We'll just copy paste this, but instead we will say uh, read, and we will do for file name as in file uh, premise equals in file dot read. Okay, so now we will have loaded each premise. Um, and then we're going to do the same thing that we did here, which is the uh, script equals GPT-3 completion premise. Um, oh, wait, no. The prem we, we have more to do. Um, the prompt, sorry, with open, uh, we'll see what was the prompt name. There we go. So this is going to be our prompt script. And let me check on this, see if it's done. It is done. Okay, so let's go update. Uh, and I know I'm jumping around a lot, but I multitask. Um, so basically what I'm doing is I notice that this is done. So I'm going to go and update the prompt. So this is a random high fantasy. What other kind of fantasies? Let's do uh, grim dark fantasy. It, that's all the rage right now. So let's change this from 126 to 151. And we'll start that going again, generate premises. And so that just so you can see, we've got 125 premises here. Um, let's see, when the last king of the realm was slain in battle, all hope seemed lost, but Prince Aiden, heir to the throne, was not ready to give up. Um, okay. Cool. Life was never meant to be easy. Grown from the dirt and grime of the world, the people toiled day in and day out. Yeah, this is miserable. Okay. 
<sighs> All right, where was I? Generate scripts. Yes, generate scripts. Um, so prompt script as in file prompt equals in file dot read um, dot replace, and we're going to replace the premise with the premise. So that grabs that. So basically, we're saying the prompt is going to read this file and replace this part with the actual premise. And so then we will say the script equals GPT-3 completion of the prompt. And remember, the prompt now has the premise embedded. Um, and so then that is the call to GPT-3. File name. Um, actually, the file name will just be file name equals, um, we'll say new file name, equals file name dot replace um, premise with script. So basically what this line will do is it'll grab the premise and just say script. And it'll have the same, otherwise it'll have the same number. Um, okay, so that'll be the new file name. That's fine. And then we will we'll copy paste this line. with open and we'll say scripts. So this will change to a new file. Out file write, um, so new file name and we'll say script right there. So that should be good. And we'll do exit zero just to test the first one. And so this should be ready. once uh, as soon as as soon as we've got enough training data so tell you what um, this is about as far as I can code right now so I'm gonna pause the video and skip ahead but basically all I'm gonna do is make sure that um, that uh, this finishes creating the underlying data and then I'll, I'll restart the video once we are um, once we're ready to start generating the scripts all right pause okay as promised we have 200 premises um, a bunch of them, I did a, I did a gritty noir mystery anime uh, was one of them, but we've got 200, um, all kinds of, we got mystery, fantasy, sci-fi, and romance, and they're all great. Okay, so next up, let's do a quick test. Python generate scripts. Okay, so as a reminder, we did this premise of the, um, of the or the script premise, sorry, Re reset. We have a script writer that uses the premises we just made. Okay, there we go. That's what I was trying to say. So let's do this. Let's just generate one to make sure it works. And then if that works, I'm going to pause the video again while it runs because you don't want to sit here and just watch 200 go. All right, so generate scripts. Um, let's see if this throws any errors. And if it doesn't, let's check to make sure that it outputs correctly. Oh, I, I didn't have it do any console output. Um, script one. Hey, look at this. Shannon's farm. Shannon, early 20s. Shannon, look at this. Perfect. Okay, this is 1,400 lines long, or characters long, so that's uh, that's probably right about 1,000 tokens. Um, yeah, this is great. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video again while this runs, and um, I'll see you in just a second. Okay, and we're back. Um, we've got almost 200 scripts written. So you can just see like, hey, here's some actual scripts being generated. I'm not going to read them all, but I'm just going to trust that like, hey, this works. And if you want to go through it and um, and take a look at them. Um, in the meantime, though, while this was running, because this has taken, let's see, 822 now. I don't know when it paused. You can do some math. Um, but I think I started about an hour and a half ago now total, maybe a little bit more. Um, so hour and a half later. Um, most of this time has actually been spent waiting because this is this is a slow process. Um, okay, so we've got that. So what I did it while I was waiting. So we've got the uh, generate premises. We're done with that. Generate uh, the prompt for the premises. We've got that. Oh, let me zoom back in. Sorry, you probably can't see this. Um, generate scripts. You saw me write this. This worked just fine. You can see the results here. Um, and then, whoops. And then. Uh, okay, so this is the next thing I did. I borrowed this from a previous um, previous project. So all this does is create a JSON L file. 
So let me do python generate json l name data is not defined. What do you mean data is not defined? Um, where do I use data? Oh, I meant to delete that. Okay. Ta-da! Okay, so let's make sure that this file was good. Um, scripts.json-l. Cool. So it looks like that worked. So prompt, and then it ends with completion. Um, you see here where I have nn script. So what I always do is I always add a, um, a natural language token at the end. OpenAI, they recommend doing something like um, that as your divider, but I don't like doing that. It doesn't work as well, um, because if you have a natural language token at the end of the prompt, then it knows, um, it knows like, okay, now it's time to do this particular task. Um, so what this data looks like is it, what it does, let me explain this. Um, so we take the premise and we match it to a prompt, uh, sorry, a script. And so this script, Shannon's farm on the day, like da da da, Shannon is left to a family farm on her own. So basically this, this is going to train a model to take any, any premise, so this could be like a handwritten premise, and output a movie script. Um, I know I completely changed the purpose from what I said at the beginning of the video, but hey, that's how rapid prototyping and research goes. Let me save that because I don't want to, or close that because I don't want to save it. Okay, so this file worked. Um, so we've got, our, we've got our JSONL file. So this is the final product for our training data. And then the very last script that I wrote is this fine-tune.py, and again, Excuse me, I um, <clears throat> I uh, borrowed it from a previous one. So basically, all it does is it uploads the file, the the JSON L file that we just did, um, and then it calls the uh, fine tune model. And I'll pause it again because the fine tuning takes a while to show you. But then once it's done, it'll actually appear. Um, oh, and so just so you know how much this costs, let me do a quick refresh. Um, so everything that you've seen today, I started the day at about two dollars. So now we're at eleven dollars. So generating um, generating two hundred premises, which is let's see, that's about one hundred and thirty nine kilobytes of text data, um, and then generating two hundred scripts from those, which is going to be a lot more, three hundred and thirty or three hundred and three kilobytes. So this all told was cost about nine dollars so far because I was at about two dollars already when I got started this morning. Um, yeah, so nine dollars to generate um, to to synthesize the data. That's that's not just the fine tuning. The fine tuning is way cheaper. But this was synthesizing from scratch. Okay, so I think this should be ready. Um, so let's see, file upload that does do the pretty print of that, and then the fine tune model. Um, okay, so yes, this should work. If I'm not mistaken, it might error out. So let's do CLS. Python, fine, fine tune. Okay, got the file uploaded. And let's see. Status pending. Okay, cool. I think this is usually usually it's in, in sequential order. So DaVinci fine tune file name file. Um, it doesn't have the name in it. Anyways, I'm assuming that it is fine-tuning. Um, let's do fine-tune get, fine-tune list. Okay, so here we will, uh, let me, oh yeah, that, so that was the last thing it did. So let me save that real quick. So I just comment these two out. Um, I actually don't need that. Um, so let me just do CLS. So fine tune, all this will do is just do a fine tune list. So it's pending. Okay, this will take a while. So I'll pause the video again, pause the record because you don't want to just sit and wait for this to finish. Um, but let me show you what it looks like when it's done. Um, so when it's done, the under your engines, your fine tunes will pop up here. And it'll have, so it starts with the engine name um, and then they changed it, so it's like the original fine tunes were like user, blah 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 blah. This wasn't helpful. They changed it to the name, so it gave, gives me my name, and then um, I gave it a tag. So this was my Eve project, um, yep, so on and so forth. Core objective functions, Eve, so on and so forth. So once that's done, 
another fine tune will pop up here with the name. Um, what name did I give it? Scripts. Um, so I could I could have said something better like movie script or something. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, let me pause it and I'll show you what how this performs in the playground in just a moment. Okay, gang, and we are done. It's uh, 9 o'clock, so I think that's about two and a half hours in. Granted, a huge chunk of this was waiting. Um, so let me do a quick refresh here, and let me show you what the final result is. Um, whoops, scroll down. Um, scripts, okay, so... Um, <sighs> Let's come up with a random premise for a story. Uh, actually, here, I've, my creativity is offline, so let me just go back up here. Write a premise for... Um, ooh, let's combine it. So we have an anime, um, an anime mystery, and a high fantasy. So let's do... Write a premise for a high fantasy anime movie. Write a detailed premise. Uh, let's go brainstorm. Okay. In a world of swords and sorcery, a young girl named Lily is thrust into a quest to save her kingdom from a powerful evil sorcerer. Okay, great. Okay, we've got a premise, so let's oops, clear that out. In a world of swords and sorcery, and then the, um, the fine-tuning data adds this, uh, this script, so that tells it that the, uh, the premise is done. So we'll go down to scripts, and we'll change this to 0 0.5. And here we go. Let's see what happens. It might um, time out because uh, it does often take a little bit of extra time to load a fine-tuned model. Um, but we should be just about done. And to prove it, let me go back here and show you outline generator. So started three hours ago. Um, yeah, so three hours ago, that's about how long I've been working on this. And we will um, do a final commit, and I'll do a final push. Yep, please try again shortly. Um, actually, I'm not changing anything, so we'll just do a git status. So remember, I started this video with um, with just doing this git, um, the initial commit git. Um, add all git commit am um, final commit. And you can go check on the... Um, the commits yourself if you want to get push okay so this code is now updated and online I'm probably also going to rename it from outline generator because this has actually became a script generator um, why did it name it that oh I probably accidentally copy pasted that didn't I that shouldn't be there cof json l yeah I totally accidentally copy pasted that okay that, that needs to go away um, also, this is under the MIT license, so you are free to use this however you want. Um, let's see if this is loaded, still being loaded. Try again. Um, git status, git add, git commit am, removing extraneous. Oh, actually, there's another one that needs to be removed. Um, brainstorm, because we didn't use that one. Okay, git add, git commit am, remove extra files, keep it as simple as possible, git push. Ta-da! Okay. Cool, so now the only stuff in this is exactly what was used, nothing more, nothing less. Um, has it finished loading? Oh, come on, why is it going so slow? Don't you know I got a YouTube video to make here? Usually it only takes one or two tries before the fine-tuned model loads, so I wonder if OpenAI is extra busy today. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'm going to pause it rather than make you wait. Okay, and of course, the very, like, three seconds after I clicked pause, it ran. Okay, so with this, notice I didn't include any instructions. I just give it a premise. And it writes a script. Fade in. Uh, Lily's house. Day. Young girl of about ten is playing in her backyard with her dog. A small terrier. Laughing, having a good time. Mama, Papa, there is no answer. Little girl starts to get scared. This is totally like a Miyazaki, right? This is a Studio Ghibli. Because <laughs> um, there's a sorcerer's castle, etc., etc. Okay. 
and then chase after Lily, grabbing her. And there you have it. You can do this yourself. You can go fine tune this. It's all up here. I'll leave it named Outline Generator, even though that's a misnomer, whatever. It'll just be an inside joke. Um, yeah, it's done. Thanks for watching. Good morning, everybody. David Shapiro here with a new video about GPT-3. So in this one, we are going to address a common problem that people have, which is that GPT-3, GPT there you go, will make stuff up. So this is called hallucinating or confabulation. Um, really, from a, from a neurological standpoint, it's actually confabulation because it's making up facts based on a few data points. It's not fully hallucinating. Um, but some people call it hallucination. I call it confabulation. Um, I was recently given a challenge where someone said that they were working on a problem of having like a chat bot look at um, a patient's um, texts or uh, graphs. And it was just making up medications. Like you ask, like, what, what medication is grandma on? And they'll just make stuff up. And I said, oh, that's an easy problem. And they're like, go on. Um, and I said, well, so the way that humans do that is that if I ask you a question, um, your brain will give you a signal, I have that answer, or no, I don't have that answer. You get different wave, uh, different brain waves, depending on whether or not you know something. Because what happens is, while you're talking with someone, every little clue that you're given, your brain is like going, you know, squirreling away, trying to find... Um, where that information is stored. And if it gets if, if it gets a 404 not found error, you get that signal. So what we have to do is we have to train GPT-3 to recognize that it doesn't know something, that something is not present in a text. So I happen to have, whoops, I happen to have um, about, oh, how many is this? A whole bunch of medical texts do, 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 do from a previous project. I have over 4,000 medical texts. We only need 200 to get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go ahead and create a new repo. And we're going to call this um, uh, medical question answering. OK, and we'll leave it public, add a readme, and a license, MIT, because sharing is caring. Create repo, medical question answering, copy. I uh, get clone, so start brand new, hot off the press, contexts. So from this old one, um, we will just go ahead and copy in this information. Oh yeah, this, this folder contains like 50,000 contexts. Um, this is like my default, like, hey, I want to train on a whole bunch of different scenarios. Um, I scraped this data together from a whole bunch of different sources. Um, unfortunately, I didn't write them all down, which is bad. Um, but I got them all from the internet. Um, I got them from Kaggle, mostly Kaggle and Google data sets. Um, so if you go to, while well, this is copying, let me just show you. So that way you know this thing, Kaggle.com. So you go to Kaggle.com slash data sets, and then you can just do like medical. I was probably here. Medical images, medical transcriptions. I think it was this one. Um, 2300 unique values, maybe not. Anyways, uh, this, this kind of thing. Um, and then you can also go to datasets.google.com or maybe not. Google datasets. Data search, data set search. Okay, here you get it. Here it is. And then you can just do like medical. Um, Healthcare patient records for NLP, yeah. So you can get all kinds of stuff here. Um, you can also search for legal, like if you want to fine tune something that's going to do like a lawyer bot. Um, so yeah, those are those are your two far and away your best sources. Anyways, let me. This is taking a while, so let me pause this real quick, and we'll get back. I'm not going to do anything. We're just going to pause, wait for this to finish. Okay, and we're back. We have finished. Um, we've got a folder of 3,060 medical texts. I deleted the ones that were too big and too small. Um, some of them were like 18 kilobytes, which is, you know, 15,000 characters too long to fit in, uh, in a GPT-3 prompt. Um, so the biggest one is now 
um, thirty eight hundred characters, which is that's on the that's on the bigger side. Um, but then also on the smaller side, we've got uh, twelve hundred characters. So I've already um, done a little bit of of prompt engineering. So I apologize for not showing you that, but let me show you what I did. So here's the input or here's the instruction. The following is a patient chart. Determine whether or not medications, in parentheses, were, were prescribed, was, let's say were prescribed. Um, and then, so I tested, was a medication prescribed, yes or no? So basically, we have to break this down into several cognitive tasks um, for, for creating the training data, because GPT-3 is just a prediction machine. Um, it does not have, it, I mean, it has the ability to do thousands of tasks, right? But unless you train it on which one to do, it's going to get confused because it says, oh, I'm looking for medication. Let me just spit it out. Yes. Um, so what happens is, oh, also I turn the temperature down to zero. So if you turn the temperature down to zero, that means it becomes deterministic, meaning it will always spit out the same answer, which if you want um, just a yes or no answer, a temperature of zero is the way to go. Um, because that'll also give you the most reliable um, performance. Okay, it says yes. Okay, then list medications prescribed. Decadron. And so we see like, okay, what is that? And oh, look, it's right there. She is also on a short course of Decadron. Perfect. Um, and then if we do a quick search for Decadron, um, we see like, uh, used to treat conditions such as arthritis, blood hormone disorders, allergic reactions, skin disease. Wow, this can treat like everything. This is like this is like a hypo spray for Star Trek, isn't it? This can it's just like oh, Doctor Crusher's like here, you're all better now. Um, okay, so it accurately said Decadron. Excellent, we're off to a good start. Um, but let's see what happens. Later. Let me copy this because this is a good prompt. Um, so if we just say, uh, let's see, list any medications prescribed. So this doesn't always work. So in this case, there was a medication um, prescribed, but if there isn't one, and we'll show you that in a second, it might not work. So in this case, it's, it's wrong because the morphine, sorry, my voice kind of cracked, morphine? I sounded a little bit like... Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to pick on anyone, actually. Local conscious sedation with morphine and Versed. So that was during. So that's not, that's not a prescription. That is used during it, right? So you see it's like, okay, this isn't exactly right. We're looking for what has been prescribed. Um, we're also going to um, do a few other questions. So like, um, uh, let's see. Let's bring this back. So just, just showing you that it, depending on how you change the prompt, you get different results. The following is a patient, ba patient chart. Sorry, I'm struggling. Drink some water. Determine whether or not um, prognosis, whether or not a prognosis was given. Okay. Um, was a prognosis given? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. What is the prognosis? Prognosis. Prognosis is excellent. Was that word used? Her prognosis is indeed excellent. Word for word. Okay. Um, so we would probably, in an ideal world, we'd want to capture this comment. Um, but anyways, uh, still the fact of the matter is it is directly getting information. So by breaking this and by breaking this problem into two tasks, we are, um, we're making it better. And so what I'm going to do is I'll show you how to fine tune this so that that way you can just do it in one go. Excuse me. Okay, um, although I guess there's nothing wrong with just having multiple prompts because like if you just do if you just do this and you do um, a search on the output yes or no, um, then you can run it again. However, 
you will still get some variance. And if you if you fine tune a model and you you pick and choose the kinds of responses that you want, you'll get far better, more consistent results. Um, so this is where fine tuning really shines because fine-tuned models tend to be less creative. And if you're just answering questions, you don't want creativity. That's the whole point, right? Confabulation or hallucination. Um, so a little bit of neuroscience, there are um, disorders out there where people will just confabulate everything. Um, there was one story that I read, I think it was in, um, I think it was in fan, um, Phantoms in the Brain, where um, a little girl was like her IQ was super low like she was she had severe like mental handicaps but her she was verbally brilliant her brain just understood language and so she would just confabulate entire stories about her life and she would tell these eloquent stories about this wonderful day that she had with her boyfriend and how he proposed on the banks of a river and it's like this is like an 8-year-old girl she has no idea what she's talking about. So her brain was just completely confabulating. And if you read that passage in Phantoms in the Brain, it almost looks like something that GPT-3 would spit out. Um, so, uh, yeah, so GPT-3 has a neurological disorder where it just confabulates language. So we have to train it to have what is called information literacy or theory of mind. So I made another video talking about theory of mind, where theory of mind is where you're consciously aware of what you what, what is in your head. So like if you have theory of mind, you say, oh, I'm experiencing this emotion or I have this knowledge or I don't, right? GPT-3 doesn't have that by default. It doesn't know what it doesn't know or it doesn't know what it knows. Um, it has no idea. It has no mental index like you or I have. So what we have to do is we have to fine tune that in. So that's what we're going to do next. Um, so we're going to have a few, um, we're going to have a few prompts. And so let's start cleaning this up. So we're gonna we're gonna call this the context. Um, we'll remove the rest of this. Actually, here let's save that because that'll be a second one. Um, yeah. All right. So then we'll just remove the rest of this. Um, so we'll do the, We'll call this one um, prompt boolean, uh, and then we'll. Do medication. Okay. And then we'll say um do 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 Alright, so then we'll do this. So assuming that it passes, we'll just leave this here. Um so that way, you know, the, the rest, the, when we fine tune it, it'll say, okay, I'm supposed to give you a list. Um, and then we'll say prompt list medication. Okay, so basically we're breaking the problem down into a bool, boolean, which is true or false, and then a list problem. So this is two separate cognitive tasks, but what we're going to do is we're going to fine tune a model to do both of those in one go. Um, this is a relatively straightforward thing, so I have a very high degree of confidence that it will work. Um, but we want to we we don't want to we don't want to fine tune an, an entire model just to find medications. Sure, there's value in that, but you know the context that I was given for this problem was: imagine you've got um, an app right on your phone that is meant to be um, like to help you coordinate. It's like a single source of truth for your home care team, and it's also an interface with your professional care team. So say, for instance, um, you know, grandma's sick, you've got 20 family members trying to look after her, plus 20 doctors and nurses, you all need a single source of truth without having to call each other up. So the, the problem here is like, okay, you need to just say like, what medications is grandma on? And it's gotta go through like many, many records, right, to figure that out. Because um, ideally, you want to figure this out automatically. As far as I know, this is not commercially available yet. This is still being like worked on. I don't know. Anyways, this is how I would approach it. Um, okay, so then what we'll do is we'll just take this base prompt and um, we'll go back to what I said, determine whether or not a prognosis was given. Um, and then we will... Do the same thing here. Okay. Was a prognosis given? Yes or no? So we'll do prompt bool prognosis. Prognosis. There we go. 
And then we will do this with that. And probably what I'll do is um, I'll probably pause the video because some of this data, it, we would benefit from having someone manually look at this. But you know what? Just for the sake of like experimentation, no, I'm not going to manually clean it up. I'm going to test and see if I can do this whole thing automatically. Um, so most of the videos that I've done up until this point have been with synthetic data sets. So this is the first one that will be um, with actual real world data. Um, so synthetic data sets are one thing, but um, uh, uh, real world data is a whole other animal. Um, so let's get rid of that. Okay, so medication, prognosis, let's do um, diagnosis as well. Diagnosis. Was a diagnosis given? Um, prompt, bool, diagnosis. Um, and then diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? Yes. Prompt list diagnosis. Okay, and let's let's imagine what's a fourth task that we could do with this. Um, prognosis, diagnosis, medication, tests. That was the other one because in a lot of these, um, you know, in this case, um, no medical tests, no follow up tests were um, ordered. So determine whether or not. Um, follow-up medical tests were ordered. So let's see. Was a follow let's see. Were follow-up tests ordered? Yes or no? Okay, in this case, no. Hmm. List follow-up tests CT scan wait really the patient will be subjected to it oh oh all right I was wrong it was right look at that look at that okay see GPT-3 smarter than me thank you GPT-3 I shouldn't make that voice that's insensitive to people with speech impediments okay so let's go Let's go. Or as the young people to say, LFG. Um, okay, so then we'll do context. Were follow-up tests ordered, yes or no? Dang. Dang. Um, now this will be list um, tests. And then what we'll do is we'll just copy that and then remove that and we'll say this, save this as prompt bool tests. Okay, there we have it. Okay, so now we've got eight prompts. Am I counting right? Yes, we've got eight different prompts that we are going to, um, that we're going to do. Um, uh, I don't want to bore you to death with writing up a script that will just go through and do these. Um, so I'm going to pause the video. I'll write a script to generate this input and output, and then we'll be back. Excuse me. That'll just be less pressure on me and less boring for you. So time will pass, and you will come back to see a finished script, and we'll watch it run with um, generating some of these outputs for the training data. And honestly, we're most of the way done already. The, the, the data... So as, um, as a senior data scientist, I, I, he, he jokes that he is senior both in experience and age, um, told me once, the hardest job for this is always getting the data. The second hardest job, once we're, now that we're in the, the realm of LLMs, is prompt engineering. Once you have the data and the prompt engineers or engineered, um, you're 90% of the way done. Now it's just a matter of synthesizing it all and training the model and away you go. So sit tight, we're almost done. Okay, I lied. It's not quite as straightforward as I promised. 
Um, it happens. So basically what we have to do is we have to do some noodling to figure out how do we want the final product to look. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to do um, just kind of like rough sketch. So this is what's called a mock-up. Like if you're if you ever do agile or whatever, you can use like you know crayons or whatever to design how you want a website to look. But you can do the same thing for data. So I, what I'm doing now is I'm planning how do I want the data to look. Um, and so the example will be um, prompt. Um, and so it'll be like medical text, and then new line, new line diagnosis. And then that'll be the end of the, oh yeah, I guess JSON L is double quotes, not single quotes. Um, and so then it'll be completion. Um, and so what the completion will look like is either um, none found or um, or list of medications. So basically we're trying to um, kind of consolidate it down. And what I mean by that is if the Boolean comes back as no, then it's over. Then it's just the answer is none. If it comes back yes, then what we have to do is get that answer. Um, so we will have to record that as we go. So then will be medical text. So this will be another example in N. Um, oh wait, diagnosis or list or diagnosis. Um, and then medications. And then we will say completion is none found or list of meds. Okay, so this is the goal, and I guess actually, um, yeah, I think this is the format that JSONL follows. I always have the script generate it for me. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do. So since I got started, let me go ahead and show you where we're at. Okay, so this is super simple so far. This is, this is my standard approach. So I've got a function, open file, save file. It's very straightforward. It's just reusable code. I've got another function to handle the GPT-3 completion. And what it does is it strips off um, any excess. Um, and then uh, it also saves it out to a log file. Because this is really helpful, especially since I've got a whole bunch of stuff running in the background um, that I'm not necessarily watching. Um, it helps to be able to see like what it actually spit out. Um, okay, so let's see, get the Boolean answer, and what we'll do here is, um, and so notice here it says it does the strip, so if, if it's no, if it's no, then that, then the answer is done. So let's actually go ahead and do, um, result equals list, so this is where we'll accumulate the final data. <clears throat> okay, so boolean equals um, completion dot lower. So if boolean is yes, actually no, we'll say no because that's the that's the easier answer. So if it's no, then we'll say um, info equals. Actually, we can just do result.append, and the answer will be, um, so let's say prompt equals, um, actually, I should probably just go ahead and open this medical text since we're going to use it twice, equals choice. Um, uh, here, let's break this up into several parts. File, and then we'll say medical text equals, and we'll just copy this out. Open file. Medical text. 
Okay. Um, read the medical file. There we go. Uh, okay. And so if it's no, then we know that it's done. And so we'll say, um, so the final result will be um, percent %s, which allows us to swap out a, um, a variable. And then we'll go new line, new line. Um, and then we'll say, um, oh, I got to know which one it is. Hmm. Yeah, because what I do is I have a list of booleans, a list of folders here, or files. So if, if it's diagnosis, okay, so here's what we can do. Um, yeah, gotcha. This will be fine. Um, where can I do this? I'll just do it here. So we'll call this the, um, the DMARC. So the demarcator is, let me show you what I mean by demark. So this right here is the demarcation. So this tells, this tells the model that the input is done, right? And it's time to do something else. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'll do demark equals file name dot replace. And what we're replacing is this part with nothing. And we're also replacing the dot text at the end with nothing. And then we're going to do upper. So that way, like, it'll end up with like diagnosis all caps and medication all caps and prognosis all caps and tests all caps. Okay. So then the prompt, what we'll do, what I like to do is actually have, um, have a, uh, like have the instructions before and after. Um, but let's try it without, I think it'll be fine. Okay. So, also one advantage of having an all caps demarcator is that it's very distinct. Um, like if you look at some of these medical contexts, if you see something in all caps, it's very obvious. Um, oh, but this could be a problem. Yeah. because it will have seen this token before, so it might mistakenly um, say like, oh, you're done, so this is, this is the diagnosis. Let's think about this for a second. Um, so we'll actually do, the prompt we'll call it, will be list all. Um, and I think it'll be important to, so this will be like list all diagnosis or list all, um, list all medication or list all prognosis or list all tests. Um, yeah. Okay. So that will, that'll give us a much more unique demarcator. And so it'll know to look for the list all as well. Um, cause this is, this is also where, uh, where it's helpful to include, um, plain text instructions at the end of fine tuning data, especially for multiple, um, multiple tasks. Okay. So list all, and then we're going to populate it with, <clears throat> um, the first one is going to be the medical text, and the second one will be the DMARC. And so if you have two dollar $s, so basically this says put the variable in this string as, or put this variable here as a string. Um, so if it sees two, then you need to have a, a, a tuple. That's what this is called. Um, okay, so that's the prompt. Uh, it's populated. And then the completion um, will be the boolean dot upper because we want it to just do the all caps thing. Um, Ta-da! Okay, so basically, what this if if the answer is no, if whatever the question was is no, we're done. Um, just append the data and move on. If boolean is yes, then we need another we need another step. <clears throat> and so what we're going to do is we're going to um, we need that we need to keep this medical file and the medical text. And so what we need to do is that we actually need to get another answer. 
So we'll say, okay, we actually need to get, um, so we're going to replace the file name, file name equals file name dot replace, and we're going to replace the bool with list. Um, and so, because what you see is like the diagnosis, this is part one, and then the list diagnosis is part two, so we're just going to assume that this is what it looks like, but instead of having all this other junk around it, we just want the answer. What is the diagnosis? Sound good? Okay. And then also what we'll do is we will add, um, we'll add a space here, so that way there will be, um, actually no, I think you're supposed to have a space before. So we'll just do space plus. So basically what that'll do is it'll add a space between the answer and that last colon. Um, I think that's the, the right way to do it. You could probably do both. Um, yeah, let's do both, why not? Okay, so we're replacing the file name, so we're gonna grab, if the answer is yes, it, the job isn't done, right? Yes, it's like, oh, there is, it is here. Okay, what is the diagnosis? Okay. So then we will want to do the same thing where um, prompt equals open file name context. So yeah, we're, this, is, this will basically be the same where we just put the context back and we ask it again. Also, I want to point out I changed the temperature to zero because we want this to be deterministic. Um, we don't want any creativity. Um, just give me the answer, yes or no. Um, let me add update the prompt file name to find the answer. Okay, so then the completion. You get the list answer. Okay, and so then whatever this is should be done now. Um, we'll leave it whatever it comes back with, up or lower. So then we will do this. We'll copy this because it's mostly the same. Um, so, but instead we'll say completion equals that plus completion. <sighs> okay, I think that's it. I think that, I think that'll do it. Um, but what we should do is um, actually print this as we go. Um, so, so that we can actually see it. So let's split this out. This, this is why, so if you, you notice in my code, I tend to be very procedural. This is why, because yes, you can stack stuff up, but then it makes it harder to, um, to diagnose and print. So like print info. Um, and, oh, actually if it's, if it's not found, we know that it's no. So actually, this the completion should just be, see, and this is also why um, completion should be none found. Um, so we want something very specific there. Okay, print info, um, print result that happened. Okay, and so then we'll do the same thing here. Info equals that. We'll print info. And then we will, um, we will, brain, what are you doing? We will append the info. Sometimes my brain just says, what were we doing? Huh? Huh? I want to do something else. I know you're probably thinking that's a sign of ADHD. Um, probably, whatever. Okay, I think this is good. Um, let's do it a quick test. I know you all like to see when things blow up. Um, you like to see, uh, see my diagnosis, um, uh, my troubleshooting process. So let's do this. CD, what is this called? Medical Python generate. Well, there's your first problem. Medical texts. Um, oh, there's no comma there. Let's see, what line is this? Line 55. I only drive 55. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Did you mean a literal? Sure. Oh, huh. 
there's a really important step I missed here. Did you catch it? You actually have to save your data. Um, so what we'll do is with all the data there, all the stuff is going to be saved. Actually, you know what? I have, we don't need these, these extraneous folders. Let me open a previous project. Um, and I'll just copy the function that I use to um, format the data. Because this is kind of an all-in-one. With medical.json-l as out file for i in result. json dump i out file, out file right, slash n. That should be good. I think that's the same format. Yeah, because this is prompt completion, prompt completion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's close that. <sighs> Rapid prototyping, man. It's a, it's, it's a special kind of drug. Okay. Python generate data. And, hey, look at that. Completion, mesothelioma. That was fast. Chief complaint, I need refills. Why are you going so...